President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the order of business. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item three of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, customs amendment, product specific rule modernisation bill 2019, further consideration in Committee of the Whole. The Committee is considering the Customs Amendment Product Specific Rule Modernisation Bill 2019 and Amendments 1 to 7 on Sheet 8819 moved by Senator Keneally. So the question is that items 5, 9 to 13, 19 to 21, 27, 28, 34, 35, 41, 42, 47 and 48 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. Uh, Senator Roberts. I seek to make a short statement. Are we still in committee, Senator yes. Roberts? So it's up to you. To, yep. Thank you, Chair. I must address comments made yesterday during the committee stage relating to this bill. Bluster and rhetoric delivered with disconcerting force do not alter the facts and do not bother me. We read Labor's amendment, I, we read Labor's amendment, I listened to the debate and I spoke with the crossbench. I then examined the history of harmonisation and asked questions of the department. And I say again, I responded to Senator Carr and Senator Ayres' comments in the previous debate and we went and got our facts. The result from getting our facts and consulting all those people was a clear understanding that this amendment from Labor is pointless and counterproductive. I did seek, through the questions I asked, to indicate to Labor, Crossbench and to the many Australians listening to Parliament that Labor's amendment was predicated on a thorough misunderstanding of the bill. It became clear in looking at the history of the bill that Labor had previously been in support, and I pointed that out. Senator Carr said yesterday, you can quote Hansard all you like, and yes, I did reference the senator's words in Hansard back to him. The purpose was not to upset the senator. The purpose was to ask, and I thought this was clear from my questions, the purpose was to ask what has changed. How do you get from a strong supporter of a bill to a strong critic with no change in the fundamentals behind that decision, no change in the facts? This bill is identical to the one in 2018, amending another group of free trade agreements in the same way as this bill does. I recall that Labor had voted in support of free trade agreements with this same harmonised system only last year, these being the Indonesian, Peru and Hong Kong free trade agreements. What has changed in these few short months? Well, nothing. Harmonising industry definitions and descriptions makes it easier for exporters to export. Instead of dealing with 15 sets of rules, they only need to deal with one. If a rule change by the World Customs Organisation results in a material change to a free trade agreement, a change in commitments, which means if we lose money or opportunities or control as a result of that change, then the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties is required to examine the change recommend yes or no, and then Parliament can scrutinise their finding, which is presented as a legislative instrument. This is the same procedure Labor is trying to introduce with this amendment. Labor is introducing a measure that already exists. Now, Labor can huff and puff all they like. This is a pointless 
amendment that has the effect of cancelling a system that they voted for only a few months ago. That they voted for only a few months ago. It will make it harder for our exporters to export. It will not protect our industries or workers any more than they are now. In fact, it will make things harder for them. I have no idea what election or social media messaging Labor was trying to set up with this amendment, but I can't see it as an honest one. One Nation remains opposed to Labor's hollow grandstanding amendment. One Nation remains opposed to free trade agreements that Liberal, Labor and Nationals pass together as a duopoly. Yet, as always, we will work honestly with anyone who wants to improve on the mess that Liberal, Labor and Nationals jointly create with their free trade agreements. That's why, in this case, we support legislation that reduces bureaucracy, makes it easier for Australian producers to export, minimises costs to taxpayers and still retains parliamentary oversight. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Wish Wilson. Chair, I'd just like to make a, a, a brief contribution to this, uh, this debate in committee stage. Um, I understand Senator Roberts and One Nation are very new to this uh, trade debate. Um, Senator Carr gave a very considered uh, overview yes, over his many years uh, in this chamber and as a minister working in the trade area. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to point out that the Greens also are very aware that the fundamental principle at stake here is executive power, more executive power being wrestled off parliament, more decisions being outsourced to the bureaucracy. The Greens, uh, back in 2014-15, initiated an inquiry into our treaty-making process. We believe the trade and treaty-making process in this place is broken and needs to be revisited. We had a very interesting uh, and long Senate inquiry into that. And then I introduced a private member's bill into this place to reform the trade treaty process. You see, Parliament has always been aware that the executive holds the power in trade negotiations. Now, this is a, uh, a hangover of the, the, the old Westminster system. It goes back hundreds of years when governments negotiated treaties when uh, the British Empire conquered countries and negotiated treaties. And it really actually hasn't changed that much. What the government did back in the 70s and 80s when debate started on this was introduce the J. Scott process. Now, having sat on J. Scott myself for many years and my colleagues having sat on J. Scott, um, what Senator Roberts doesn't understand is it is a government-dominated committee and it is a rubber stamp process. The trade negotiations that occur that set the rules and regulations that go into uh, the treaties that we ratify in Parliament, and I underline that word ratify, uh, are negotiated in secret. Essentially, uh, DFAT in the process of trade negotiations is and are a black box. Having uh, sat for many years uh, with my colleagues trying to ask questions about decisions around, for example, the TPP. Uh, I can tell Senator Roberts and One Nation that we have virtually no say in what goes into these trade agreements. Now, if you listen to the uh, senators across the chamber, you might think this is about farmers exporting more, more, more products. Now, trade is about that, but these trade treaty processes almost have been completely overwhelmed by trades in services and a whole range of other uh, exports and imports. The kind of trade treaty processes we are negotiating in this day and age are extremely complex and ubiquitous across every aspect of our life in this country. They affect everything we do, everything. And yet this parliament only gets to ratify them. If you want to change a trade and treaty process and you raise those issues in J. Scott, they'll be rejected because it's a government-run committee. If you come in here and ask to amend a trade and treaty process, you can't, even if they're entirely sensible decisions, because those decisions have been made by bureaucrats and stamped by the executive. Before it even comes to Parliament and Jay Scott, it's already been signed. I bet Senator Roberts didn't know that. These things have already been signed before they even come to us. You can reject it and you can vote it against it, as I'm very proud to say the Greens have on a number of trade deals. 
but you cannot change it. Our preference would have been to have amended them and changed them, but that option is not available to us as parliamentarians. The last thing we should be doing is giving more power to the executive and more power to bureaucrats and removing our role of oversight in this chamber as senators. Um, it's almost like there is a parallel economic system and governance system uh, in this country and around the world in this kind of context of globalisation. And that is through the trade and treaty process where executives from countries negotiate this. And may I say, uh, the people who actually do know what's going on in these very complex trade and treaty processes are mostly big corporations. They're mostly big pharmaceutical companies and big corporations. Uh, civil society, including the unions, might get invited to a couple of uh, shallow presentations, uh, given some detail, but they're not invited into the trade treaty process. So I would urge One Nation to reject this, this bill, but more importantly, fundamentally reject the principle of giving more power to the executive and removing the power that you have as a senator to have oversight on these critically important matters. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Um, Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you, um, um, Madam Deputy President. Uh, just looking at these amendments, uh, and I'm just going to declare that, uh, unfortunately, until yesterday, I wasn't really across this or the subtleties of this. And so it's with that in mind, I'm going to ask the minister some questions to try and clarify in my mind exactly what is happening here. Uh, again, I apologise. Uh, uh, it's subtle, and, but it's, it's nonetheless important. I share uh, the views of people on this side of the chamber that we always want to make sure that the parliament is doing its job, it's, doing, uh, it's conducting scrutiny. Um, I just, I've, I've listened and I reread the Hansard last night of Senator, Senator Keneally's contribution and Senator Carr's contribution. I just want to get an understanding from the minister, from your perspective, what you think the amendments that Labor are proposing to do and where um, you say that causes harm. I'd appreciate it if you could just help me through that. Senator Patrick, just before I call the minister, there's no need to apologise. This is Committee of the Whole, and this process is for every senator who wishes to uh, to fully interrogate the bill that the, the Senate is discussing. So it is your absolute right to ask whatever questions in relation to the bill that, that you have. So no need to apologise, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, <coughs> Chair. Um, Senator Patrick, thank you very much for those questions, and I will answer them in two parts. First of all, I'll go through the reasons why the government doesn't support the amendments, and why. So I'll go through that, and then I'll also just clarify what this uh, bill is about and what it's actually not about, because there have been some things that the government doesn't agree with. Will it actually impact in some of those areas? So first of all, um, we don't support the proposed amendments because we believe that they would render the bill ineffective. Uh, as it would break the mechanism incorporating the PSR changes by reference to the updated annex of the relevant FTAs. So the intent of the bill is to enable the Customs Act to automatically incorporate uh, periodic PSRs, updates by referring to the agreed update PSR schedule in the relevant uh, free trade agreement, rather than requiring a duplicative regulatory uh, amendment to that to accomplish this. And the proposed amendment would require those duplicative reg regulations still to be produced just for these last six uh, FTA agreements that was under consideration here today. So we also think that the proposed amendments would also defeat the intent of aligning Australia's FTA practice for all of our FTAs. And one of the key principles of this is to make sure that all of our 15 FTAs are fully aligned in terms of process, uh, and that is currently not the case because we've done nine of them this way, and we now want to bring the remaining six into this same uh, framework. So specifically, the bill seeks to align, as I said, these six FTAs to continue, and we believe continuing to use the old practice, which still applies to these particular six FTAs, uh, is, is burdensome and it's also unnecessary, and it's very difficult then for traders and for industry to have two different processes uh, in, in place. 
So I would point out that the Australian Parliament has already approved the automatic incorporation practice for nine of Australia's 15 FTAs. And in 2018, the Parliament passed, with opposition support at the time, as we discussed at some length yesterday, uh, the amendment to the Customs Amendment Product Specific Rules Modernisation Act, and we did that in 2018. So the 2018 Act has the identical, the identical impact of this bill. Uh, there is no difference because we're seeking to align and harmonise all of these FTAs. Uh, all other FTAs that have been implemented since 2017 have also included this automatic referral mechanism. So this, has come, this is the third time that this mechanism has now come to this place. And again, it's, I said it's all about harmonising and having all of our FTAs under the same uh, rules. So a practical consequence of failing to bring the last six FTAs into alignment with our broader practice is, as I said, this will not only uh, create uh, that additional regulatory burden that we don't have for the nine you know, FTAs who have this provision, but it's also incredibly challenging for traders as well who are trading across many of these FTAs. So that's in, in answer to that first part of your question. Uh, that is the reason why we're doing this, is to bring them all into alignment in a way that we have already done twice in this place, in exactly the identical way. Uh, you referred to uh, some of our colleagues' uh, comments and contributions yesterday. And can I just address a couple of the, uh, uh, perhaps politely called myths, uh, that were brought into the debate? So this bill does not introduce a new process uh, to deal with uh, these FTA amendments. It is exactly what we've done twice before. It does not affect J. Scott and the Parliament's ability to scrutinise. It does not introduce any new procedures. Uh, when, the, uh, when the World Customs Organisation every five years uh, makes these changes to, you know, to harmonisation, the process for us to, to work through the FTA agreements to take any of those amendments through J. Scott is exactly the same. So there is no change uh, to that. Uh, it, it was referred yesterday uh, by one of our colleagues that somehow this referred to anti-dumping. It it is, this is not an anti-dumping measure or it doesn't Im impact any of our anti-dumping measures. So what is it? It's the same as the identical bill in 2018 for our FTAs with China, Japan, ASEAN, New Zealand and Singapore. Um, and it's basically streamlining our arrangements with Thailand, Malaysia, the United States, the Republic of Korea, China and New Zealand to align with those other nine so that they are treated all the same. And uh, it also reduces, uh, of these agreements, 3,000 pages to 80, which makes it simpler and cleaner to administer and also to understand. And again, as I said yesterday, this exact same measure uh, was endorsed as uncontroversial and administrative in nature, as Senator Carr said two years ago. And in fact, he stated on this exact same bill two years ago um, that this was simple and administrative. And he yesterday said that the facts have changed. Well, the gov government would state very strongly that it is exactly identical circumstances. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Senator Patrick. Madam Deputy President. I, I will just uh, come back to you on, the, on, on my apology, and, and, and actually, it's worth worth saying this because people watch and wonder whether this is all just politicking. I can absolutely assure you, I, I'll end up making my decision on the floor, uh, on the basis of the uh, debate that I've heard and the answers that are that are coming, in and, and so it is an important process. My apology really was my ill preparedness, personally, uh, in respect of this. Having uh, being originally of, of the understanding, it wasn't controversial. So um, that, that's that's where my apology rests. Okay, I, I do like the process, and and to yes. people, to people who are watching, um, this is quite a genuine, uh, quite a genuine process. Um, uh, in relation to the uh, your answer, minister, um, uh, the area I have particular concern over is the reduction of scrutiny. Um, so it, where there's a change in process where a regulation that w where something that would require a regulation um, uh, no longer requires a regulation it simply becomes an automatic process uh, and and I take what you say about previous passings of the bill but when I read the 
committee report last night, it became obvious that this came to the attention in some sense accidentally uh, through a Bills Digest. Um, someone raised a concern and, and I think Labor have responded to that concern, which is why they've changed their position. And we all know sometimes in this place not everything's perfect and it does rely on the different gateways of the, the, where a bill goes through. So I'm actually not really particularly persuaded in this instance about what's happened in the past. I really just want to get to the point about uh, perhaps a new understanding about a scrutiny element. The, as I understand it, uh, when we're dealing with uh, these PSRs, they're associated with harmonisation codes, for which I'm uh, familiar from a previous life. Um, it's been put to me by the department this morning, and I thank you for organising the briefing that you did. It's been put to me by the department this morning that the bill uh, that's before us today only changes the harmonisation code and the mapping of harmonisation codes to PSRs, um, and uh, that uh, harmonisation codes are changed every five years. And you might have a harmonisation code, and I'll use the example that might be associated with an oil of some sort, um, some sort of food-related oil. Uh, and uh, five years, five years comes along, and I'm using this as a hypothetical, so I'm not going to get technical on you, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, you, you have an oil as a, as a harmonised code and then some country decides they want to break that up into palm oil and olive oil. And so now we end up with two harmonisation codes that map to a PSR uh, or to, to, to the PSRs. My understanding is this legislation, if I were to take what the department told me at face value, only deals with the mapping of the harmonisation codes to the PSRs, uh, that it doesn't deal with the, um, the PS changes to the PSR itself. Uh, I just want to confirm that for, for my first question, is that the case? Is that your view? The second question is, uh, if there is to be a change to the PSR, uh, the department put it to me, and it's a different uh, story to what's been uh, told to me uh, in this chamber and, uh, and outside the chamber, if there is a change made to the PSR itself, that still requires a regulation. Uh, I just wanted to confirm, confirm that. First question, this bill is only dealing with the mapping of harmonisation codes to PSRs. Second question, in order to change a PSR, that has to be done by way of regulation, as I, if, if I understand this correctly. Minister. Thank you uh, very much, Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Patrick, for uh, for your comments about the briefing, and so I'll take the example. So the answer to the first question is yes, and I'll actually just walk you through the example that you've used oils, for example. So in that hypothetical example, if a future revision of the HS uh, tariff code reclassifies, in your case, olive oils as a new category of goods distinct from its previous category of food oils, for example, uh, it'll be necessary to update Australia's free trade agreement itself to to accept and to acknowledge this change of uh, reclassification. So the update process would apply to the PSR treatment agreed by the, both parties uh, for food oils to make it the new category of olive oils, for example, in the updated PSR schedule. Uh, neither the process of updating the PSRs for olive oils, for example, and food oils, nor incorporating this change into domestic law, which is what we're, we're talking about here today, would undermine the original FTA commitment or the treaty making process itself. Senator Patrick. So just going to the second limb of, of your answer, and I think we're getting close. If uh, I now understand this is only about the, the harmonisation codes and mapping them back, uh, mapping them to PSRs. Uh, if you change the, the text of a PSR, and for those listening, the PSRs are in, uh, instructions about a a third country that is not a party to an agreement sends a product to, uh, say, China, who has a, an FTA with us. Uh, there are rules associated as to when that product that came from the third country uh, uh, basically is considered to be a Chinese product for the purposes of the FTA. Uh, that's a pretty important definition, and I, 
Uh, I, I would have concerns if that didn't get subject to some scrutiny. Um, so I'm just wondering about the process associated with a change to a PSR. Does the, my question is, does that require a change in regulation that is brought to this parliament and is disallowable? Minister. Uh, thank you. And uh, Senator Patrick, in the example that you used, that would be more than a minor change and it would need to go back to J. Scott. Senator Patrick. Sorry. Um, um, I just want to go back to there's a difference between J. Scott examining something and the parliament being presented with a disallowable regulation. So I appreciate it does go to J. Scott. My question is if you change a PSR, the characterisation of what needs to happen before it's considered to be, in this case, a Chinese product coming to Australia under the FTA or under the CHAFTA, um, does that require a change in regulation and is that disallowable? Minister. Thank you. Uh, if I'm just getting some technical advice here because we're really now drilling down into the uh, technical aspects of, of the bill. Okay. Uh, Senator Patrick, um, my understanding, the clarification I've had on that point, is if it's a change of definition, it would go to J. Scott, but if it was a change in the calculation of the methodology, as you were describing, that would still come back uh, as a regulation, but it would cover all of the FTAs, not it one by one. Yeah, all of the rules in the F. Uh, no, that's not right. If we change the methodology, in short, um, for any technical <laughs> explanation I've just had, uh, in short, uh, yes, it would come into regulation if it was a change of calculation. Is that right? Okay. And if, uh, I'll consult. We might just have to consult, given the, the level of granularity of that question. We'll just check with the uh, officials to make sure that that's correct. But my understanding is, if it changes the calculation, then yes, it is. Senator Patrick, and then I'll go to Senator Carr. Sure. Look, um, so, uh, thank you. Th th that is helpful. And uh, in some sense, uh, again, thank you for the brief. Uh, this question flowed from the brief, and I, the, the department uh, haven't really answered my question. They, they took it on notice, but it's only been an hour. So, uh, um, th they did provide an answer, but it wasn't sufficient to us. So, uh, sufficient for me. So that's why we're drilling down so deep into the into the details. I'm not trying to uh, ambush you in any way. The, um, uh, the question you didn't answer then, just in, in, your, in your response then, was uh, you've established it, uh, 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 that a, a modification requires a regulation. Is that regulation disallowable? Minister. Um, Senator, Senator Patrick, so I don't mislead you, if you can uh, indulge me for a minute, I will just, given the importance of that uh, particular piece of granularity, we will just get confirmation and uh, I'll get straight back to you. I have uh, the, my answer stand, stands, uh, Senator Patrick. And if if there's any more information that can be provided on, the, on that on that issue, we'll come straight back. Senator Carr, Minister, the answer is no, isn't it? The answer is no. Minister, I have nothing more to add. Okay, Senator Patrick. Okay, so if I assume that it, uh, uh, can I just? Understand, you didn't really respond to my my question whether it was, and it is it is actually the one of the critical elements. Noting I said uh, this is a, to me this is important because it's about scrutiny 
uh, of the executive in, 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 the, in the stewardship of their execution of the law. The, uh, so it is a, an important question that I'd like answered. But, but the other important part of that is we're, we're talking about that particular process. Uh, in some sense, whilst I want the answer to that, uh, I also need to understand, whilst we've been talking about that, is that part affected by this bill, or <coughs> am I talking about something that I think is an important issue, but it's not related to this bill? Minister. Senator Patrick, as, as I've, uh, we've sort of discussed now on this bill, and I've mentioned several times, is this is introducing nothing new. It is exactly the same arrangements that we have for our other nine free trade agreements, which we've taken through this chamber twice now. So the arrangements, all of the arrangements for these six FTAs is exactly the same. There is no change to the situation that we currently have. What we are doing with this bill is harmonising them so that we have one system and one approach for all of these FTAs. J. Scott certainly, as I've, as I've confirmed, J. Scott's role has not changed at all. What has changed is that we're bringing these six into alignment with our other nine FTAs so that it is simpler to administer, it is cleaner, and it is also much easier for our traders. So that is really the heart of this. There is no difference in this bill and in the arrangements from what we've already had twice through this chamber. Senator Carr. Thank you. Um, Minister, I'd ask you to confirm that the advice from the Law and Bills Digest section of the Parliamentary Library and I quote, if the PSR annexes in these FTAs are to be directly referenced without the need for a regulation under the Customs Act to the prescribed PSRs, then this would mean the prescription of the PSRs may not be subject to tabling or disallowance. Is that correct? Minister. Uh, I've said many times now in response to questions that the arrangements and the procedures for these six FTAs are exactly the same for the other nine FTAs. So there is no change. It is exactly the same. Senator Carr. This bill is to remove the power of the Senate, to remove the power of the Senate to insist upon these regulations being tabled and disallowed. Is that not correct? Minister. As I've said, Senator Carr, this does exactly, exactly the same as we do for the other nine which two years ago you personally described as being uh, non-controversial and purely administrative in nature. Senator Carr. That the power of the Senate is being removed by if this bill was to be passed. Senate. Minister. Uh, Senator Carr, you can ask me the same question over and over and the answer will be the same. Is this is exactly the same as that for the other nine, and you can keep asking me the same question, but the answer is still the same, Senator Carr. Through you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Carr. Can I put it to you this as well, that the Australian Border Force submission to the Senate inquiry told us that the domestic process includes referring FTA amendments to the Joint Standing Committee for Treaties at JSOT as a Category Three brackets, minor treaty action. What's the consequence of having a Category 3 minor treaty inquiry through J. Scott? Minister. Uh, yeah. uh, for minor, which by definition are minor, it means that there is no public inquiry, which is no change to the current circumstance. If they are not, as I've already said, if they are not minor in nature, then they do trigger a J. Scott inquiry. Senator Carr. That submission was that these would be regarded as minor, not subject to public scrutiny or to disallowance through this chamber. That's correct, isn't it, Minister? Minister. Uh, I've given you, given you the answer, the definition of minor and what that triggers and what uh, ones that are not deemed to be minor triggers a J. Scott inquiry. So, Senator Carr, again, the, the answer will be the same. Is This is the same as what we do for nine other free trade agreements. The system is working and, as I understand it, 
uh, none of these you know, regulations have ever been disallowed because they are minor technical and they are incredibly technical, as you yourself acknowledged two years ago, Senator Carr. Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, Minister, I understand it, uh, that this isn't a, this, the, you're trying to align this with the previous um, changes uh, and how we deal with previous trade agreements. I, 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 I appreciate that. Uh, as I indicated, it appears from the Bill's Digest that this new issue has been raised. It might be a case that, had we had our time again, we might not have changed the previous legislation, but that's a, that's a by and by. So I'm just, uh, I have before me a piece of legislation that I understand is similar to or identical to, to past legislation just relating to new treaties. Uh, that, if it got missed last time, that, that doesn't excuse me from now it's been drawn to my attention, examining the, the, the um, con, uh, perhaps an un other, otherwise unappreciated consequence. And it's in that context uh, that I'm still trying to get a, an answer as to whether or not the regulation to change the PSR is disallowable and uh, whether or not the uh, change, uh, the, the, this bill uh, alters that part of the process. That's fundamental to my question and it's fundamental to the way in which I will vote. Minister. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Senator Patrick, and through you, <laughs> Chair. Uh, yeah, as I've said, this is exactly the same as that we've already implemented for the first nine, and that system is working well. And of course, if there is no regulation, because this, these changes do not generate a regulation, which of course is then not disallowable because there is no regulation, because it's uh, a different process. Again, it's a process that's working very well and has worked very well since we passed it in this chamber two years ago. So uh, I really have nothing more to add, Senator Patrick, because it was very clear when we've passed those new FTAs through this chamber uh, and when we brought the 2018 bill in that it was, it was very clear then and again, as Senator Carr said, it was a simple administrative process, and it remains that. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Um, because it's similar to the previous bill in 2018, that means there is no reduction in Senate power, Senate authority, Senate oversight. I want to respond to Senator Wish Wilson's comments because this bill simply makes it easier, as did the 2018 bill, for Australian producers to export. It does not change the Senate's power. The Labor Party's amendment duplicates what is already in place, so it's superfluous. I want to make a comment, though, that we welcome the Greens' statement and their position because it, on the free trade agreements in general, and I would welcome the opportunity for One Nation to talk with the Greens about future free trade agreements that come into this, this chamber with, with regard to coming up with a strategy to stop these agreements going through, because once we have Labor and Liberal and the Nationals together, it is hard for nine plus two to beat that number. Mm -hmm. We have got to come up with a strategy because the free trade agreements themselves that Labor and Liberal push through the Senate are destroying this country. So we are with the Greens party on that. We, we acknowledge that you've been on that for a while, and so have we, and we want to do something about that despite the numbers. Minister, perhaps Senator Patrick could—these uh, th these are, the, are the conclusions that we came to uh, as a result of discussions with the crossbenchers and the, um, and, and the, members, uh, the, the representatives from your department. If a rule change by the World Customs Organization results in a material change to a free trade agreement, that's a change in our country's commitment which means that we lose money or opportunities or we lose control as a result of that change, then the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties is required to examine the change, recommend yes or no, and then the parliament can scrutinise their finding, which is presented as a legislative instrument. Is that correct? Minister. Thank you. Uh, in terms of, so thank you uh, through you, Chair, to Senator Malcolm and also to Senator Patrick. Just to clear up any, any confusion, 
There still will be for each FTA. There still will be a regulation for each FTA that is disallowable. So there will still be one. It will, just, so no, no. Of course, all regula I mean, regulations are. So, Senator can I just be Carr, very? This is very. This please. is important. This is an important point, and it comes to the heart, I think, of what Senator Patrick and um, Senator Malcolm were talking about. So each FTA will still have a regulation, but what this does is if it is a minor change, for example, a definitional change, uh, then it doesn't go to J. Scott. So definitional changes we discussed, so from one, one label to another. However, if it is a formula change, so it is a material change, then that will absolutely still go to J. Scott under existing processes. But where it, what it will not do under this is it will not trigger another regulation to the original regulation. So every five years, uh, when the Tr World Trade Organisation does these recalculations, it will not result in a new regulation because all of those, again, my advice is that none of those technical regulations have ever been challenged. So this actually means you will still have a regulation for each of the FTAs, but it will not be updated every five years in this way. Senator Carr. Yes, if I could. Uh, can I urge uh, those senators that actually are claiming some interest in this matter actually read the amendment? I know this is a shockingly uh, militant approach to take towards uh, the legislative process, but read the amendment. The amendment that the Labor Party is proposing in, in, in the name of Senator Keneally actually refers to the point of the regulations that are, we're under discussion. It actually says we are seeking to retain regulations, retain the power of the Senate, retain the power of the Senate. Again and again and again is, def is actually pointed out on the sheet that has actually been distributed in the chamber. So the Labor's concern about this bill is the fact that the level of transparency that the government is now uh, pursuing is to reduce the power of the Senate and to reduce the capacity of the parliament to hold the public service accountable. And their argument is, well, you did it in the past, you should do it now. The argument is, well, you might have made an error in the past, you should keep on doing it. The argument seems to be we haven't had cause to make corrections in the past. We don't need to do it in the future. Now it's like a person sitting in the middle of a bushfire zone saying we don't need insurance policies because we've never actually had our house burned down. That's the logic that we have been presented with. That is the absolute logic here. Oh, you've got parliamentary scrutiny, you've got J. Scott, a rubber stamp committee dominated by the government in which these matters will be treated on the evidence presented to the Senate committee as minor matters not subject to proper uh, capacity for this chamber to say no to, presented as a fait accompli. We're told you should accept that because you've accepted it in the past. That's the line of logic we're being told is now the standard by which we should accept. Now, my problem is this. I've been here a long time, and yes, I've sat down the front bench, and yes, I have read out the Labor Party position on these things, freely read it out, argued a case, as your job is to do. But I've now had the capacity to actually undertake other work and we have a circumstance now as a result of the work done through the, the Committee on Delegated Legislation and the Scrutiny of Bills and proper Senate inquiry process, gathering research, proper evidence, and says that we do this far too often. Of some 2,000 bills a year now we're passing, tick and flick, unread, up to 50 per cent of those bills contain legislative instruments which are effectively delegated legislation, where we pass over our responsibilities to someone else. 
and in one in five of those cases without the capacity of the Senate to say no if the public service makes a mistake. Now, I suppose you're going to tell me the public service never made a mistake in this country. I suppose you're going to tell me that in trade matters there's never been a definition that the public service has got wrong. I suppose you're going to tell me that there's never been a rort pulled when it comes to the transshipment of goods in free trade agreements. I suppose you're going to tell me now that there aren't countries out there that seek to manipulate free trade agreements for their national advantage to our national disadvantage. And I suppose you're going to tell me there aren't public servants that go along with it. I suppose you can tell me all of those fairy tales. It's a bit like all the modelling that we've seen time and time again. Well, we haven't actually seen it because we don't get to see it. We get told about it. We get told all oh, this magnificent bonanza coming our way. We never actually get to see it before the documents are signed. We don't actually get to actually debate the agreements before they're signed. It's always post facta. She said, so we're asked to buy this fairy tale and not have a capacity, not have an insurance policy, which we currently have. That's what the Senate has. We have in these five agreements, we still have that insurance policy. We've been asked to give that, rip up that insurance policy. That's the point of these amendments, to protect the right of the Senate to actually have a look, to make a judgment as to whether or not the decisions being made by public servants, and let's be clear, it's not ministers. Ministers don't sit around and write definitions for trade agreements. It's the public service that does it. And who are the biggest advocates for delegated legislations? The public servants. They don't want to be, have the confusion, the administrative burden, the stresses and strain of having to deal with elected representatives, because they know better than the rest of us. They don't want to actually be subject to even public scrutiny. See, J. Scott doesn't even have to have a public inquiry. It can all be done in secret. All be done under the counter. If anything we've learnt in trade policy is how the consensus, you know, the great consensus, the world consensus on how the trade system works, really should be subject to a bit of public debate, a bit of public scrutiny, let alone these technical definitions. Now you'll say to me, oh, it's too complicated for you mere mortals as politicians. It should be left to the experts the unelected, faceless experts. Well, you see, I've had this advantage. I've been here now 28 years, coming up on March. So I've seen it come and go. I've sat on both sides of the chamber. I've played many different roles in this place. And I get presented with the evidence. 50 per cent of our legislation now is being shoveled out the door to someone else. 20 per cent of which we then say we want to hear no more about it until there's a political problem. Oh yes, we hear about it then. Because the public service doesn't want to know about it then. Well, that's the government's problem or it's the opposition's problem or it's the people that suffer's problem. That's the real issue here, where we fail in our proper duties to protect the interests of Australians protect the interests of Australian workers, Australian companies, because we've handed it over to some expert. Now, One Nation, I don't expect much from them, but they've sunk to new depths where they just become some lapdog for the Liberal Party, just some incredible 
Well, it is. I think, I mean, lipstick is a proper, appropriate word here. Where they just, their idea of research is pressing the button and getting their instructions from the minister's office. I mean, they claim to be representing the great ordinary Australian. If only they knew. If the ordinary Australian only knew. They put up a proposition where that reducing the power of the Senate, their power, their capacity, their insurance policy, to say, hang on, you can get this wrong, you have got this wrong in the past, and it is our job to say enough's enough. And that's what these amendments do. They're pretty straightforward. They retain regulations. Schedule 1, item 5, page 3, retain regulations, and so on. Schedule 1, items 19 to 21, page 10, retain regulations. Schedule 1, items 27 to 28, page 15, retain regulations. Schedule 1, items 34 to 35, page 19, retain regulations. Items 41 to 42, retain regulations. That's to retain your capacity as senators to do your job, to fulfil your obligations for which you were elected, and not to shove it off to someone Thank else Senator and Carl. claim you know nothing about it. Minister. Uh, thank you. Can I just be very, very clear? And thank you, Chair. Uh, if there is a substantive change, i.e. a change in the formula or the calculation, it absolutely goes through J. Scott and they have a hearing uh, and make recommendations about legislative change, which of course comes back to this chamber. So that, Senator Carr, is the fact. And no amount of rhetorical flourish, uh, which was very eloquent, uh, very rude about colleagues but very elegant, does not change the fact that if there is a substantive change, one that is uh, not minor in nature, which is uh, like a label change as we've discussed here today, it goes through J. Scott, J. Scott have a hearing and it comes back to the parliament. So we still have the same ability as we do for the other nine FTAs as we will for these six that are subject to the bill today. Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, short question for the minister. Minister, is uh, J. Scott um, chaired by the government? Is it a government, uh, a substantial government-led committee? Minister. Uh, Senator Wilson, I think you and everybody in this chamber knows the composition uh, of all of the, the committees. But again, as I say, this goes through, there is no change to J. Scott procedures. Anything that is major, which involves a change of formula, uh, that goes to the heart of what Senator Patrick was asking about today, that goes to J. Scott, there is a hearing, and it comes back to the chambers to amend the bills. So those, that, there is no change to that. So it still comes back to this place. Senator Wish Wilson. Sorry, Minister, I just, you, you did answer my question. Is J. Scott a government-controlled committee, and are the governments the ones negotiating these potential changes to regulations or free trade deals? Minister. Uh, yes. Senator Wish Wilson. So I've got no, uh, no problem with uh, J. Scott and the, and the great work they do, Minister. I've been on that committee for many years, um, but it's it's a rubber stamp for the government. So if you want these changes through, you recommend it. You have an inquiry. You collect the evidence. Uh, there's potential for senators to dissent, but essentially the recommendation that comes back here, that will be debated in the parliament, is a government-controlled. Re Recommendation. So it's essentially you putting up what you want. There's no, there's no uh, chance for us to amend that. Is that correct, Minister? Thank you, Chair. I'll take that as a political statement uh, on our current system that we all operate under, rather than a question in itself. Senator Patrick. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, if there's a standard of change, it goes to J. <coughs> J. Scott. <clears throat> they may make recommendations, but ultimately, uh, it, it is a, 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 a any change is affected by way of regulation. And indeed, the department has now provided me with an example of that regulation. The bit that's still not clear to me is whether or not this is disallowable. 
um, and I've got people working in the background trying to find whether it's the uh, Regulations Act or indeed the Customs Act that, that might uh, give uh, remedy to, our, to the mystery. Minister. So, uh, thank you, Chair. So, Senator Patrick, um, just to be again to, to clear, to be clear, is that if there is a change every five years to the FTA, uh, we discuss that with the relevant nations and we agree on uh, what needs to be updated under the free trade agreement. If it is minor in nature. Uh, then we now won't need a regulation. So, as you said in that oil example, it won't name change. But anything more significant than that, it does still trigger to go to J. Scott for a hearing, and then to make changes uh, to the bill itself. So, for each FTA, when it's initiated, when it's come into effect, there is still a regulation. But what this does is, instead of every five years for these technical amendments, we don't have fresh regulations. Uh, and again, that is why it is highly technical in nature, which is why uh, previously those amendments have been supported by both sides of the chamber to actually reduce that regulatory burden for a very technical process. But anything that triggers, uh, as a part of that five yearly process, that triggers a change in formula and calculation, then that of course goes to J. Scott and it is uh, seen as uh, treated as uh, major, which triggers the inquiry. It triggers recommendations to changes to legislation, which then comes back to both chambers to pass or not to pass, as this chamber sees fit on the, on the day. Senator Patrick. Uh, so you're talking about uh, a change to now the, the legislation as opposed to a regulation. So uh, um, you know, th that's le legislation comes back and we vote on legislation. Regulations can uh, be brought to this place simply by tabling from the minister, um, the uh, example that has been provided to me by the department is in fact a regulation, uh, and it, it, I just still haven't got an answer to the question about whether it's allowable or disallowable. It's not a debating point; it's simply a question of fact. I don't understand uh, what the answer to that is. I'm trying desperately to find uh, that answer, and you could assist me. Um, by default, is if 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 it yeah if it uh, if I don't get the answer I I'll end up supporting Labor's amendments. Minister, uh, thank you. Just to be again sort of very clear is this doesn't change the processes. So when we enter into an FTA, there's two bills plus a regulation uh, that comes through comes through this place. So that uh, regulation at that time, of course, like all regs, are disallowable. But what this does, what this does for the other nine FTAs is that when every five years, uh, when they are updated, if it's minor, then we don't need to go and do minor or major go through the reg changes. But if it's major, it goes to J. Scott. They consider it, make recommendations for the bill itself. So every five years, uh, for these six, we still have to then update the regs. But they have never been challenged because they are very technical. So for nine FTAs, we don't have to do that technical regulatory updating. So that's so it's again nothing nothing has changed from how we do those other nine. So there is still that original reg, which of course is disallowable, but we don't have to update them, all of them, every five years. Senator Patrick. So just in your answer you provide, provided then, you said uh, that it comes to the chamber and all local regulations is disallow it is disallowable. Minister, that's not actually correct. There are some regulations that are not disallowable, um, so they, they do get tabled. They're not disallowable, and and uh, uh, so and I realise you might not have been. I'm not accusing you of misleading. I'm just pointing out that's what you said. I, uh, so there are disallowable instruments, and there are instruments that are that uh, are, are not disallowable. So an example of that is the uh, Commonwealth procurement rules are a. Uh, are a legislative instrument that are not disallowable, and uh, I'm just trying to get the clarity whether or not a regulation such as the Customs in brackets Singapore Rules of Origin in brackets Regulation 2017, made under the Customs Act to, uh, 1901, is a disallowable instrument or not a disallowable instrument. 
Minister. Okay, to be, again, to be very clear, so when you have when the FTA is uh, enacted and it's sort of passed through this chamber, that reg is of course disallowable. Now, what will not be disallowable is these automatic you know, these changes that come through every five years. So they go into they're updated in the schedules of the bill, instead of actually going through uh, new disallowable instruments, which of course un will not exist because they go into the schedules of the, of the Customs Act itself. Senator Wish Wilson. Minister, um, who, who gets to decide whether, uh, in terms of the J potential J. Scott process and something coming back to parliament, who gets to decide whether it's a minor or a substantial change? Is, that, is, that, is the government the one that decides that? Is there a process where DFAT provides advice to you that they don't believe this needs to go through a political process or a parliamentary process. Can you step us through some examples of what might be minor or substantial? Putting aside what you said about changes to the formula, the, uh, yeah, well, I'd be really interested in this. It sounds very subjective to me, so I'd, I'd like to be convinced on this. Minister, uh, thank you, Senator Wish Wilson, and I keep coming back to this point that there is no change to any of the processes with J. Scott, and it is exactly the same, exactly the same as for the first nine. So just to be clear, when those changes, instead of going to regulations, they go into the annexes of each of the treaties. Uh, and I, I don't think I can be any clearer about the process, Chair. Senator Wish Wilson. I, I'm, I'm actually struggling to kind of follow this, to be, to be honest, Minister, and maybe that's a reflection on me. Um, but you did say there was a process, and you gave us an example of how a change to the formula on tariff or quota would automatically trigger a J. Scott process. So you have given us one example there of what would be a substantial uh, change that would require this coming back through a parliamentary process and would give some kind of parliamentary oversight or scrutiny. Can you give us an example of what a minor change would be that doesn't need to go through that process? Uh, and who decides? Is it DFAT providing advice to you that this? doesn't require a J. Scott or parliamentary process? Is it the government, uh, the ministerial office? Do you discuss this uh, in some other forum or some other process? Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Deputy Chair, Acting Chair. Um, I, I, we've discussed this at some length already uh, and with Senator Patrick, and so it's in the Hansard. But an example of a minor would be a name change from um, oil to olive oil. So it's a nomenclature change and that is minor. Anything that impacts on the formula itself absolutely is major and goes to J. Scott. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you. I did I did hear the oil example, Minister, but having having seen the uh, Having seen some of the Barneys we've had in this country over uh, nom, nom, how do you pronounce it? Nom Okay, I'll take your word for that. <laughs> yes, uh, which I'm sure uh, you understand. Uh, in, for example, the naming of areas in the wine industry. Uh, we've had this issue with honey. I've sat through two Senate inquiries that's looked at exactly this issue around trade and imports, the use of names. I would actually say, and I know Senator Carr touched on this yesterday, some of these things are very big issues for our, for our industry and our business. The idea that that might be considered minor and might not go out to uh, a process which could involve consultation with stakeholders. Um, perhaps internally DFAT have their own uh, process where they might be speaking to stakeholders in this country about these kind of things, but I would have thought that it was very important that that also goes through a parliamentary process. Minister? Again, I think that was uh, an observation rather than a question. Okay. No further questions? So the question is that items 5, 9 to 13, 19 to 21, 27, 28, 34, 35, 41, 42, 47 and 48 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The noes have division required. Call, ring the bells for four minutes.
So the question is that items 5, 9 to 13, 19 to 21, 27, 28, 34, 35, 41, 42, 47 and 48 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McGrath as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. The result of the division is 31 ayes and 30 noes. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. So the question now is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells, whips. You want one minute or four? You want four? Ah, we ring the bells for four minutes. I've requested. Ring the bells for four minutes. <laughs>
Lock the doors. Order. So the question is, order. So the question is that the bill stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McGrath as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 32 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. So the question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Customs Amendment Product Specific Rule Modernisation Bill of 2019 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I move that the uh, bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Ring the bells for four minutes. One minute. One minute. Yeah, so one minute. <clears throat> Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister that the bill be read a third time be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McGrath as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order. The result of the division is 32 ayes and 30 noes. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, I'll call the clerk. Bill for an act to amend the Customs Act 1901 and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number two, aged care legislation amendment, serious incident response scheme and other measures, Bill 2020. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The government has taken too long to introduce a serious incident response scheme that would respond to the cases of assault and abuse in Australia's aged care system. It has been more than three years since this scheme was first recommended by the Australian Law Reform Commission following its landmark report into elder abuse in Australia. The Con Connell Patterson Review, commissioned by the government following the Oakden nursing home tragedy, also recommending the scheme in 2017. How can Australians trust this government to properly respond to the Royal Commission into Aged Care when it can't even respond to serious incidents of elder abuse? Labor has been calling for the implementation of this scheme since both reports were released in 2017. Understand this, 2017. We are almost four years now since the government was warned about outrageous and shocking incidents of abuse, and yet they have done nothing. Australia's aged care system was broken before the COVID-19 pandemic, and the delay of this scheme is only putting extra stress on the system. Reported assaults in residential aged care go up every year. Four years they have wasted. Every year, incidents of assault are going up. They reached 5,000 233 in 2018-19, more than 100 a week. They should hang their heads in shame. Day after day, the evidence amounts of serious neglect in aged care, and all we see from the Morrison government, running away, passing the buck, not accepting responsibility for their own failures. Neglect is not only the title of the aged care Royal Commission's interim report. Neglect is the legacy. Neglect is the practice. Neglect is the policy of the Morrison government when it comes to our aged care system. Now, this bill amends the existing Commonwealth Act to introduce a much needed serious incidence response scheme for residential aged care and flexible care delivered in a residential aged care setting. Now, this scheme will replace the current responsibilities of approved providers in relation to reportable assaults and unexplained absences in the Aged Care Act. It will require approved providers to manage incidents and take reasonable steps to prevent them in the first place. The bill will require approved providers of residential aged care in a residential aged care setting to report all serious incidents to the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. A wider range of incidents will now be reportable, including unreasonable use of force, unlawful sexual contact or inappropriate sexual contact, psychological or emotional abuse, unexpected death, stealing or financial coercion, neglect, inappropriate physical or chemical restraint, an unexplained absence from care. When you read that list and you think about our parents and grandparents living in aged care systems for four years, this government has neglected to progress this scheme, to put this serious incident response framework in place. They have neglected older Australians. They are not on the side of older Australians and their families. So this scheme is so important in protecting some of our most vulnerable fellow Australians by placing the rigorous safeguards and the response processes in place where, until now, they have been deficient under the neglect of the Morrison government. The scheme will remove the existing exemption for reporting assaults where the alleged perpetrator is a res residential aged care recipient with a cognitive or mental impairment and the victim is another care recipient. The bill will strengthen protections for people who disclose incidents of abuse or neglect in aged care, and these protections will extend to both existing and former staff members, as well as the current and past residential aged care recipients. The bill will protect people disclosing such failures against any civil or criminal liability. Again, this is such an important reform. It is beyond time these changes were made. It is extraordinary how long the government, the Morrison government, have neglected to progress these changes. 
We do need to expand the powers of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission to enforce the requirements of the new scheme, and this bill does expand those powers. This will include a standard regulatory powers which provide the Commission with a more graduated suite of powers for ensuring compliance and protecting consumers. An additional information gathering power will also ensure the Commission is able to obtain information and the documents it needs to administer the scheme. Now, the main concern that Labor brings to this legislation is that it does not include home care. Given that there are about one million older Australians receiving support or care in their own home, there is an equal risk of serious incident happening in that setting as well as a residential aged care facility. It should be noted that the Council assisting the Royal Commission in its final submission recommended the government should ensure that a new and expanded serious incident reporting scheme include all serious incidents, including in home care, regardless of whether the alleged perpetrator has a cognitive or mental impairment. So it is incumbent upon the government in this debate to explain why millions of Australians who care deeply about these matters, why over a million Australians who receive home care, residential home care, why they're not included in this scheme? Don't they matter? Is the, the Morrison government not on their side? We know the neglect of the Morrison government. It is in the Royal Commission's report, right there in the title. It is the title of the report. It is the policy of this government. And this legislation, unfortunately and tragically, neglects to include those Australians who are receiving home care, aged care, in their home. Now, aged care should never be a policy of neglect. If there is one thing that a federal government should get right, it is looking after vulnerable older Australians, the people who have built this country, the people who have raised families, who created businesses, who served in our military, who served as volunteers in, commun in communities, who passed on the Australian traditions of a fair go in mateship. We shouldn't neglect them in their older years. Can you really trust the Morrison government to improve the aged care system at large, given that their legacy, their policy and their practice is neglect? The evidence against them is now condemning in its depth, its breadth and its gravity. Everyone in this parliament should read the foreword to neglect the interim report of the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. I've read it. It is disturbing. Reading pages of this report, it is possibly the first 12 pages, the most rage-inducing, heartbreaking reading you will do from a government report. The interim report describes the experience of aged care residents with maggots left in open wounds, left to lie in their own urine and excrement for days. It details that up to half of Australia's frailest aged care residents are malnourished. This is not some report from a third world country. This is supposedly one of the best health care systems in the world, Australia, one of the best aged care systems in the world, Australia, not so. Neglect, that's what the Morrison government has turned to. It describes in detail how 60% of residents are on psychotropic medication, but that medication is estimated to only be justified in 10% of cases. It confirms for all who care to pay attention, and I don't think that includes the Morrison government, the 4,000 notifications of alleged or suspected sexual abuse that were reported in one year, the, 20, the 274,409 self-reported cases of substandard care, the 32,715 calls to the My Aged Care Consumer Hotline that went unanswered in one year alone. In short, it is horrifying reading the interim report into, from the Royal Commission into Aged Care. Horrifying. It is happening in our aged care facilities on the Morrison government's watch, and it is a national disgrace. According to the latest population trends, 38% of Australian men and 55% of Australian women will end up in permanent residential aged care. However, for the, for the 240,000 Australians currently in residential aged care, including more than 6,000 younger Australians with a disability, it is already a brutal reality. Not only that, if you're a taxpayer, this is your money. They are, your money 
is being misused by the Morrison government to pay for this national scandal. Let's understand this. The Morrison government treats taxpayer money like it is Liberal Party money. Australians want a government that acts in their interest, that is on their side. Instead, what do they get from the Morrison government? Sports rights, dodgy land deals, you know, secret contracts to liberal mates to do advertising campaigns to tell us what a great job they're doing. And yet, they let this national scandal of neglect of our older, vulnerable Australians in our residential aged care system, in our home care system. Those statistics I just read out about people left in their own urine and excrement, about maggots in their mouths and their open wounds, about being malnourished, about being chemically restrained. The Morrison government wasn't so busy looking after themselves and their mates, they might find time to get on the side of older, vulnerable Australians and look after them. The Prime Minister was our nation's treasurer when the government cut aged care funding by $1.7 billion ensuring services were capped and resources were strangled. But yet, you know, this government, since 2013, has spent a billion dollars on advertising to tell us what a great job they're doing. But they cut $1.7 billion from aged care. Mr. Morrison was in charge when COVID-19 hit. Aged care homes were denied personal protective equipment. They were given an instructional video instead of infection and control training. No wonder Australia has one of the worst records in the world when it comes to residential aged care deaths as a proportion of total COVID-19 fatalities. No wonder the Grattan Institute has described Australia's centrally controlled, heavily rationed aged care services as a Soviet-style system. That is what this Morrison government is overseeing. The Australian government, this government, elected in 2013, only called the Royal Commission in 2018 after it was shamed and shamed again by media scandals. 1.3 million Australians in aged care. The millions more who will need aged care, dare I say some of us in this chamber, of course we will. All of us will at some point have to contemplate going into residential aged care. We all need real policies backed up by real funding for more home care packages to more, and for more workforce development training and more oversight of quality and safety standards. And we need to be cynical of any talk about how the so-called industry has learned its lessons and will now put the customer at the center of everything we do. After all, the Australian government is the only customer the sector cares about because the Commonwealth provides more than 80% of its revenues. And of course, as we know, the Commonwealth has been cutting that funding. Finally, the economics of aged care speak to one of the most tragic elements of our experience of the COVID-19 pandemic. 655 people died in Victorian residential aged care during the crisis last year, entirely on the Morrison government's watch. Aged care is a federal responsibility not a state government one. In fact, their own plan said that they would be responsible for aged care, the management of COVID in aged care facilities. Australia has one of the highest rates in the world of deaths in residential aged care as a proportion of the total COVID-19 deaths. A Senate inquiry has noted that deaths in aged care home account for nearly 75% of all the deaths from COVID-19 in Australia. When more than 1,500 aged care homes requested masks, gloves, and gowns from the National Medical Stockpile last year, they were refused. Staff in aged care homes also needed comprehensive infection control training. Instead, they got a 10-minute video. The Royal Commission has found that the federal government did not have a specific pandemic plan for the aged care sector. Neglect again. Neglect systemically. Neglect before COVID-19. Neglect during COVID-19. This, when is the Morrison government ever on the side of vulnerable, older Australians? When, put, when this evidence from the Royal Commission was put to the government, what did the Minister for Aged Care say? Minister Colbeck said the government maintains its position that it had a plan in place. <sighs> in the last eight years, we have had eight years of despicable neglect. Despicable neglect. Neglect from the point of view of funding, neglect in the priorities, neglect 
for the care of vulnerable older Australians. Neglect of home care, neglect of residential aged care. This bill is important, make no mistake. This bill is necessary, make no mistake. The tragedy is that this bill is so long in coming to this parliament and the tragedy is that it does not do anything to assist those Australians who receive home care, home care aged care in their home. We will continue to fight for them because we are on their side. Senator Seaworth. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Serious Incidents Response Scheme and Other Measures Bill 2020. This bill represents a reform by at least establishing a serious incident response scheme that mandates providers to report on alleged suspected or actual serious incidents. And the Greens do support the bill in principle. However, we have uh, extreme. Uh, we have some concerns about the bill, which I'll articulate now, and I've also uh, circulated amendments to uh, seek to address those serious concerns. I'll also uh, articulate that the Greens very strongly believe that we need to be also uh, having such a scheme for home care, and I'll be asking some questions in the Committee of the Whole around that. This bill in this bill, a serious incident is defined as unreasonable use of force unlawful sexual contact or inappropriate sexual contact, psychological or emotional abuse, unexpected death, stealing or financial coercion by a staff member of the provider, use of physical restraint or chemical restraint other than in circumstances set out in the quality of care principles, neglect or unexplained absence from residential care services um, of the provider. Aged care providers are not only required to report incidences, but also provide support to residents, conduct investigations, monitor actions taken and use data to drive continuous improvement to prevent similar instances from occurring. This bill also offers protections to people who disclose serious incidents, including providers, staff, residents, family members, carers and advocates. The Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission will be responsible for regulating this, the scheme. The Commission will assess a provider's compliance with incident management obligations, receive reports from serious incidents and respond to incidences using um, the full range of regulatory actions available. This scheme represents a significant departure from the existing reportable assaults scheme, and we can all see the failures in aged care. Um, that, are, that we have seen over the years, and there's a, there's a long list of them, quite clearly shows the current system has not been working appropriately. At the moment, aged care providers are only required to report incidences involving unlawful sexual contact or unreasonable use of force against a resident, and we know that they haven't been even doing that. There are also ex um, ex exemptions under the current scheme around reporting assaults if they are committed by residents with cognitive impairment. This has been a serious barrier to, barrier to preventing and dealing with the sexual abuse of older people in residential aged care. Sexual abuse by a person who is cognitively impaired is still actually sexually sexual abuse. I am pleased to see that the new scheme will be expanded to include the reporting of assaults by residents with cognitive impairment. The introduction of the Serious Incident Report Scheme is a welcome change. But I ask the government, why has it taken so long? The new scheme was recommended by the Australian Law Reform Commission all the way back in May 2017 in its final report, Elder Abuse and National Legal Response. This recommendation was then endorsed by the Carnell Patterson Review of October 2017 following investigation of the terrible failures in Oakden. This very chamber, the committee of this very chamber, the Community Affairs Committee, had an inquiry into Oakden as well and also highlighted the massive failures in the system at the time. And yet it is now 2021, just before the Royal Commission comes out with its report, uh, that we are now discussing these particular amendments. And they don't go far enough, so the government is still squibbing it. Older Australians and their families have had to wait four years for action. This just is not good enough. The Australian Greens support this bill in principle. However, we do, ha we do have concerns about 
uh, the bill that it doesn't go far enough, and we've circulated a series of um, what I uh, think are substantive amendments which would strengthen the proposed scheme. Falls are missing from the definition of serious incidences. I'm extremely disappointed to see that falls are not included under the definition of serious incidents. In the government's implementation guide, falls are only mentioned once, where they are used as an example of an unexpected death. Aged care residents are at a high risk of falls that can cause serious injuries, result in a sudden decline in health and, we know, lead even to death. Data from Monash University shows that 15 per cent of all deaths in residential aged care facilities have preventable causes, and of these, 90 per cent are, falls, are from falls and choking. An avoidable death rate of 15 per cent would be cause for outrage in other sectors. Why is aged care treated differently? Falls are often the result of systemic failures, such as insufficient staff and inadequate clinical care. Recent data shows that 10.5 per cent of residents who were admitted to hospital in 2018-19 were because of a fall, which is up from 8.5 per cent in 2014-15. So we know this issue is getting worse. The, they should be reported and investigated to identify case-specific and system, systemic issues that can be changed. Now, I'm not saying that we wrap people in cotton wool in aged care. I'm not saying that at all, because we shouldn't be doing that. But we should be using this system, to, this uh, scheme, to identify falls, to investigate them, and see what happened. Now, in New Zealand, um, I went, uh, was on a delegation a couple of years ago to New Zealand, where we were with the Community Affairs Committee, where we in fact did we looked at uh, aged care. It's part of the reason we were there, and I discussed with the people over in New Zealand the issue around falls, and in their processes, they have been investigating and requiring. Um, Although it's not part of the a legislative response, they have been then looking and reporting and looking into the impact of serious falls and, and requiring them to be notified so that they can actually look at um, whether they have a benefit of improving the system. And my understanding is from my discussions over there is that they have been, in fact, improving the procedures around uh, serious falls. So I asked the minister, and I'll be asking this in the Committee of the Whole, why haven't falls been included in the scheme? If the purpose of this scheme is to encourage providers to continuously improve and reduce the likelihood of incidences reoccurring, surely falls, which are one of the leading causes of preventable death, should be included in the scheme. I'll be moving, I will be moving an amendment to, to add falls under the definition of serious incidences. And just to preempt the answer that the Royal Commission is coming, we know the Royal Commission is coming. We also know this is an issue. So we don't need for the Royal Commission to tell us falls are an issue. Related to this, I'll also be moving an amendment that stops the use of physical and chemical restraints from being reported. That uh, stops it from being reported as a serious incident where they are used in line with the circumstances in the quality of care principles. We think all use of restraints should be reported. We have to start treating the use of chemical and physical restraints as a serious incident. As you know, this chamber knows I've been pursuing this issue for a long time. We shouldn't be using chemical and physical restraints. We should be eliminating the use of chemical and physical restraints. That is why we need to be using this scheme to treat them as a serious incident when they occur and reporting all of them. We know this instrument falls short of the standards. The, the current instrument on the use of chemical and physical restraints falls short of what we uh, of the moving to an elimination of the use of these, print, of these uh, restraints. We need, we, if we are serious in phasing out and ending and eliminating the use of these restraints, we need to be treating it seriously and we need to get serious, serious about phasing it out and using these mechanisms to ensure that happens. I strongly believe that if we, are, we, we require providers to report and publish data on restraints, we will see a significant reduction in their use 
as has been the case in the United States. Another uh, serious omission from, the, from this scheme is public reporting of incident data. I understand that the Commission will be responsible for the publication of sector trends and key risks to support quality improvement and capacity building in the sector. However, this falls short of the recommendation by Council assisting the Royal Commission that the new incident reporting scheme require the quality regulator to publish the number of serious incidents report, reports on a quarterly basis at a global level, at a provider level and at a service or facility level. This recommend go, recommendation goes to the heart of this issue. These, that incidents, um, these incidents need to be reported at a provider level and a service or facility level to really drive improvements. And you can look at what's just happened in Western Australia at Regis to see why we need to be reporting these incidences also at a provider and facility level. If there is no public reporting on which providers and facilities are experiencing serious incidences, how can we drive continuous improvements across the sector? How can consumers compare providers and make informed decisions if that information isn't publicly available? I also strongly believe that consumers and their families should have access to this information so that they can make informed choices about aged care services. The public has a right to know which facilities are of concern and which are managing quality risks uh, well. Public reporting of information across the aged care sector is fundamentally missing, and I think we need to address that if we are going to build transparency and accountability and improve performance throughout the sector. We need to have, a public, report, we need to have public reporting of serious incidences on a quarterly, ba quarterly basis at a, at a global provider and facility level if we are going to achieve improvement in quality care. Uh, and I'll be moving amendments to address these issues. I want to move to the next lot of amendments that will be uh, moving and articulate the issue. Under the new um, serious incidents response scheme, providers are, are responsible for supporting consumers and families if an incident occurs. They are expected to go further than the current scheme and work to prevent similar events from occurring. This is, of course, a welcome reform. However, there is no guidance for providers on how they should support older people who have been involved in an incident. Um, I'll be moving an amendment today that ensures everyone who has experienced a serious incident will be automatically referred to an independent advisory service, such as the National Aged Care Advisory Program. Whether the consumer chooses to take this up is up to them, but at least they'd be required to be provided that information, because many people will actually want to go to an independent person rather than uh, be supported uh, by the provider, who is in fact potentially um, being responsible for the incident. This amendment will ensure that older Australians have guaranteed access to that independent support if they experience sexual abuse, emotional abuse, neglect or any other serious incident defined in the bill. Despite the merits of this strengthened scheme, serious incidences won't tell us everything. The government must not use this scheme as an excuse to delay reforms in other areas that will prevent serious incidents occurring in the first place. Reforms like ensuring that every resident receive four hours and 18 minutes of care, which is the recommended level of care, um, ensuring that nurses are on 24-7 and have the right and that the right ratio and skills mix is available at all times for residents. If we are really going to reduce the number of falls and instances um, of neglect, we need to ensure we have enough qualified staff to care for residents in the first place. I hope that the government will seriously consider the amendments that have circulated in the chamber. In fact, I um, encourage all senators to look at those amendments and support the amendments that I've circulated, which will strengthen this scheme. I also hope that providers will see that the new scheme is an opportunity to fix issues and provide better care to older Australians and their families. We should not lose sight of the purpose of the Serious Incident Rep Response Scheme which is to protect the safety and well-being of residents and to drive changes in the way that care is provided across all these facilities. We no longer want to see the shocking incidences that we have seen in aged care for years and years. This scheme is well past due. It needs to be in place. It needs to be strengthened, and then it needs to be uh, funded and resourced and staffed enough to ensure 
that it has its desired effects. Senator Polly. I rise to speak on the Aged Care Legislation Amendment, Serious Incident Response Scheme and Other Measures Bill 2020. This legislation is long overdue. It's implementing some of the key recommendations of the Australian Law Reform Commission's report into elder abuse, which was tabled in 2017. It's now almost four years after, before we've seen the Liberal government here finally start to act. The report, the Law Reform Commission said that its 43 recommendations were timely and its cornerstone recommendation was that a national plan to develop and to combat elder abuse. To reinforce the needs for a serious incident response scheme, a separate review commissioned again by those sitting opposite followed the Oakton nursing home tragedy, also recommended introducing the scheme in 2017. How can we trust this government will act upon the recommendations of their Royal Commission into Aged Care, whose report is expected to be handed down this month. If they've taken four years, four long years to respond to elder abuse, four long years of abuse of older Australians, the Liberal government then waited two years and commissioned a KPMG to undertake a prevalent study of serious incident report schemes, and the finding of this report were handed down by the government in November 2019, but not made public until June 2022. This report revealed that there were more than 50,000 cases of assault and abuse in aged care across the country that were going unreported each year. They sat on this information for months and let tens of thousands of vulnerable people be subject to undue harm before they started to do anything about it. Under this government, reported assaults in residential aged care have gone up every year, reaching 5,233 in 2018-19, and that's more than 100 a week. 100 of some of our most vulnerable members of our society were assaulted each day and every week. In a research paper from the Aged Care Royal Commission, it has revealed the shocking rates of elder abuse in aged care homes under the Morrison government. It's estimated that almost 40 per cent of people living in Australian aged care homes experience elder abuse in the form of neglect, emotional abuse or physical abuse. But this doesn't include financial, social and sexual abuse. It's found that the prevalence of neglect is over 30 per cent. How shameful is that? These are statistics that we should not be comfortable with. And they have only confirmed just how broken the aged care system is under the Morrison government. Almost eight years of this government, and that's the shameful neglect of the aged care system under the watch of Scott Morrison. Now let's go back to the bill. It amends the Aged Care Act 1997 and the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission Act of 2018 to induce a serious incident response scheme for residential aged care and flexible care delivered in a residential aged care setting. Labor has been calling for the implementation of this scheme since both reports were released in 2017. We again called out the government's inaction on the development of a scheme on the eve of the Elder Abuse Day last year. We will support this legis legislation, but fear it may be insufficient in its current form. The bill will require approved providers to manage incidents and take responsible steps to prevent incidents, including through implementing and maintaining effective organisation-wide governance systems for management and reporting of incidents of abuse and neglect. The bill will also require approved providers of residential care and 
flexible care delivered in a residential aged care setting to report all serious incidents to the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. A wider range of incidents will also now be reportable under these amendments. Currently, aged care facilities only need to report unlawful sexual contact and unreasonable use of force. They don't have to report other types of harm or assaults by elderly residents with dementia or mental illness. Under the amendment, psychological or emotional abuse, unexpected death, stealing or financial co coercion by a staff member, neglect, inappropriate physical or chemical restraint and unexplained absence, absent, absence from care will be uh, reportable. The government's watchdog will also be given additional powers under the amendments to punish providers for failing to keep residents safe. Some aged care experts are critical of the government's scheme, fearing it will be insufficient in its current form. Council assisting in the final submission to the commissioners recommended that the government should, in developing a new and expanded serious incident reporting scheme, and ensure that it also includes all serious incidents, including in home care. As more and more Australians are electing to stay home as long as possible, it's important that they are also provided with protection by this scheme. In its current form, they are not. So again, the government is failing to not only deliver home care packages to older Australians in their own home, they're failing to protect them. This scheme also does not have the proactive mechanisms to prevent elder abuse. Whilst it's an important step in reacting to elder abuse when it occurs, this scheme must do more to prevent it from happening in the first place. There needs to be reform relating to the suitability of people working in aged care by enhancing employment screening processes and ensuring that staff are subject to a national code of conduct. I have been calling for that, and Labor has, for such a long time. There should be regulations for the use of restrictive practices and national guidelines in place for the treatment of care recipients. Older Australians are not only more vulnerable because of their age, other factors such um, as they face increased rates of isolation, disability, cognitive impairment make people more vulnerable to abuse. Elder abuse undermines dignity and autonomy. Abuse and, fear and living with fear can inhibit a person's ability to make choices about their own lives to pursue what they value. We must protect older Australians from abuse so that they can support themselves to live good, dignified lives. They should not be subject to abuse. We owe it to them to ensure that they are protected whether they are living still at home or whether they are residing in residential aged care homes. Australians have rights which should not diminish with age. We all have a right to a dignified existence, free from exploitation, violence and abuse. The federal government has a responsibility they are responsible for the laws and the framework in a legal sense and to ensure that it's put in place to protect older Australians. For far too long, older Australians have been left out and the Morrison government have no excuse as they have commissioned the inquiry after inquiry into the shortcomings of the aged care sector. Now, we on this side of the Senate chamber have known, just like those opposite who, is, who have been responsible for the aged care as ministers, minister after minister have called and sought reports into the aged care sector. They have been well aware of the issues that this sector has faced. They know that there is an issue around abuse in aged care. 
They know there's issues around the workforce and the lack of uh, workers in this sector. They know that the workers in aged care are underpaid. They know that workers in this sector, the majority of them do a very, very good job. But they know the failings of this sector and they have failed to act. And then what they have been doing in recent years is putting everything on hold until the Royal Commission brings down its final report. Well, we never had to wait to have a Royal Commission to know the failings that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis in the aged care sector. But those on the government benches have been very happy to just put their hair down and pretend that they didn't know what was going on. Well, this goes some way some way to ensuring that older Australians are going to be protected whether they live, uh, in, when they live in residential aged care. But they still haven't protected those who are living still at home. Now, after all, let's be quite frank about this. It is far cheaper for the government to support people living in their own home for longer rather than going into the residential home sector. But those on the government benches for the last eight years have failed to deliver the quality of care that is needed to ensure that those living at home are going to be safe, they can have a dignified life living at home, receiving the home care packages that they need, not a level one when they've been assessed to have a level four package. No more excuses, Mr Morrison. It's time you delivered. But those opposite have well and truly dropped the ball when it comes to aged care and our vulnerable older Australians. And older Australians have, re have suffered as a result of that. As we know, tens of thousands of older Australians have died waiting for the level of home care that they had been assessed for but had failed to be delivered by this government. Now, we know the final report into aged care will be handed down this month, but can I just put on record once again that we have never had to wait for that Royal Commission to bring down either its in interim report or the final report. We know of the neglect, and I want to concur with the comments of Senator uh, Keneally here today, and she went back and painted the picture again of maggots and of the abuse and neglect that older Australians have had to endure with an undignified existence in residential care. And also with many of the comments that Senator Seward has uh, highlighted today in her speech, because both of us in particular have been on many inquiries, the Oakton inquiry, and inquiry after inquiry into aged care. We know, we know the neglect. We're in, we are, as Australians, and we all should be embarrassed about the neglect. And it's a shame and it's a blight on the Morrison government, on, in particular on Mr Morrison himself, who before the last election he said he was going to make aged care a, a national priority. Well, if this is what he, he has called a national priority under his watch, God help us if he wasn't interested in aged care. God help us. And God help those older Australians who have been neglected and for those families who have lost their loved ones. Because minister after minister have neglected older Australians in this country. But I also want to put on record my thanks to uh, Julie Collins, the former Shadow Minister for Aged Care and the member for Franklin in Tasmania, my host state, who knew and understood these issues and fought along with myself and Shane Newman and Mark Butler to give older Australia the dignified care and high quality care that they deserve. And want to put on my record uh, my appreciation for Claire O'Neill as the new Shadow uh, Minister for Aged Services. And I'm looking forward 
to continuing to work with uh, Labor's team to hold this government to account to ensure older Australians get the care that they need and they deserve to have a dignified life, whether they're in a residential home care sector or whether they're living at home with the home care packages that they deserve. Because I know that those senators on this side will never ever give up fighting for the dignity that older Australians deserve in this country each and every day. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy uh, President. I rise to speak in support of the Aged Care Legislation Amendment Serious Incident Response Scheme and Other Measures Bill 2020. It must be noted that whilst this bill is welcome, the government has taken far too long to bring this legislation before this parliament. This bill seeks to implement the recommendations for a serious incident response scheme made by the Australian Law Reform Commission three years ago. After that, the Canal Patterson Review, following the terrible abuses at the Oakton Aged Care Facility in South Australia, also made recommendations for a fit-for-purpose serious incident response scheme. Oakton was a tragic and disgraceful blight on the aged care sector in South Australia and a sad and reprehensible chapter in the state's history. Shocking abuses have occurred and do occur in aged care homes throughout Australia. Abuses of the elderly, whether a deliberate act or just through gross negligence, is a stain on our society and we must do what we can now to stop it. The Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety interim report titled Neglect underscored how serious the problem is. It is a scathing interim report. The inquiry found the system had failed to care for our older and often very vulnerable citizens. The commissioners wrote, and I quote, <coughs> it does not deliver uniformly safe and quality care for older people. It is unkind and uncaring towards them. In too many instances, it simply neglects them, end of quote. The system is very much broken as is, and is in need of a major overhaul. Since 2018, the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety has uncovered widespread elder abuse and mistreatment. We learnt that an estimated 50 sexual assaults occur each week across Australia's aged care sector. 50 sexual assaults a week, affecting around 13 to, 15, 13 to 18 per cent of residents. That is sickening and very much a national shame. The abuse is perpetrated by care workers as well as other residents. Now, this bill ensures providers will have to report incidents of abuse and aggression between care residents, including where the resident who commits the incident has a cognitive or mental impairment. This type of abuse is currently exempted. A broader range of incidents will now be reported under the provisions, including unreasonable use of force, unlawful or inappropriate sexual contact, psychological or emotional abuse, unexpected death, stealing or financial coercion by a staff member, neglect, inappropriate physical or chemical restraint and unexplained absence of care. This bill will improve oversight and transparency in addition to expanding the powers of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. I note recently circulated amendments from Senator Patrick that deal with the publication of staffing ratios and the implementation of CCTV cameras in aged care settings. The amendments in sheet 1186 that deal with staffing ratio disclosures mirror similar amendments moved by me previously in this place and a bill introduced in the other place by my colleague uh, the member for Mayor, Rebecca Sharkey. Uh, Rebecca Sharkey introduced a private member's bill calling for transparency in the safe and staffing ratios back in August 2018 and again in July 2019. A government-led committee that reviewed the bill even recommended that that legislation be passed, but the government still hasn't acted. So we will support that amendment. However, we will at this time not be supporting the amendments on sheet 1191 that seek to implement a mandatory CCTV requirement in aged care facilities. Implementing a mandatory CCTV requirement in aged care homes does not fix the underlying and systemic issues facing the sector. 
the chronic understaffing and the de-skilling of staff in aged care settings. Installing CCTV cameras simply avoids the problems that lead to abuse. What is needed are dedicated carers who have been given the proper training for their care role and who are supported by sufficient numbers of colleagues. We need mandatory minimum training requirements. We need legally enforceable staffing ratios with the appropriate skill mix and to make it mandatory to have a registered nurse on each shift. The Aged Care Royal Commission will issue its final report by the 26th of February. Once it does, we expect the government to introduce legislation that acts decisively on all of its recommendations. No more excuses. Oh, thank you, Senator Griff. Um, Senator Walsh, and I just remind you at 11.45 you'll run into a hard marker, so you'll be in continuation. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, Australia's aged care system is broken. It is a national shame. In too many cases, it is delivering neglect and harm instead of care and compassion. Australia's aged care system is in crisis, and it has been in crisis for years, well before COVID-19 hit. So what has the government done to take action on this crisis? Where is their response? Where is their plan? The government's inaction on aged care has been absolutely tragic. Tragic for aged care residents, tragic for their families, and tragic for the staff that work so hard to care for those residents. Because they've all been let down. They've all been let down by the Morrison government, a government that takes far too long on urgent issues, far too long to take life-saving action, um, issues that the government have known about for years, for years. And this bill is no exception. The Serious Incident Response Scheme is no exception. This is a scheme that we need. It's a scheme that we've known that we needed for years, and the government have taken far too long to implement it. And the elder abuse figures in Australia, well, they are absolutely shocking. Uh, we know that research from the Aged Care Royal Commission has shown that almost 40 per cent 40 per cent of those living in Australian aged care facilities experience elder abuse either in the form of neglect, emotional abuse or physical abuse. And this is a national shame. This research was released at the end of last year, uh, and this wasn't the first time that elder abuse was raised as an absolutely urgent issue to this government. Three years ago, the Australian Law Reform Commission released the findings from its investigation into elder abuse in Australia. And they recommended the implementation of a serious incident response scheme then, Thank you, just uh, like the Senator one included Walsh, in this bill. Your, uh, the time for this debate has expired and you'll be in continuation. Um, are there any notices to be given for another day? Senator Fiavanti. Uh, Madam uh, Deputy President, on behalf of the uh, Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next sitting day to withdraw notices of motion proposing the disallowance of three legislative instruments set out in the list circulated in the chamber. Thank you, Senator Fiavanti Wells. Are there any other motions to be given for another day? There being none, um, is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Uh, Senator Smith. Senator Madam Smith. Deputy President, I present the first report of 2021 of the Selection of Bills Committee and I seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansard. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that the report be adopted. Uh, uh, Senator Dunham, do you wish to... I'm just going to need, need to move this. So it's selection of bills motion. So the question. Okay. Thank you, Senator Dunham. So uh, yes, um, Madam Deputy President, I move the following amendment at the end of the motion. Add, and in respect of the security legislation amendment, critical infrastructure bill 2020, and the intelligence oversight and other legislation amendment, integrity measures bill 2020, the bills not be referred to committees. 
Thank you. Um, Senator McKim. Um, thank you, Deputy President. I just wish, wish to speak briefly uh, to the amendment proposed by Senator Dunham on behalf of the government. Um, both of uh, the bills that the amendment uh, refers to um, continue uh, with a, uh, a cavalcade of legislation that has been presented to this parliament uh, in recent years, which significantly expand yeah, yeah, the powers of Australia's uh, intelligence agencies and security apparatus. I remind colleagues that Australia remains the only liberal democracy on the planet which does not have some form of charter or Bill of Rights, either constitutionally enshrined or as part of our statutes. And without those protections, this government, and it has to be said, uh, with Labor in absolute lockstep most of the time, continues to grant sweeping new powers to our intelligence agencies, often without adequate scrutiny. And here we go again. Senator Dunham wanting to ensure that this Senate is not able to inquire into the details of this legislation. And I remind colleagues and the Australian people that um, this legislation creates uh, last resort powers to uh, our intelligence agencies, or at least one of them in, um, in the Australian Signals Directorate, that would allow the ASD to install programs, access, add, restore, copy, alter or delete data and alter the functioning of digital hardware or remove digital hardware entirely from premises. Now, the tech sector, many tech companies have expressed significant concern about the powers in this legislation. And I want to place it firmly on the record that the Australian Greens share those significant concerns. We are seeing a power-hungry government ride roughshod over the rights and freedoms of Australians by giving significant extra powers to our intelligence and security agencies. And they want to do it without even allowing the Senate an opportunity to inquire into uh, um, the impact of these powers being granted, uh, any unintended consequences to these powers being granted. So we will be opposing this amendment and we want to place it firmly on the record that Australia needs a Bill of Rights or a Charter of Rights in order to protect the rights and freedoms that so many in the Liberal Party love to talk about but never come in here to defend and, in fact, come in here time after time to remove those rights and freedoms from the Australian people. We won't be supporting uh, this amendment because these bills should be referred to a Senate inquiry. Thank you, Senator McKim. Are there any other speakers on the selection of bills matter? So I'm proposing to put the amendment, which I'm assuming has been circulated. So the question is that the uh, amendment uh, to the Selection of Bills Committee report as moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I, aye. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. It's now my intention to put that amended motion. Um, so the question is that the report from the Selection of Bills Committee, as amended and moved by Senator Dunningham, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the <laughs> ayes have it. Um, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. I move that a government business orders of the day, as shown on today's order of business, be considered from 12:45 p.m. today. B. Government business uh, be called on after the consideration of the bills listed in paragraph A, and considered, do not later than 2 p.m. today. And C. General business notices uh, notice of motion number 972 be considered during general business today. Thank you. So the question is that that motion moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. 
Deputy President, a postponement notification has been lodged in respect of General Business Notice No. 971 for today, postponed to the 17th of February 2021. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I remind. I beg your pardon, Senator Seaward. Uh, I've finished that now. I was going to. Yes, Senator Seaward. If to move a leave of, a, of absence for a senator. Oh, are we there yet? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. As leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Seaward. I move a motion of leave of absence for uh, Senator Thorpe for personal reasons. So, just for today, Senator Seaward? Sorry, I beg your pardon. Yes, for uh, today, the 4th of February. Thank you. So, uh, the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seaward be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Okay. So I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Um, I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. And um, I'm going to start with general business notice of motion number 979, standing in the name of Senator O'Sullivan and many other senators. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask the general business notice of motion 979 relating to the bushfires in Western Australia be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator O'Sullivan. I move the motion standing in my name and the names of all Western Australian senators, Brockman, Cash, Dodson, Lyons, Pratt, Reynolds, Seawert, Small, Dean, Smith, Stilljohn Still and Stirl. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator O'Sullivan, standing in his name and other West Australian senators be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye against, I believe, the ayes have it. I'll now move to um, general business, notice of motion number 976, standing in the name of the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Wong. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I inform the Chamber that Senator Griff will also sponsor the motion, and I ask that general business notice of motion number 976 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. So the question is Senator Dunning. To make a short statement. The leave is granted for one minute, Senator yeah, thank Dunning. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The government strongly supports this motion. We extend our best wishes to the many Australians celebrating the arrival of the Year of the Ox, a symbol of strength, resilience and positivity. Australia is one of the most successful multicultural societies in the world, and our strength and resilience comes from our unity as Australians, regardless of our faith or cultural background. The government is strongly committed to maintaining social cohesion. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business. Notice of motion number 969, standing in the name of Senator Polly. I wish to inform the Senate that Senators Wish Wilson, McKim, Brown, Urquhart, Abetz, Dunningham, Askew, Colbeck, Chandler and Lambie will also sponsor the motion. I also seek leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion Number 969 relating to Australia Day honours before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Polly. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in, in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. So the question is, the amendment is moved by Senator Polly be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The question now is that the amended motion, number 969, is moved by Senator Polly be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Could I just draw to your attention that standing orders on Thursdays are that we uh, go through the notices of the motion in the order okay. uh, and would seek for that to be the case. Thank sure. you. Thank you. I haven't done Thursdays for a long time, so you have to bear with me. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the question is that uh, general business number 965, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, I beg your pardon, nine, so you've completely thrown now, 956, uh, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 956, proposing an introduction as a, of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? 
There being none, I call Senator Hanson Young. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to amend the Environment Protection Biodiversity Act, 1999, and for related purposes. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I present the bill and move that this bill may now proceed without formality and be read a first time. So the question is, oh, you were seeking leave? Uh, no, you're moving. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Um, <coughs> a bill for an act to amend the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999 and for related purposes. Thank you. Senator Hanson Young. I move that this bill be read now a second time, and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I table an explanatory memorandum and seek leave to have my second reading speech incorporated into Hansard for the Save the Koala Bill and continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. Uh, we'll now deal with um, general business, notice of motion number 967, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith and others. Thank you, Madam De Deputy President. I ask that general business, notice of motion number 967, relating to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I'll call Senator Dean Smith. I move the motion standing in my name in the names of Senators McGrath, Chandler, McLaughlin, Abetz, Davy O'Sullivan, Scar, Askew, MacDonald and Henderson. Thank you. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Dean Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. <laughs> now move to general business notice of motion number 968, standing in the name of Senator Griff. Senator Griff. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I inform the Chamber that Senators Keneally, Wong, Katie Gallagher, Urquhart, O'Neill, Carr, Mariel Smith, Polly, Kitching, Dodson, Billick, Ayres, Stirl, Ciccone and Brown will also sponsor the motion and I ask that general business notice of motion number 968 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Griff. I move the motion. Senator Rice? Is leave granted? I didn't hear it. There's no objection. Senator Rice. Will Thank you. Know. The Greens wholeheartedly support this motion. We must never forget the six million Jewish people, including one and a half million children, who were murdered during the Holocaust, along with the Roma and Sinti peoples, same-sex attracted people and the disabled, who were specifically targeted by the Nazis and their collaborators for annihilation. Nor must we forget all who have perished since because of anti-Semitism and white supremacism. It's up to all of us in this place to fight the rise of extremist groups that seek to sow division and hate and to do Australians harms. And the gathering of neo-Nazis, extremists and the Grampians on Good at Chamara country over the Evasion Day weekend on the eve of Holocaust Remembrance Day should be a wake-up call to us all. Nazis are not a thing of the past and our leaders must call them out. So the question is that the uh, motion is moved by Senator Griff and others be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Uh, against? I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to general business number 970, standing in the name of Senator Keneally. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I ask that general business notice of motion number 970 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being I move none. the motion. I call Senator Urquhart. So the question is that, oh, beg your pardon, uh, Minister. Dep Deputy President, I seek leave to move amendments to the motion. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted, Minister. I thank the chamber. I move the amendment uh, that has been. I move the motion be amended in the terms circulated in the chamber. So, Senator Fariki, I'm sorry, I didn't see you standing. Seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, yes, I think we'll. We'll just deal. We'll deal with the amendment now. It's been put, and then we've, we'll still come back to you because we won't have moved the amendment in full, the motion in full. Senator Gallagher. I seek leave to make a short statement to the amendment. Uh, is well, we didn't. 
Uh, Senator Siwa, I did ask, and well, Senator Faruqi didn't make that clear. Okay, thank you. So, is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted for one minute. The motion. Um, Labor will be opposing the amendment to the motion because the government is seeking to white out the advice of ASIO, the Australian Federal Police and the Department of Home Affairs that right-wing extremism is on the rise in Australia. The Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs confirmed this on Sky News on Tuesday. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Faruqi. Thank you. I seek leave to make a short statement on the amendment. Uh, yes, leave is granted for one minute. Senator Thank you. Faruqi. I mean, if you needed any more evidence, that this government has absolutely no interest in grappling with the existential threat of far-right extremism, look no further than this amendment, look no further than the de debate that they contributed to yesterday. It's more nonsensical false equivalences, more nonsensical downplaying of, deadly, of the deadly seriousness of far-right terror. This is really harmful stuff. I mean, this is running interference on the side of fascism and hate. This is the Australian equivalent of Donald Trump commenting on the Charlottesville violence, blaming both sides for what had happened. And that's why we will oppose this amendment. You should really be so, so ashamed of yourself, but you have no shame. That's the problem. So the question is? I beg your pardon, Senator Hanson. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Thank Hanson. Thank you. One Nation does support this amendment to, to um, the motion being passed because it expresses that we are against all extremism, whether it's from the far right or the far left. That is taking a balanced path, and that was stated yesterday in my speech. There, it cannot be one-sided. You have to be, as a leaders of this nation, to be against all extremism. Um, and that's why we support this amendment, and I do encourage the left and the opposition to actually consider this. Otherwise, if you are quiet on this and you do not support it, then you support extreme, extreme. Um, that is just rubbish. You you do support it. You you never, you never actually speak against extreme. Um, on the Order. left side, you do not. It does happen in this country on both sides. So take a balanced view with it and look at it objectively, and not from the political side, but as you are. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Your time has expired, so I'm intending to put the amendment. So the question is that the amendment, as moved by Senator Birmingham, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Senator McKenzie, I don't really want to have to move to naming individual senators, but I have called order about four times. Yes, Senator McKenzie. Yes.
Lock the doors. Order. So the question is that the amendment, as moved by Senator Birmingham to uh, notice of motion number 970, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Senator Rice. So the question is that the result of the division is 34 ayes and 27 noes. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, and did you miss? I was going to put the amended motion. Oh, you need to move the amended motion. Thank you. Well, I, no, no, I don't need to do that, Deputy yeah. President. But I do seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Senator Burke. Thank you, Deputy President. I thank the Senate. I thank the Senate for passing the amendment that has just been passed to this motion. Uh, this is an important amendment because it makes clear uh, that this Senate condemns all forms of extremism, allows for a unifying motion to be put, I trust, in this place uh, in support of all Australians and the respect that all Australians ought to be shown. Our strength and resilience as a nation comes from our unity as Australians, regardless of our faith, cultural or other backgrounds or positions. 
In this place, we often see motions bowled up for wedge purposes that conflate different issues, draw together different points. What is important, Deputy President, is that on issues like this, we try as hard as possible to speak clearly with one voice. The amended motion provides the opportunity for us to do so, to condemn extremism and to show our respect and support for all Australians. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Keneally. Move is granted for one minute. Senator Thank Keneally. you. Uh, Labor will support the amended motion, but let's make clear that what the government just did was attempt to white out the advice of national security agencies. National security agencies, Mike Pizzullo, Secretary of Home Affairs, this week on Sky News, said right-wing extremism is on the rise. ASIO has said it is on the rise. The AFP has said it is on the rise. The Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, said last week right-wing extremism is on the rise. It is the terrorist threat that we must confront. This Order. government has sought to downplay it and dismiss it. They Order. have sought to downplay Order. it and dismiss it. And that is what this amendment has sought to do. Today, Alex Hawke said there is no rise in right-wing extremism. And what the government have done here today is to attempt to white it out of this motion. Labor will support the amended motion because, of course, we support taking action against extremism in all forms. What is embarrassing is the government denies that it's happening. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Order. Order. Senator Ayres. Senator Payne. Senator Seawit. Deputy President, the Greens would like, won't call a division, but we would like it noted that given the changes, we do oppose it because the government doesn't even agree that there has been a significant increase in fire right extremism. They took that out. That's outrageous. The Greens object to the amended uh, to the amendments, so we object to the motion, but we won't divide. Thank you, Senator uh, Seawit, though the Greens' position will be noted. I'm now putting the amended motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number uh, 970 as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Uh, I believe the ayes have it, and we note that the Greens wish to um, object to that motion. Order. Order. Senator Ayres. Order. I'm now intending to move to general business notice of motion number 973, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 973, relating to manufacturing jobs in regional Australia, be taken as formal. Uh, is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? Uh, Senator Watt. Uh, Labor asks for the question on general business notice of motion 973. Uh, could I ask for silence, please? Thank you, Senator Watt. We'll uh, move. We'll, Senator Watt, we'll get uh, Senator McKenzie to move the motion, but then we'll come back to you. Senator McKenzie. It's great to see uh, uh, Senator Watt so keen to engage on a debate about regional manufacturing. I move the motion standing in my name and the name of Senators Canavan, Davy, MacDonald and McMahon, and I'd like to add Senators Rennick and Molan. Uh, Senator Faruqi. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Yes, uh, it's uh, for one minute. Thank you, Senator. Thanks. Friedman. The Greens oppose this motion. The Nationals claim to have a plan for manufacturing, but all this is is a plan for locking in a climate catastrophe and destroying the future of regional communities for the corporate profits of your mates. What we need, what we need, is industry powered by renewable energy, Order. not oil and gas. Order where we make, reuse and remake durable, ecologically sustainable goods. Our manufacturing future is one where manufacturing doesn't just work for the corporate profit, Order. but instead for people, communities and the environment, where workplaces are inclusive, democratic, innovative and ethical, where meaningful, safe, well-paid work isn't rare or, or at risk, but the norm. The future is achievable and it's achievable now. The coalition 
needs to get with it or get out of the way. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Roberts. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted for one minute. Senator Roberts. Thank you. One Nation supports the general thrust of this motion. We also support the reinsertion of page 18 of the National's manufacturing policy to release last week back into this motion and to reinsert all references to coal that the Nationals did not have the courage to include in today's motion and remove from the policy. The largest cost category of manufacturing and increasingly agriculture, due to electricity prices rising, today is electricity prices. And without including coal, this makes the Nationals' motion a hollow stunt. Without coal-fired power, the Nationals' policy and motion is pointless. Order. Without coal-fired power, the Nationals' policy and mo motion is pointless. Uh, Senator Watt. Uh, Madam De Labor seeks leave for the question on uh, general business notice of motion 973 to be divided so that we can oppose paragraph A and support paragraph B. And I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, you don't need leave to uh, split the motion. Uh, is leave granted for Senator Watt to make a short statement? Yes, it is. Thank you for one minute, Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, Labor will not be supporting paragraph A of this motion. Labor supports Australian manufacturing and the jobs it creates, hence we'll be supporting paragraph B. Labor does not need rogue national policy ideas that the Liberals Order. don't themselves support, like new publicly funded coal-fired power stations. Uh, we have our own ideas, like the National Rail Manufacturing Plan. We agree with the Nationals' backbench that they and their coalition partners have neglected the manufacturing industry, having presided over the loss of 90,000 jobs in manufacturing since their election in 2013. Australian manufacturers need Order. many for support. They don't need an empty stunt by disgruntled Nationals in the Senate who have had nearly eight years to speak up, a plan which was rejected on day one by senior Liberal Party ministers. This motion is simply an embarrassing demonstration of how ineffective the Nationals are within their government. Every time they put up an idea, the Liberals shoot it down. They get shot down day after day. And Here's another example. Order. So, uh, order. Order. Senator Patrick. I seek leave to make one is minute statement. Leave granted. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Deputy President, um, I, I just note that the motion refers to the Nationals' manufacturing 2035 plan, and it's just, I've, I'm a little bit confused as to whether that's the government, whether it's the Nationals, whether it's the Liberals. Um, it might, it might, it might not surprise, it might, might not surprise you that that plans of the Nationals are not high on my reading list. If you had come to me with your plan, I might uh, be more, have been more inclined. It might be online, but it's Order. not necessarily high on my reading list. Have the courtesy of perhaps providing the plan to uh, people before you ask, uh, ask them to vote on it. Thank you, Senator Patrick. So this motion is being split, so I'm putting the first half. So um, general business notice of motion number 973, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie and others, paragraph A. Uh, those that agree with it say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Um, the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. <laughs>
order, lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 973, uh, paragraph A, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie and others, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 31 ayes and 29 noes, the question on part A is resolved in the affirmative. I'll now move to part B. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 973, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie and others, part B be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number 974, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 974 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Be clear to make a short statement. Uh, leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Australia is one of the first countries in the world to complete full safety and medical assessment of the vaccine, and we have one of the highest rates of doses per capita in the world. We're on track to commence rollout in late February, and the Academy of Sciences endorsed our vaccine strategy. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 974, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Uh, I believe the ayes have it, noes have it. Division required, ring the bells for four, four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion 974 in the name of Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair. The noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. There being 27 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We will now move to general business. Notice of motion number 975, standing in the name of Senators Steelejohn and Rice. Deputy President. I beg your pardon, Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion No. 975 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Rice. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Short statement. Is leave granted? Our leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. The government remains committed to addressing the mental and physical health of all Australians, including the LGBTI community. However, these matters are well known to be a clear area of state legislative responsibility and accepted as matters for state and territory governments to consider, as is happening in Victoria. So, uh, Senator, um, oh. so the question is that general business uh, notice of motion number 975, standing in the name of Senators Steele, John, and Rice, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
order, lock the doors. So the question is that general business, notice of motion number 975, standing in the name of Senator Steele, John and Rice, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being 27 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We now move to general business. Notice of motion number 977, standing in the name of Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 977 about political donations be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. Thanks, Deputy President. I move the motion. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. To make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. All Australians are entitled to participate in the democratic process by financially supporting candidates and political parties, including Graham Wood and Duncan Turpey, who have made considerable donations to the Australian Greens over a number of years. Australia has an appropriately robust system to regulate the disclosure and reporting of political donations overseen by the independent Australian Electoral Commission. In recent years, this government has implemented several reforms to improve, improve the integrity and transparency of the electoral system. This includes banning foreign donations, ensuring that political campaigners are subject to similar reporting and disclosure as political parties, and funding of modernisation of the AEC's transparency register to make it easier to access information. The government is considering the recommendations made by the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, a joint and multi-partisan committee that deals with these matters. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to make a short statement. I leave is granted for one minute, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Um, Labor will not be supporting this motion, even though there are elements of it uh, that Labor supports, and I have relayed this to Senator Waters. We don't believe that um, electoral reform will be delivered through motions uh, during formal motions in this place. Uh, we think it requires substantive debate and is best dealt with through uh, draft legislation. Uh, Labor has legislation in the Senate. We look forward to debating that uh, next sitting and we look forward to the Greens' support for our bills. Uh, we do believe there needs to be electoral reform uh, to protect uh, democracy and we'll be proceeding with Senator Farrell's bill at the next sitting. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. I are you seeking the call, Senator Lambie? Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, the Jackie Lambie network will be um, supporting. Senator Lambie, what is it that you're seeking to do? Are you seeking leave uh, sorry, to make a short statement? Sorry, seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Deputy Madam President. Um, the Jackie Lambie network will be supporting this because, quite frankly, we just want anything done that's going to do the right thing to uh, make sure these donations are done in real time whether it's got a cap on it, whether the threshold's lower. But if we could just do something and start making some change to these political donations, because in our eyes they are completely out of control. I mean, when you're standing up here and you can see it in your face and you can see what, what that buys these people, 
um, and what doors are open because the amount of money that is paid and how legislation is done based on how much political donation you get um, it's getting beyond a joke. It is, there is no trust left out there within the Australian community when it comes to political donations, and quite frankly, it's damning. We want to start getting trusted, and they want to see people up here earning instead of buying their seats, and we have no choice. And this needs to stay on the agenda because change needs to happen, and it needs to start straight away. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lambie. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 977, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Uh, ring the bells for one minute. The doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 977, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. The eyes shall move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint. Um, I am appointing tellers. People need to be sitting down. You need to sit. I've appointed tellers. You should be sitting in your seats. Uh, Senator C, I appoint Senator Seawitt for the eyes and Senator Urquhart for the nose. Order. There being 11 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. It now being beyond 12.45, we will now move to government business, orders of the day, and I call the clerk. Government business, order of the day number six, designs amendment, advisory council on intellectual property response bill 2020, second reading debate. Senator Brown. Uh, Madam Deputy President, this bill implements the recommendations from, uh, from the 2016 Australian Government's response to the former Advisory Council on Intellectual Property IP review of the design system. Uh, 
Yes, oh, you heard. You're right. That's all that matters, Senator Dunham. Uh, the bill will introduce a 12-month grace period to help protect designers from losing their rights if they accidentally publish or use their design before filing an application. There will also be an expanded. Um, this will also be an expanded prior use infringement exemption to protect third parties who start using designs during the tw this 12-month window. The design registration process has been simplified to make registration automatic six months after filing and removing the option to publish a design without registering. The bill extends innocent infringer defence to safeguard those who use designs that have been filed but not published on the register of designs. This is in alignment with other IP rights by giving exclusive licensees legal standing to sue for infringement. The timeline for the legislation to reach the parliament is also worthy of noting. In 2012, the Advisory Council on Intellectual Property was tasked with the job of investigating the effectiveness of the design system in, simula in simulation innovation by Australian users and its impact on e economic growth. A final report was handed down in March 2015, and the government didn't respond to the report until 6 May 2016. The legislation is now only being dealt with years after these recommendations were made. Whilst Labor supports the bill, we continue to highlight the government's continued non-strategic approach to innovation policy and a failure to deliver timely R&D funding support for Australian manufacturing. Only $50 million <coughs> of the of the government's $1.5 billion announcement is being made available to manufacturers this financial year. We can, I, condemn, I commend <laughs> the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Brown. Our minister. I presume there are no other speakers on there this. There are no other speakers. No. Okay. All right. Uh, well, look. I thank um, senators for their contributions on this bill, and I particularly want to note. Uh, on this, I mean, we, here we are uh, talking about um, intellectual property, and that covers a whole range of issues. But uh, just uh, looking at the fact that uh, Senator Brown is a very proud Tasmanian senator, and I want to commend her particularly on something we didn't get to deal with in la the last session, and that is her support, along with that of Senator Lambie, all Labor senators, Senator Lambie, and all Liberal senators of the forestry industry, of which there are many intellectual property issues in it. So I just wanted to put on record how proud I am to work with all of my most of my Tasmanian Senate colleagues on issues like that, and hopefully we'll get to deal with that uh, motion that we didn't deal with uh, just before next sitting week. Uh, but look, I do thank senators for their contributions on. Uh, this bill, um, and in commending the bill to the Senate, I also table an addendum to the explanatory memorandum relating to this bill. The addendum responds to concerns raised by the Scrutiny of Bills Committee. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the bills now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Designs Act 2003 and for related purposes. Now, no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move the bill be read a third time. Uh, the question is that the bill now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Designs Act 2003 and for related purposes. Thank you. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Australian Immunisation Register Amendment Reporting Bill of 2020 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is the bill now be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Immunisation Register Act 2015 and for related purposes. Minister. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll come back to you. Yep. Yes. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Yes, leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Brown. Um, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Labor supports this bill as part of our national response to the COVID crisis. It is crucial that as the national vaccine rollout happens, the national in immunisation register represent an accurate record of vaccinations across Australia. Labor will continue to work with the government to build public support for COVID-19 vaccinations, including by emphasising the independence and expertise of the Thera Thera Therapeutic Goods Administration and supporting an effective national immunisation register. 
This will be important to countering messages from a small number of anti-vaxxers, including within the government's own ranks, and encouraging take-up among, among a larger group of vac vaccine-hesitant Australians. I commend the bill to the Senate. Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator, for the contributions and commend the bill to the Senate. Oh, the question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no, the ayes have it, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Immunisation Register Act 2015 and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move the bill be read a third time. The question is the bill now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Immunisation Register Act 2015 and for related purposes. Thank you. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Telecommunications Amendment Infrastructure in New Developments Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the uh, bill now be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Telecommunications Act 1997 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated is in the answer. Leave granted. Leave is granted. And the question is the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Brown. I rise to speak on the Telecommunications Amendment Infrastructure and New Developments Bill 2020. The context of this bill, as set out in the explanatory memorandum, is to address to address unincorporated, unincorporated developers who have a legally enforceable obligation to install pit and pipe infrastructure in new, development develop, in new property developments. This will ensure Australians who move into new homes can have the confidence that, undergo, that underground ducts and pipes, which are needed to subsequently connect to the NBN and other networks, have been installed as required. In the rare circumstances where they are not, this bill will make it possible to issue penalties and other remedial uh, actions to, to unincorporated developers. Labor supports this bill as it addresses a small gap in our existing consumer protection framework. The, pro the proposals are sensible and we do hope passage of this bill brings us very close to eliminating the number of instances where de developers fail to install telecommunications infrastructure. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Brown. Minister. I commend the bill to the Senate. The question is the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. No against. No. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Telecommunications Act 1997 and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move the bill be read a third time. The question is the bill now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Telecommunications Act 1997 and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number two, aged care legislation amendment, serious incident response scheme and other measures bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, well, the government's inaction on elder abuse after years of evidence, after years of review, it is absolutely inexcusable. Another review commissioned by the government into the Oakden nursing home tragedy, um, it also recommended the implementation of a serious incident response scheme. And that review, it was released back in 2017. 2017, over three years ago. And KPMG, they did a review as well, a study into the prevalence of abuse and assault in aged care. And what they found was also tragic. They found more than 50,000 cases of abuse and assault every year going unreported. <coughs> 50,000. The KPMG findings were from a government-commissioned study. The Morrison government received this report in November 2019, and then they sat on that report and they didn't make it, didn't make it public until June 2020. 
Why? What is the minister doing? What is Minister Colbeck doing? What is the government doing on this absolutely tragic issue? Why is it that 40 per cent of aged care residents experiencing elder abuse, 40 per cent, has not been a top government priority for the last three years at least? Why has it taken so long to implement this absolutely critical scheme? We're talking about our parents. We're talking about our grandparents. These are the Australians that have worked so hard to make our country what it is. These are the Australians that have worked so hard to give all of us the opportunities that we have today. The very least that they deserve is dignity. They deserve to be protected in our aged care facilities. They deserve to be supported by their own government. They need uh, better than a government that sits on reviews for three years, sits on reports and recommendations for three years. Um, and they need that respect, they need that support, they need that dignity now, right now, immediately. But this scheme is just another chapter in a story of eight years of this government's neglect. It doesn't matter how many shocking reports, it doesn't matter how many shocking stories. The Morrison government has not delivered the urgent reforms that are needed to address the aged care crisis. Every report ignored, every warning ignored, every heartbreaking story ignored. This is neglect. And it is neglect which sums up the government's eight-year record on aged care. You just have to listen to the stories of the hard-working aged care staff to really understand just how hard things have got in aged care under this government. Last year I met with Ross, Delia, Wendy and Tracy. Uh, and they are proud aged care workers and they're proud United Workers' Union members. And they need our support. They need our support. And they need the support of everyone in this chamber and everyone in this place. Because they, they want to fix the aged care crisis. And they have a plan to do it. Ross told me about a 90-year-old woman that he cares for. And he described her movingly as an elegant and proud woman. A woman who came through World War II in Germany and made her way here. A woman that he has huge respect for. A woman who, because of the aged care crisis, he has witnessed being forced to sit in her own mess just because there are not enough staff to give her the dignity and the respect that she deserves. Ross works 50 hours a week because his aged care job is not enough to support himself and his three children. It's not enough pay per week. So he has a second job to make ends meet. And he is absolutely passionate about aged care. He wants it to be his career. It's already his vocation. But he has to work a second job to make ends meet because the jobs in aged care are so poorly paid they are so insecure and they don't offer workers enough, enough hours to make that commitment to the sector. So what does that say about the priority that we as a country, that this government, that this Morrison government puts on our older Australians? What does it say about that level of priority? What does it say about the respect that we give to the dedicated and caring workforce that is trying so hard, despite the government's failings, to actually deliver quality care to the residents that they're so committed to. We need to do better. This government needs to do better by the aged care residents, by their families and by the workforce. Delia and Tracy, they spoke about being tired all the time too tired when they've finished their work to enjoy their own lives and too tired 
in their own words, to give the quality of care that they know that the residents absolutely deserve. They say that they are always running because of the lack of support and the lack of investment from this government into the aged care system. They say that there is just not enough time and not enough staff in a day to get the work done. But they spoke to me of their commitment to the residents that they serve, to these people who have contributed, these people who have fought so hard for the country that we have today, people who deserve so much more from this government and who deserve better from this minister. When I met with Wendy, she had actually come to the gallery to listen to Minister Colbeck, to hear the government answer questions about what their plan is for aged care, what their plan is to actually protect the residents in our uh, federally run aged care system. Uh, and when I met with Wendy, she was, after being in the gallery here in question time, she was in tears. And she was in tears because the minister sitting opposite, Minister Colbeck, could not answer the questions about how he was going to protect the residents in aged care. He couldn't answer the questions about how he was going to back up the workforce and give them the tools that they need to do their jobs. She came to this place to see that the minister had a plan and she left in tears because she was convinced that he didn't. And as she said to me, what she felt was happening was that the minister had turned his back on her and turned his back on the workforce and turned his back on the residents in aged care in Australia. And that is a complete disgrace. So Ross, Delia, Tracy and Wendy, they have a plan, even if the government doesn't. They have a plan to deliver the aged care sector that our elders absolutely deserve. They have a plan to win the decent, secure jobs that have to be the foundation of any reform to aged care in this country. Because without a stable and committed and dedicated workforce, we are not going to be able to fix the problems and we're not going to be able to give our elders the care that they so absolutely deserve. The workforce needs good, secure jobs to do their job for residents in aged care. They need a decent wage and they don't have one today. They need enough hours to get by on one job, not two jobs, not three jobs, one job in their vocation to deliver the care, the quality care that they want to deliver to the residents in aged care. And we need minimum staffing levels in this country. Um, it is a disgrace that we do not have today minimum staffing levels in aged care facilities in our country under this government. It is a complete disgrace. We need those minimum staffing levels so that our committed, dedicated aged care workforce can do their jobs, so that our elders have the care that they need and the dignity that they deserve. We are one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We can and we must fund aged care properly. And we can and we must ensure that the funding goes exactly where it is meant to go. And that is to the care of the residents. And it is to good, secure jobs for the workforce who are there doing their best to look after those residents and provide that care. Uh, and we need to make sure that the funding goes to them to the residents, to the workforce providing the care um, and not to profits uh, of for-profit providers um, and not into the reserves of non-profit uh, providers in the sector, to the residents and to the workforce that looks, uh, looks after those residents. Tracy said it best to me when I met with her. She said, people in aged care are humans and under this government they're being treated as if they're on a production line, a production line. It's time we listened to the dedicated aged care workers who are speaking up so courageously about the problems in the sector. It is time that we listened to them. 
They're not just speaking up for their own jobs, for their own security, they're speaking up for the residents as well. They're speaking up to protect the residents, which this government has failed to do for the last three years while we have heard tragic, disgraceful story after tragic, disgraceful story about abuse in our aged care facilities in this country. Uh, and I stand with those workers who are raising um, these concerns, who are calling the government out, who are speaking up for the residents, who are standing with the residents and protecting them, which this government refuses to do. Thank you, Senator Walsh. And I call Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the, on the um, uh, Aged Care Legislative a legislation amendment, serious incident response scheme, and others, other me measures bill. Um, firstly, I'll say that, uh, having listened to a number of speakers uh, before me, that uh, I probably don't need to go through uh, all of the issues associated with aged care in Australia at the moment, other than to say uh, it's not in a satisfactory state. Senator Walsh has uh, summarised. Uh, a number of the the issues uh, at hand, <clears throat> and, and the government has been slow <clears throat> in responding to the needs in in aged care facilities. <clears throat> I might say that uh, you know, sometimes uh, you know, fixes come down to money, and so I will uh, raise perhaps my favourite sort of pet issue with the with the government uh, as I s uh, speak on this bill, and that is. Uh, and I say this as a former submariner, probably the keenest person in the parliament in relation to uh, 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 our submarine capability. Uh, but I note that the government does, uh, or, or the, the, the government uh, entered into uh, that, that uh, the future submarine program with a view that uh, that the project would cost $50 billion outturned. We know that from evidence before the. Um, uh, FADT estimates uh, committee back in 2015. The number is now $89 billion. That's $39,000 million in blowout cost. That equates to over the period of the of the program, 38 years, to $2.8 million per day. So Australians are paying $2.8 million per day, not for the submarines but for the blowout associated with that particular program. And just we need to start thinking about what we could do with $2.8 million per day uh, in the aged care sector. I'm all for defence, uh, but defence money must be spent wisely. And uh, that particular program is in, is in significant trouble. And unfortunately, it's having an effect, effect on uh, money that could, uh, that could be spent on other more worthy uh, projects other than waste uh, and blowout. So um, we, we need to take aged care seriously. We need to fund it properly. I think this bill goes some way to remedying uh, uh, difficulties and problems that we have in the aged care sector, and for that reason I will be supporting the bill. Uh, I do, however, want to speak to a couple of the amendments that I will move in uh, in the committee stage, uh, and I'm doing that now because uh, I note that uh, you know I was uh, a little bit late in circulating uh, these amendments. I did, did that yesterday. Uh, the first uh, set of amendments that I've uh, that, are, that I've circulated, uh, the first relates to staffing uh, ratio disclosure. Um, uh, Senator Walsh mentioned issues of, of uh, staff ratios, uh, m m mentioned issues associated with you know, people having to spread across a couple of jobs. And Look, I understand that, uh, that, that uh, proprietors of these aged care facilities, they, they, you know, they can't run at a loss. They've got to uh, you know, provide care, and uh, if they're a private enterprise, there would be purpose in, in making some profit. Um, uh, but in, in what is effectively a market, not all of the information about uh, the product being offered is being disclosed to those who are using the product. People don't know um, uh, how many st uh, staff are employed by uh, a facility. They don't know what the, what the qualifications of those staff uh, members are, and they have a right to know that. It's part of the, the offering 
uh, it's part of the choice making process. Uh, there are some that want to impose staff um, patient staff ratios uh, or resident um, staff ratios. Um, uh, uh, and I understand there are there are difficulties associated with that. Uh, this is a step that I that I think this Parliament can uh, 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 accept, in that it doesn't impose a cost. It simply requires uh, agencies, or sorry, uh, facilities to de to uh, declare uh, how many staff they have, what the qualifications of those staff members are, and what sort of roles they fulfil within the facility such that that can be published and people can then make a choice about whether they want their father or mother uh, or relative to go to a particular facility uh, based on perhaps a comparison between three or four facilities in the area, uh, the total costs and indeed uh, uh, what, what sort of capabilities the, the aged care facility has. So, that's the nature of the first amendment that I will um, uh, uh, be asking the Senate to uh, support. There's a second amendment that I've, uh, that I've uh, circulated that relates to CCTV in aged care facilities. I know when you talk about CCTV in an aged care facility, people immediately get alarmed and think about privacy. So I just want to explain. Uh, the model that is, is proposed uh, in my amendment. And the model is proposed on the basis of things or, or, or awful events, uh, awful situations like we had at Oakton in South Australia in 2016. Uh, like we've had just in the last couple of weeks, there's been uh, some, some uh, problems in South Australia, um, in, uh, you know, in Wyala, in Adelaide, in relation to some aged care facilities. Um, Putting CCTV cameras into the rooms of, uh, of uh, uh, aged care recipients, uh, of residents, in an opt-in manner, so not, uh, not forced upon residents, uh, would allow for remote monitoring. That remote monitoring would not be a relative's monitoring, but actually professionals, professional aged care people monitoring uh, off-site uh, and monitoring for a few things. Firstly, uh, being able to uh, look and see that someone uh, who's in the aged care facility has fallen out of bed or they've tripped over, they're, they're on the floor, and being able to immediately alert the facility, who might not have a person in every room, who won't have a person in every, in, in every room, but the, the ability to alert the facility that there is a, uh, a, a, a medical problem a, um, an issue in one of the rooms in their facilities such that they can respond more quickly so that we don't have people left on the floor of, a, of, a, of an aged care facility uh, and uh, people miss the, the fact that there's a problem. The second thing that CCTV can allow is, uh, uh, is for uh, the recording of activities. There are lots of people that get quite suspicious or get you know, and, and they do it on the basis they care about the, their mum or their dad uh, about uh, what, what's happening or indeed uh, are not satisfied with the, with the care that has been provided and uh, this uh, a, a CCTV uh, footage that could be uh, uh, perhaps subpoenaed or uh, uh, referred to police um, or referred to the age Care Commissioner uh, could be used to uh, uh, deal with any incidents or any alleged incidents associated with uh, with abuse uh, or, or miscare. And uh, I put it to the chamber that actually, perhaps more importantly, uh, if staff are aware that there are cameras around, those that perform the services well will will be quite comfortable with that. But if anyone does want to do something that's untoward, uh, they, they will be deterred. By uh, the fact that there is, uh, the, you know, that there are cameras uh, installed. Again, these cameras would be installed and only uh, monitored uh, uh, in circumstances where uh, the resident 
approves that, uh, 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 that monitoring, or indeed someone with power of attorney uh, approves the monitoring. So uh, I'd ask the Chamber to give that some uh, careful consideration. I will point out that uh, this uh, bill, uh, this amendment, has been drawn from a bill that is, in, that is before the South Australian Parliament. The South Australian uh, government is actually conducting a trial in relation to this. I think they've botched the trial, and it uh, should have been concluded by now. But nonetheless, they are conducting a trial, and it's funded by the federal government. The federal government threw in $500,000. So there is some acceptance that this is uh, that, that this is a useful tool that could uh, uh, assist in terms of raising the standards of aged care and dealing with, uh, dealing with incidents that might be occurring uh, in uh, aged care facilities. So uh, <clears throat> uh, I will note that uh, or, or advise the chamber if they haven't seen it. Some concerns were raised after I circulated the amendment that uh, there was uh, a provision for the installation of a camera into common areas. Uh, uh, I've been asked to remove that because uh, obviously there may be people in, the, in, a, in an area that don't approve of being recorded. Um, I think uh, perhaps, uh, uh, well in fact I've, I've now circulated uh, a, a, a revised amendment that removes uh, the common area uh, cameras because I accept that uh, some people may uh, view that as a bridge too far, particularly at, at this point in time. The, uh, th yeah, the hope is we can get that, 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 that we get support for this. Uh, I think it would be a measure that uh, a a again adds to the quality of uh, care simply by having uh, the, the uh, real-time professionals monitoring and recording uh, what, what happens in terms of care. Uh, I think it uh, um, is helpful in that it will deal with uh, real-time incidents where there's not 100 per cent monitoring uh, by, by carers of uh, patients in rooms. Or, you know, it might be simply that there's an incident occurring somewhere else in the facility. Uh, it might be a well-staffed facility, but people are attending another area. Uh, attending another incident in the aged care facility, and uh, uh, it's, it might be—it's it's nice to have a second pair of eyes, uh, keeping uh, keeping a watch over people. Uh, not only will it uh, raise, as I say, that it will raise the standards. Um, I think it'll also give uh, uh, relatives comfort as well. Um, again, the relatives don't get access to the to, to the footage. That uh, that would be set. The, who gets access to the footage would be set by the rules. Uh, there is a rulemaking power in the amendment. Uh, the uh, the minister would make rules as to who would have access under and uh, under what circumstances. But I would envisage that to be quite a tight set of rules. Uh, and again, uh, you know, access to, to to footage would be limited to um, uh, you know, commissioners, uh, to police, uh, to uh, courts by way of subpoena uh, and so forth. So uh, I'd ask that the Chamber give consideration to the two amendments that, uh, that I'll move during the committee stage. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Minister. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. This bill introduces a serious incident response scheme that will respond to and take steps to prevent the incidence of abuse and neglect of older Australians in residential aged care. This includes those receiving flexible care delivered in a residential aged care setting. The scheme will provide greater protections for older Australians by taking into account broader instances of abuse and neglect and by introducing more robust requirements for residential aged care providers to respond and report. From 1 April 2021, this bill introduces legislative requirements that will build provider capacity to identify risk and respond to incidents if and when they occur. By, uh, by imposing these requirements, the scheme is expected to drive learning and improvements that will reduce the number of preventable incidents in the future. The bill will also provide new powers to the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission to enforce the requirements of the scheme and the aged care responsibilities of approved providers and related offences more generally. 
These are standard reg regulatory powers which will provide the Commission with a more graduated suite of powers for enduring, uh, ensuring compliance and protecting consumers. Additional information gathering powers are also provided to ensure the Commission is equipped to obtain the information it requires to administer the scheme and the Commission's regulatory framework more broadly. The scheme complements and supports existing regulatory settings, uh, including the integrated expectations of the aged care quality standards, the Charter of Aged Care Rights and open disclosure requirements. Together, these will support residential aged care providers to engage in risk management and continuous improvement to deliver safe and quality care to older Australians. Can I thank colleagues who have contributed to this bill? Uh, uh, the health, safety and wellbeing of older Australians is of utmost importance to all of us uh, and the Australian Government. Any abuse of a person in residential care facility is unacceptable and it is important that these incidents are reported, managed and pre prevented from occurring in the future. I wish to table an additional uh, an addendum to the explanatory, explanatory memorandum which responds to concerns raised by the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills. This addendum clarifies how subordinate legislation will operate to support the arrangements in this bill and I thank the committee for their comments. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the bill Thank you. Uh, the question is that this bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to aged care and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask the minister some questions. I do intend, obviously, moving my um, amendments, but I, I do wish to ask some questions first. I'll try and be in the, in, as quickly uh, as quick as I can. But there are some issues that I do want to just quickly uh, seek confirmation about. And can I also ask: Has the addendum been circulated? I don't seem to be able to find it. Minister, can you clarify the situation at, at the request of? Uh, it was tabled in the House as part of the debate down there, but I'll table it now. And can a copy be provided to Senator Seward? That would be very helpful. Thank if you. Possible. Thank you. Um, just checking; it's the one that I think it is. Thank you. Um, can I ask, in terms of uh, falls? Why have falls been left off the definition of a serious incident? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, Senator, uh, falls will be reportable under the uh, Serious Incident Response Scheme where they are caused by unreasonable use of force towards a person, result from neglect by the aged care provider, or result in unexpected death. Uh, where the fall is not reportable in aged care, uh, eight, where, where it's not reportable, aged care providers will still be uh, required to identify, record, and manage and resolve the incident, uh, provide support to ensure the health and safety of well-being uh, well of the person, and uh, assess the incident and take necessary remedial action to pre prevent future incidents. Um, and when you the next point I'll make goes to the management of the entire aged care system as a whole. Um, and as of the 1st of July this year, um, under the National Mandatory Quality Indicator Program, residential aged care services will be required to report all care recipient falls. So when you bring these two things together. Um, Minister, if you could resume your seat just for a moment. I'll call Senator Seward. Uh, sorry, um, Chair. Um, I'm having a little. The mic's not picking up everything. I'm sorry. So I, I, I missed what you said just then. I, I, I apologise. So, the Minister might speak a little more loudly for the benefit I, I'm of. I'm happy to repeat. Senator uh, Thank you, Chair. From the 1st of July this year, under the National Mandatory Quality Indicator Program. 
providers will be required to report all care recipient faults. So we have two pieces of two things working in concert. So you have the quality indicator program, and you also have the serious incident response scheme. So they'll be required to report all falls, including those which result in major injury, to the health through my aged care. So we have um, two systems working together, uh, and the care, uh, the falls that all falls would be reported under the national uh, the quality indicator program, uh, and that will then flow through to uh, the rating system that providers. Uh, get under the reporting of the quality indicators, which are also publicly reported. Senator Seaworth. Uh, th I thank the Minister for his uh, answer. My concern is, though, is A, it's then up to the provider to determine what neglect is, if all has uh, resulted as a matter of neglect. Um, and some of the other issues that you raised are then subject to a provider making that call. Why, and I appreciate the uh, understand your point you've just made about the quality indicators, but this is an extremely important issue. I still don't understand why all falls are not treated as a serious incident um, because of the nature of the, the, what a fall, whether it's caused by someone being a little bit adventurous or neglect, is a fall that can lead to uh, premature death and other serious implications. Minister. Well, Senator, I, I think I understand the question, but the point I'm, we're making is that all falls will be reported as a part of the quality indicator program. Uh, the, the question then becomes uh, how you actually define a serious incident. Uh, our view on that is, uh, as I've explained to you in response to your question a moment ago, uh, in those circumstances, those three circumstances that uh, I've, um, I've explained, it does require uh, providers to make those assessments because all falls are reported or will be reportable under the quality indicator program. So there will have to be a process whereby uh, providers make those assessments to consider those things, uh, and, and of course those things are also assessed as a part of the providers' ongoing accreditation process because all of the documentation that's gathered as a part of uh, pro uh, providing care uh, is assessed as a part of the providers' ongoing accreditation process. Senator Seward. But it's not as clearly transparent and accountable as, well, if you accept my other amendments that have made about accountability and recording data, um, it's not as immediate tr transparent as the process of reporting um, serious incidents, is it? Minister? You're right, Senator, it is different, uh, but there also needs to be some balance between, um, and, that's, and that's why we've made the decisions that we have, is, is the amount of uh, work that goes into the administration of each of the various schemes. Uh, all of the falls will be reported. The, um, the provider will be required to do an assessment as a part of that, as I've indicated to you. Um, but that's the assessment that's been done through the scoping study uh, and th particularly through the learnings that we've had by assessing other schemes, including the one that operates through the NDIS. Senator Seward. Oh, thank you. Can I ask, if someone is receiving respite care at a residential aged care facility and they experience a serious incident, will providers be required to record and investigate that incident under the scheme? Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator, my understanding is that given that they are in the care of the provider, they would fall under the um, under the requirements of the provider's approved pr provider status and therefore within the parameters of uh, the Aged Care Act, which uh, then brings in these particular requirements. Senator Seward. Um, can you, could you take on notice? You said that's your understanding. Um, could you take on notice? Oh, oh, what? Okay, Th hold that'd on be for a second. What was if the question, could, Senator? If the minister could just take on notice to confirm, because it was a little bit equivocal, um, to confirm that 
respite is covered under this scheme. Respite. Okay. Minister. Thank you, Chair. Apologies for jumping the gun. Uh, respite is included, Senator. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, given, and I'll get to my amendments in a minute, but, but given that um, the recording of data isn't as thorough as, um, as it could be, uh, the recording and, and public publication of the data, and I'll get to our, what our proposals are in a minute, but under the current proposed, uh, under this current proposal, um, how will it result in, in, in continuous improvement and prevent similar incidents from occurring in residential care facilities, and how will the community, residents and family members know that? Minister. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so there's two elements to that, uh, and it comes to the two elements that we've discussed before. And I think the other uh, point that I should make is um, in reference to where we sit in the overall uh, scheme of things with respect to the Royal Commission, and and where we go out of the back of out of the back of that. Uh, but clearly, the requirements for reporting. The requirements that I've indicated before for um, of both of falls in, in both categories <coughs> under the mandatory um, in quality indicator program, but also under the serious response scheme, are going to require providers to assess a the fall, the reasons for the fall, uh, and and quite frankly, a good quality system has a continuous improvement element as a part of it. And so that's one of the objectives of the Serious Incident Response Scheme, the assessment of the fall, the reasons for it, and then the corrective actions that are put in place to deal with it. That would be my expectation of what would occur. Uh, and with respect to the data, um, I think uh, I would agree with you with respect to the, the amount of data available that exists in the aged care sector right now. That's something that we clearly need to improve. That uh, will be part of the um, work that we do post the receipt of the Royal Commission report in just three weeks' time now, uh, because uh, it, it is clearly something that we need to do to improve uh, the visibility of these in, this information, uh, not only for consumers uh, and for the community, uh, but for the department and for the quality regulator. So um, this is clearly a direction that we will uh, continue to move in. It is certainly part of our policy discussions at this point in time. Uh, and so the operation of a good quality system uh, will do exactly what you've asked it to do uh, because continuous improvement is one of the elements of a good quality, uh, good, uh, quality system. Senator Seward. Thank you. I may ask you a few more questions on, on um, reporting when we get to the amendments. Um, Minister, can I ask, in terms of planning, evalu uh, in terms of evaluation of the operation of this scheme, have you given any consideration to evaluation? And if so, um, what are you uh, plan? What are you? Um, planning in terms of evaluation of the operation of this scheme? Minister. Thanks, thanks Chair. Um, I'll have to come back to you on any particular cycle of evaluation of the scheme, but from my perspective, a regular cycle of doing that um, actually informs continuous improvement. So I'm, I, I, I understand where you're coming from and I agree with the concept that you're discussing. We are currently doing some additional scoping work on the Serious Incident Response Scheme. A number of colleagues have um, acknowledged the fact that it doesn't include home care. Uh, we're doing the scoping work for home care right now, so that answers the issue that's been raised in relation to, uh, to home care, but we believe that it was important enough to get the scheme up and running uh, and operating, particularly in uh, residential care. Uh, it uh, the bringing forward of the commencement of the scheme was part of our response to the Royal Commission's COVID report, uh, so we're clearly mm -hmm. responding in that sense. Uh, but uh, it is something that we will need to continue to monitor, uh, and uh, my view with it would be that that should uh, form part of our uh, reform process that we'll embark on off the back of the Royal Commission. 
I thank the minister for his answer, and in fact, he's touched on my next question in, with the home care. Um, could I um, perhaps? Uh, I am aware of the time. Could I perhaps ask a question on notice, and and could the minister provide a, a update, a, a written update to the chamber in terms of where the feasibility and prevalence study to inform the introduction of the scheme for home and community care is at. Minister. Happy to take that on notice and provide that information and perhaps a briefing if you require it. Senator Seward. I thank the minister and, uh, and appreciate the offer. Thank you. Um, I seek to I'll now move my amendments. I'm moving amendments one two five on sheet one one eight seven. I'm seeking leave to move those together. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. These uh, amendments relate to the comments that I made in my second reading speech, and that is um, to include the use of all uh, restraints uh, as reportable incidences, not those um, just outside the care principles. Um, also to deal with uh, falls as reportable incidences under this scheme rather than um, as the, the current uh, government intention is. The also referral of um, families and um, residents to uh, advocacy services under the legislation as I articulated in my second reading contribution, uh, providers are required to provide support to uh, those affected. What we, th we are putting in here a requirement to ensure that they're referred to ad advocacy services because a lot of people want independent support if a serious incident occurs. So we want to, we're not mandating the services, we're saying they should be referred to uh, some uh, advocacy services. There are some good, very good services out there. And also the publication of data, of reportable incident data. Um, as, which is why I was asking that previous question, because at the moment they're not being provided in the manner in which, in fact, counselling assist, assisting recommended, which was, as I articulated in my second reading contribution, which was about making sure that it, there was global provider and facility level in a timely manner reporting of these instances so that the public truly has a, there's truly transparency and accountability and the community and families have a very good understanding about what's going on we don't see why this data could not be provided in this manner i heard what the minister said in answer his to, to my question and that was about there's there's he agreed uh, and and i thank the minister for uh, acknowledging the need for uh, greater transparency and accountability. But we know this is needed in the serious incident report, so I don't see why that could not be done now. We don't need the Royal Commission again to tell us that this needs to happen. We know it needs to happen. We know it needs to be at that level. And so I don't see why that data cannot be provided for, or the requirements for the provision of and reporting of that data cannot be included in this particular piece of legislation. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the, the government won't be supporting the amendments moved by the Greens, largely for the reasons that we've um, already stated through the discussion um, during the earlier parts of the committee stage. Uh, We don't believe that all uses of restraint should be a reportable instrument, um, a, a reportable incident. Uh, that um, there is considerable work with being done with respect to restraint anyway, and I think the, um, uh, the Greens would uh, certainly acknowledge that. Uh, there's some, some more information that I'll be able to provide to the Senate very shortly with respect to some work that uh, I had done last year, so that will be available to. Uh, the parliament shortly. Um, I think I've adequately put our position with respect to falls, uh, and um, as I indicated, we are we are about to embark on a very very significant uh, reform process with respect to a number of elements of the um, aged care sector. Off the back of the Royal Commission, I would differentiate at this point, not knowing what the Royal Commission is actually going to report. Um, as opposed to what council assisting has had, has had, I'm 
I would acknowledge that gives us a good direction as to where the Commission might go, uh, but uh, with respect to those elements, the, the final report is three weeks, ago, three weeks away, uh, and then we will uh, be very intently commencing on a significant reform process for the entire sector, and uh, part of that will be um, the, the reporting of a range of information and data uh, that uh, could be improved in providing better public confidence for the aged care sector. The question is that the amendments moved by Senator Seward, 1 to 5 on sheet 1187, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say uh, aye. President, I should have raised earlier. Senator Dodson. Um, Labor will not be supporting the Green amendments and uh, further things to say when the other amendments are moved. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dodson. So I'll put the question that the amendments on sheet 1187 moved by Senator Seward be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. Is a division required? No. Okay. Called it for the nose. So, that, so let me put it again to be clear. Um, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The noes have it. Thank you. The noes have it. Uh, yes, Senator Seward. We have recorded that we supported, and if others want to, they can indicate they supported it. In the interest of time, I'm not going to call a division. Thank you, Senator Seward. Um, that will be recorded. Thank you, Senator Patrick. That uh, I was intending or would have supported the amendments, if that could be recorded. Right. Can the clerk note that? Thanks. Okay, Senator Patrick. Um, uh, Madam Deputy President, I um, uh, move, uh, seek leave to move uh, sheet one and uh, amendment one and two on sheet uh, 1186. Uh, is leave granted? Le it's leave granted to do those together. Yes, thank you. Okay, Senator Patrick, yep. leave granted. Okay, so uh, this this amendment uh, deals, uh, as I talked about in my second reading, I won't uh, talk too long. Just to remind the chamber, this uh, amendment is simply about making st uh, staffing ratios uh, and the qualifications of staff available to people who may wish to uh, uh, put themselves into an aged care facility or uh, may assist in making choices uh, by, of, of relatives in terms of putting people into, into facilities. It uh, is a no-cost option, uh, but it is informative uh, to the users of the system, and uh, I'm hopeful that uh, the Senate will support it. So the question, Minister? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the government won't be supporting the amendment. Um, I think it's fair to say that this is a subject where the Royal Commission will have some very specific recommendations to make. Um, uh, we've seen some preliminary um, advice through council assisting, but also some very good evidence from a number of sources. Um, I don't agree, Senator, that it's a no-cost option. Um, it will incur cost. It will incur cost to providers, and as the funder of the aged care system, that means it's a, it incurs a cost to government. Um, uh, and uh, this will be one of the issues that will receive significant consideration from the government once we receive the report in three weeks' time. So we won't support the amendment at this stage. Senator Patrick. Uh, Madam Deputy uh, Acting President, just for clarification, uh, is Senator uh, Patrick moving both these amendments at this time or just one amendment? Is he moving the amendment 1186 or 1186 and 1191? I believe he's just moving um, items 1 and 2 on sheet 1186 together. So we're just dealing with that particular matter. Thank you, Madam Deputy uh, President. Uh, well, Labor will be opposing this. Thank you, Senator Dodson. So the question is that the amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 1186 moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. All those in, uh, of that opinion say aye. aye. 
Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. No. Is a division required? Uh, ring, ring the bells. Time expired. Please stop the bells. I appoint uh, Senator Ciccone for the nose and uh, Senator Patrick for the eyes. I think I will be.
So there being 11 ayes and 38 noes, the matter is declared in the negative. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam, uh, uh, Madam Deputy, Acting Deputy President. Um, I, I um, um, seek leave to move uh, Amendment 1 and 2 on Sheet 1191. The question is that the amendments 1 and 2 sorry, is leave granted? Move to, leave to move them together. Leave is granted to move them together. So the question is that the amendments uh, moved amendments one and two on sheet one one nine one be agreed to. Those in of that opinion say aye. Uh, Senator, are you seeking the call? Yes, I am. Senator Patrick. So I just wanted to uh, just, just refresh the chamber that this uh, this amendment is in relation to the installation of opt-in CCTV in uh, uh, in aged care facilities. The CCTV would be monitored. Uh, by prof professional medical personnel remotely uh, and uh, would be used to detect falls in rooms as an extra set of eyes, but also to deter and deal with any misconduct that might take place inside a facility. Uh, Senators, the question is that the amendments moved by Senator Patrick on sheet 1191 be agreed to. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Uh, the noes have it. Uh, is there a seconder for the noes have it? Uh, it being two o'clock, um, the matter is. Was there a second? Ask if there's a second voice for the division. There was. Is, just to clarify, is there a second voice for the division that was called by Senator Patrick? No, there is no second voice, so we're clear that we'll return to this matter after or oh, yeah. later in the day. Thank you. The noes have it. The noes have it, and we now move to question time. Thank you, Thank Senator. You. That was a bit messy. Thanks. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. We move to questions without notice. First question. All the senators take their seat. And call Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Virgin Australia CEO Jane Hardlick has warned that jobs of 3,000 workers will be at risk when the Morrison government ends JobKeeper in March. Why is the Morrison government turning its back on 3,000 Australians? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, the Morrison government has proudly stood by all Australians through the last 12 months of globally unprecedented uncertainty. We have faced the most extraordinary of times in terms of the health threat to our nation and in terms of the economic threat to the livelihoods of many of Australians and to the businesses of many Australians. And what we have done through that time, and I acknowledge often with bipartisan support, what we have done through that time is to be able to, in working closely with states and territories and authorities around the country, be able to secure the lives and save the lives of many Australians and to be able to protect the livelihoods of many Australians and of many Australian businesses. And we have done that by acting at all times according to clearly defined principles that we laid out at the outset of the pandemic, to make sure that when economic support was delivered, it was targeted, it was proportionate and it was temporary. And we have responded as the circumstances have improved through the course of the pandemic to ensure that we deliver support according to those principles. And indeed, when it came to the creation of JobKeeper, we created it. When it came to the extension of it, we extended it. But also at the point of extension, we heeded messages, including from the leader of the opposition, including from the leader of the opposition, that there needed to be a tapering of it before it was withdrawn. And so we applied a tapering of it. And we will respond in the lead up to March according to all of the evidence and analysis that is available at that time. 
to look carefully and closely about what types of additional support, if any, are necessary across the Australian economy, in addition to those that will continue to Order. deliver Senator significant Birmingham economic time for the support. Answer has expired. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Ms Hardlick has also said that Virgin Australia may be forced, and I quote, to make tough decisions on how many people we can afford to keep on the books. When JobKeeper ends in 52 days, how many more aviation jobs will be lost as a result of Mr Morrison's stubborn refusal to act? Minister, uh, Senator Birmingham. Mr President, thousands of jobs have been saved by actions through this pandemic. Many thousands of jobs have been saved as a result of actions through Senator, the pandemic. Senator but Watt. we were all so honest at the outset. I remember saying this myself. I remember former Senator Cormann saying it. I know that those in the other place did as well. Not every job and not every business would be able to be saved. And indeed, the pandemic is creating structural changes around the world as well. Not all aspects of previous economic activity are going to come back the way they were beforehand. And so difficult decisions will be made by different businesses facing those structural challenges. But we will continue to respond with support in the Australian economy order, when and where Wong it's appropriate. Point order. Um, I appreciate the minister. It hasn't stopped. <laughs> point of order, direct relevance. Uh, the uh, question does go not to jobs across the economy, which the minister is referring to, but how many more aviation jobs will be lost as a result of the government's refusal to act? Senator Wong, I think you, with respect, dropped a word there, and I've made the ruling that there was a word stubborn was in the second part of the question, and I've made a previous ruling that where there are pejorative phrases used, there is a lot more latitude for ministers. There is, I'm, sorry, I'm making a ruling, Senator Wong. There's a lot more latitude for ministers to address questions broadly when there are pejorative political phrases included in the questions. So in this case, I think the minister is being directly relevant to the question. Senator. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I was saying we will continue to respond as appropriate to the different circumstances, including in different industries, including the aviation industry, where we have targeted support, and we will continue Order. to look Senator at their Birmingham. unique circumstances. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. How many Australians will lose JobKeeper in March and then face losing their jobs or having their wages cut under the Morrison's government's industrial relation changes? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, we've provided some $2.7 billion in support across the aviation sector to date. And as I said in response to the last question, we will continue to analyse the circumstances and we will continue to respond according to the principles we set out. That support should be targeted where it's necessary, should be proportionate to those circumstances, but does also need to be temporary because the Australian economy can't be run off of endless taxpayer money forever. But these are difficult times, and that's why we've put in place the range of supports that are there. In terms of the industrial relations reforms that we've brought to this parliament, we bring them to this parliament in good faith to make the industrial relations system in Australia more efficient, more effective in ways to continue to help get more Australians into jobs. And what is remarkable is the policy position that's been taken by those opposite is to say no to all of it to say no to all of it, even the bits the unions agreed to they're now saying no to. They're just anti Order, any Senator type of Birmingham, reform time that may help to get Australians back into jobs. Expired. Order. Order. Order on my right and my left. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Can the minister please update the Senate on yesterday's judgment from the full federal court regarding the Tasmanian Regional Forest Agreement, which ruled in favour of the Commonwealth, Sustainable Timber Tasmania and the State of Tasmania? The minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank uh, Senator Askew for her question uh, and for the interest that all Tasmanian senators in this place have in the fantastic Tasmanian forestry sector, and particularly acknowledge the Assistant Minister responsible for forestry, Senator Dunningham, for his fierce advocacy on behalf of this very important sector. Well, yesterday was a milestone for Tasmania, uh, and indeed a milestone for the Australian timber and forestry sector, when the full court ruled that the Tasmanian regional forestry agreements were indeed valid. Uh, the decision was in response to efforts by Bob Brown's foundation to once again try and use the courts in a litigious attempt to shut down Tasmania's world-class forestry industry. And I'd like to echo the words of Assistant Minister Dunian yesterday by saying that this judgment from the full court was a win for Australia's forestry industry. It's a victory for every single forestry worker who now knows that they have a job, not just those in Tasmania but those right across Australia. But it also reaffirms Australian government's commitment and belief in forestry agreements as the best way of imbalancing environmental, economic and social demands of our native forests. It's a milestone victory for forestry, its supporters, and it's an embarrassing loss for Bob Brown. Uh, and, and it is complete with his merchandise campaign that he put out there. Uh, they created a slogan, best chance in a generation to end native forest logging. Well, indeed, it was a great forest case yesterday. The case proved to be great for forestry. It proved to be great for the jobs that the forestry industry supports. It was great in securing the jobs in the communities that rely on the forestry industry. And it was a great case to draw to the attention of the Australian public the vexatious attitude that the Greens and their supporters have with the Green Lawfare to stop legitimate businesses, legitimate industries and legitimate communities Order. across Australia. Senator Rustin, Senator ask you a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. So can the minister please outline what this milestone ju judgment means for the forest industry, particularly when it comes to providing certainty, investment and jobs across Australia? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, this decision secures the future of Australia's native forestry industry into the future. That's 52,000 workers that are directly employed. Um, and to allow them to get back to what they can do best, and that is to manage this renewable resource for the benefit of regional communities that rely on this world-class sector. Our agreements may remain the best way of imbalancing the environmental, social and economic um, demands of our native forests. And this judgment provides certainty. It provides certainty for the workers. It provides certainty for the community. It provides certainty for investment, which means that we will continue to be able to have investment jobs into the future. And this judgment, the irony of the ideological fixation on shutting down our native timber sector, this will not stop us using appearance grade timber. All it will do is mean that people who want appearance grade timber will buy it from countries who do not have the kind of environmental protections Order, that this Senator country has. Rustin. Senator ask you a final supplementary question. Thank you. How will the Morrison government continue to build on its support for the many thousands of hard-working men and women in the forestry industry following this judgment? Senator Rustin. Well, our government has an absolutely unwavering commitment to our forestry industry and unequivocally our support for regional forestry agreements as the most effective mechanism by which we can manage and protect our forests. Every tree that is harvested is replanted. Uh, native forestry is sustainable, it's highly regulated, it's well managed, and the court made the decision yesterday that we were right in that fact. But this government supports and backs many, many families who are supported by our forestry sector and the communities that rely on it. We've delivered nine regional forestry hubs, three national institutes, we're implementing our $20 million national forestry plan, and we also understand our responsibility in supporting forestry through bushfires. This is the ultimate renewable resource. The ultimate renewable resource. It is something that every Australian should be proud of our Senator forestry Wish sector Wilson. instead of continually condemning and using vexatious Senator litigation Wish to try Senator, and shut it down. Senator Wish Wilson, take a breath when I call your name. I remind senators of what I said yesterday. When I name you individually, I ask you to at least remain orderly for a short period. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. 
Is the minister aware of a Tourism Export Council survey revealing that 80 per cent of domestic tour operators will close by September without some kind of government support? Given the devastating impact of COVID-19 on these businesses, will the minister provide additional support to internationally facing businesses and regions like Far North Queensland? The Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Green for her question uh, on an issue which I think we canvassed uh, some detail of uh, in uh, discussions in the chamber uh, on Tuesday earlier this week. Because, of course, the government has provided significant levels of support, economic support, during COVID-19 through a range of programs. JobKeeper, as the uh, leader of the government in the Senate has outlined uh, in his earlier response, small business cash payments of up to $100,000. What those payments have done, Mr President, is to sustain hundreds of thousands of tourism businesses and tourism jobs across Australia. And as part of our plan to support tourism recovery, we're also providing further targeted assistance to help the tourism sector rebound and to save as many jobs as possible. That is in addition, as I have said earlier this week, uh, to, that is in addition to our record funding for Tourism Australia of over $231 million in the current financial year, which is being used to directly support the tourism industry. Tourism Australia, which is ramping up domestic marketing campaigns with the phase two of the Holiday Here This Year campaign now underway, familiar to many of us from our television screens right now. Tourism Australia also positioning to commence those international marketing campaigns when the time is right. So we outlined in our budget a clear plan for Australia to create jobs and to rebuild our economy, and that includes helping to secure the future of Australia's tourism industry. We provided $50 million for a recovery for regional tourism fund, which includes regional areas of Queensland, such as those that Senator Green has referred to, to boost tourism in nine regions heavily reliant on international tourism. That's a program which will deliver tailored assistance measures to help tourism business pivot to the domestic market. Those applications are currently open, Mr President, with eligible applicants able to submit requests for funding until 30 September this year. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Payne, uh, time for the answer has expired. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Senator Betts. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have another question. Minister, out of the $659 million that you spooked on Tuesday, how much of that financial support has actually been received by affected businesses? Senator Payne. Mr. President, I'll take the detail of that question on notice in terms of, well, Mr. President, those opposite may scoff, but I think they even, could, even they could manage to understand, particularly Order. the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, that I am a, in a representational portfolio and I will provide accurate detail to Senator Green if she wishes for that information. Of course, if she wishes to ask in advance for information in question time, as we do with other senators, then we would be perfectly willing to assist where we can. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Why is Mr Morrison cutting JobKeeper and cutting wages, but prioritising taxpayer-funded government advertising, sports rorts and flying an ex-minister around Europe with a private doctor to get a plum posting politics pay check? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And Senator Green may wish to advise the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate that she's personally withdrawing the opposition support for former Senator Cormann's uh, candidacy for the OECD. I am not aware if that is a decision those opposite have taken, Order. Mr. President. But if they have, Order. they should tell the government. They should tell the government because that would be the good faith thing to do. I won't hold my breath for good faith from those opposite, Mr. President, and I won't hold my breath for good faith that stops them misrepresenting this government and the support we have provided to Australian people, Australian Order. businesses and for Australian jobs right through this pandemic. Order. Uh, I I am, order. I am reluctant to interrupt ministers. Uh, I will when I can't hear them, but I will start to interrupt and will waste time in question time for the opposition and crossbenchers if there's that much noise in the chamber. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health in the Senate, Senator Colbeck. 
Uh, through you, uh, President, the mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna have yielded strong results in clinical trials and are expected to be much easier to reconfigure to fight the new strains um, of the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, COVID uh, virus. It's reported that the government is considering investing in mRNA local production. Is this correct? If so, when is, uh, when is the government going to be making an announcement? How much is the government considering investing in building local capacity for the generation of mRNA vaccines? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, uh, as the Chamber might be aware, the government has today announced the acquisition of an additional 10,000 doses, 10 million doses of the um, of the, uh, M, uh, the of the Pfizer uh, vaccine. I, I'm, care, I'm careful not to overpromise, Senator. I'm very careful not to overpromise. Um, uh, and uh, the, the the time frame for us to uh, the time frame required for us to ramp up a production capacity of that um, uh, capacity, uh, Mr. President, is is quite a considerable one. So considerations of those things. Uh, being undertaken, Mr. President. But in the interim, uh, what the government has done is to ensure that we have adequate doses of available vaccines with a range of different um, of a range of different types, so that we can ensure that we have adequate capacity to vaccinate the Australian community. Uh, and of course, where possible, and I'm aware that uh, Senator Payne and Senator Sazelja have been engaged in this, to assist our Pacific neighbours. So at this stage, Mr. President, uh, we have uh, 40 million doses, based on the announcement this morning of the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine. We have 53.8 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, 51 million doses of the Novavax, and we have access to uh, 25.6 million doses from the COVAX facility, Mr. President. So we have uh, access to considerable volumes of vaccine considerable uh, over 100 million doses of vaccine. Uh, and so, Mr President, uh, we will continue to ensure that we have the capacity required. Uh, I acknowledge uh, that there is capacity to, uh, with the mRNA uh, uh, vaccines to, to tweak the vaccines. I'm, I'm aware that uh, the producers of those have indicated that they're inclined to do that, but uh, uh, it, is, it will take Order. a considerable Senator period Colbeck, of time, time to build that the capacity. answer has expired. Senator Seawitt, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I, uh, through you, President, ask the Minister representing the Minister, can you confirm if the government is currently in negotiations with any manufacturers or any experts, as reported, for the development of a facility to manufacture, manufacture MRMA vaccines in Australia? And if so, is it with a view for it to be a publicly owned facility? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Thank you Mr President. Thanks, Senator, for the question. Um, Mr President, what the government has done is to undertake an audit of the capacity of uh, industry here in Australia to see if there is any capacity that may be able to be developed to, de to produce uh, vaccines using that technology. Uh, we have identified some, countries in uh, some companies in Australia who do have that capacity. We're currently in discussions with them to understand whether or not that capacity can be scaled up in the future uh, so that we do have uh, onshore some sovereign capacity. Uh, those conversations are continuing. Senator C, with a final supplementary question. Thank you. Could the minister please outline who will be getting the Pfizer vaccines outlined in the strategy? I know there's five phases. Who, out of those five phases, will be getting the Pfizer vaccine? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Seward, for the question. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, based on current supply projections, will be the first vaccine available to Australia uh, and to Australians. So, therefore, the priority uh, residents under our national strategic plan for the rollout of the vaccine will be the first ones to receive that vaccine. 
Mr. Mr. President. So we will be offering uh, the vaccine across the country to all Australians through uh, the hubs that will be managing the Pfizer, Pfizer vaccine, which is obviously the low temp well, those with low temperature capacity, and we will be rolling out the AstraZeneca vaccine and Moderna as it becomes available across the country, Mr. President. Uh, we, we, are, we, are not, we, are, we are not specifying particular vaccine types to any particular cohort in the community. We are offering vaccine across the community, Order. Mr. President. Senator we Colbeck, are offering time for the vaccine answer across has the community. Expired. Senator Polly. Order, Senator Polly. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. The Morrison government will end JobKeeper in 52 days, and 60 per cent of tourism businesses will go bust unless the Morrison government provides a lifeline. How many tourism jobs across Australia will be lost when the Morrison government turns off JobKeeper in March? The Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Polly for her question. As I have previously advised the Chamber, what the government has done through a very, very difficult period of the COVID-19 pandemic is to provide record levels of economic support through a range of programs, JobKeeper uh, in particular, small business cash payments of up to $100,000. The outcomes of those payments have been to enable and sustain hundreds of thousands of tourism businesses across Australia and the jobs associated with them. And as part of our plan to support tourism recovery, as I've also previously order. advised Senator the Chamber. Polly, point of order. Relevance. Um, the minister is not directly answering the question. She can try and scoot around it or put her own spin on it, but order. the question was very pointed. I will. Right, sorry, can I just? Uh, um, there may be scooting, but I'll make that observation. Um, Senator, I, I, I do allow opposition senators to occasionally restate questions, but I am going to draw the line at commentary before the restating of it comes. So, Senator Polly, I ask you to come to your point of order, which I got to direct relevance and scooting. Well, it's about relevancy, Mr. President. The Morrison government is ending JobKeeper okay. in 52 days, and 60% of tourism tourism businesses are going to go bust. So how many jobs, Minister, are going to be lost, are you going to abandon with your action Senator by Polly, cutting JobKeeper? an opportunity to add to the question. I'm listening to the Minister carefully. In my view, if the Minister is talking about support programs to the same sector, very narrowly as she is, then I can't ask her in what terms to address the question. But I think she is talking about both employment and support programs to that sector. I will continue to listen carefully, and I have allowed you to re-emphasise your question, Senator Polly. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Before uh, Senator Polly took her, uh, her point of order, I was going to remind the Chamber that the government's approach in this vital sector, which we absolutely acknowledge, and in fact in my state of New South Wales, which has dealt um, co consequentially with uh, not just bushfires but with floods and then with pandemic issues, which have clearly impacted the tourism industry. I cite the beautiful area of the Blue Mountains in particular. We are very focused on specific programs to support jobs and businesses in those areas and to support the maintenance and retention of those jobs in those areas. So, the Recovery for Regional Tourism Fund, Mr. President, which is about boosting tourism in nine regions which are heavily reliant on international tourism and, of course, welcome domestic tourism as well. I have been through the details of the applications even for those programs in my previous answers. I was going to say earlier to, uh, to Senator Green, but sadly ran out of time, that uh, under our Building Better Regions Fund, we have earmarked $100 million of specific funding for tourism infrastructure to assist those regions to boost the supply of new quality tourism infrastructure to drive visitation and to maintain jobs in the tourism industry in those regions. We are also, Mr. Order. President, Senator, providing $100 Senator million. Payne, dollars I have Senator Polly on a point of order. I'm taking point of order, Mr. President, on relevance. The minister is still not addressing the question about how many jobs are going to be lost when you cut off JobKeeper. Very simple. Order. If the minister is talking, 
Oh, yes, Senator Payne. Actually, what I am referring to in my response to Senator Polly's question is maintaining jobs in the sector in direct relevance and response to her I, I was, question. I was about to say something similar. If the minister is talking about employment in the sector and your question was about jobs in the sector, I, I can't direct the minister the terms in which to answer the question. You can debate it after question time. The minister is being directly relevant. And I think she had five seconds to answer. Or is we going to go to the supplementary question, Senator Polly? Supplementary. Mr President, under the Regional Tourism Recovery Package, Tasmania is supposed to receive $13.5 million. Four months after this announcement, how much money is actually being delivered to tourism operators in Tasmania? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I will take on notice the detail of the specific funding delivery to Tasmania, of course. But, in fact, Senator Polly has pointed to exactly one of the examples that I have used consistently this week in my answers to previous questions on this matter. Not just that program, Mr President, but the Building Better Regions Fund and $100 million for the Regional Recovery Partnerships Program, which is about coordinating that investment with other levels of government, local and state, to support both growth and recovery and to protect jobs, including in tourism, in 10 priority regions. Mr President, we have also, uh, through the COVID-19 Relief and Recovery Fund, included tourism-specific measures, for example, supporting Australia's exhibiting zoos and aquarium programs. $94.5 million for that program, a business events program supported with $50 million of Commonwealth funding and, of course, many programs for the arts sector, which I would understand to be important in culturally rich Tasmania, Order. Mr Senator President. Payne. Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. Why is, Morrison, why is Mr Morrison cutting JobKeeper and cutting wages but prioritising taxpayer-funded government advertising, sports rorts and flying his ex-minister around Europe with a private doctor to get a plum post-politics paycheck? Order. I'll call Senator Payne when there's silence. Senator Payne. Creativity and ingenuity in the opposition have decreased to such an extent that they are unable to provide a third, second supplementary to senators other than one that repeats the previous one. Notwithstanding order. that enormous Senator, challenge that those opposite I've got are Senator facing, Polly let on me a point say, of order, Mr. Senator President, Payne. Senator, Senator Polly. Yet again, the minister is not being what is your relevant. Point of order? Okay, Senator Polly. That she's you. not being relevant to the question that I put to her. Senator Polly. I've made the point before. The question contained a number of loaded political phrases. Um, the minister. Um, uh, you've, the minister was, I would imagine, making a glancing observation with, and is entitled in some very wide latitude to address the terms and the assertions and the imputations in the question. Um, so, Senator Payne, I'll call you to continue with the question. Much, Mr. President, I, because of course I was specifically addressing the wording of Senator Polly's question and specifically pointing out to Senator Polly that what we have identified this week in the chamber are a number of programs with a very specific tourism focus, who are separate, which are separate from JobKeeper, which are separate from the political questions order. they are asking in Senator that context, Payne, which are I, about sorry, protecting Payne, and maintaining Senator jobs Wong in on tourism. Point of order. Senator Wong, on a point of order. The question goes to priorities. The point of order is relevance. Oh, the question goes to priorities, and while you're cutting JobKeeper and cutting wages, but spending money on advertising oh, sorry, and a private Senator party. Senator Wong, I understand. I heard Senator Payne say she concluded her answer, um, and Senator Payne Sorry's has concluded her answer. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. I thank the Minister for, for making available the minutes of the last three PFAS task force meetings. Each of these minutes ends with a list of action items, which shows that in 2020 the task force achievements consisted of developing talking points and calling further meetings. Minister, can you point to one tangible achievement of the PFAS task force in 2020 towards remediation, compensation or like-for-like -like relocation of affected residents living outside of defence bases? Uh, I'm going to the minister, you directed it to Senator Birmingham, but Senator Hume is the minister representing the Minister for the Environment, so I'm going to put the question to Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Roberts for his question. 
Our first priority with managing PFAS contamination has consistently been to ensure the well-being of affected communities. The Australian government acknowledges that communities in areas where PFAS contamination has been detected are very concerned about how this may affect them. We have a commitment to break the exposure pathways through treatment of water and soil, ensuring that residents have access to safe drinking water and preventing further contamination. The Defence PFAS program spend to date is approximately $433 million, which includes investigation, remediation and management activities. Defence has also provided $45 million to the other agencies in grants and transfers to enable research into health and remediation aspects. We continue to place a strong focus on the issue, with a further $83 million allocated for the financial year of 2020 and 2021. PFAS has been used in hundreds of industrial applications and consumer products, such as carpeting, apparels, upholstery, food and paper wrappings, and firefighting foams and metal plating. Firefighting foams uh, containing PFAS were a best-in-class product and used widely by the Department of Defence and other fire firefighting agencies across the globe. The Department of Defence uses firefighting foam products to protect human life and assets from emergency flammable liquid fires. Defence has leaned forward in managing the issue and has commenced detailed environmental investigations at 28 locations and has finalised 25. Defence is also committed to supporting local communities affected by PFAS contamination and has initiated the following actions broken PFAS, PFAS exposure pathways and reduced the mitigation of PFAS from defence sites by providing alternative drinking water supplies to 478 properties, as well as installing or providing funding for 10 water treatment plants treating over 5.4 billion litres of water. Order. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you. Instead of one achievement, I got a list of commitments, pathways, activities, spending, excuses and to-do lists. So let's move on to the second question. Minister, this week, this week a new class action Order. lawsuit was lodged by the Rec Bay Senator Aboriginal Carr. community over PFAS contamination to their traditional lands in Jarvis Bay. Does the minister accept that the time to take action is now before government inaction forces more everyday Australians caught in this nightmare are forced into courts? Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Senator Ross. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Roberts for the question. Uh, the Jarvis Bay issue is not one that I am uh, in, familiar with. However, what I can tell you is that on the 5th of June, the 2020, the Federal Court of Australia approved the settlement approval applications for the three class actions relating to the Per and Poly, oh goodness me, Fluora, Carl, Fluora, Fluora. Uh, I'm just going to say it was a very long word substance. The PFAS contamination in communities near the RAAF base Williamstown in Williamstown, New South Wales, the Army Aviation Centre in Oakley, Queensland, and the RAAF base in Tyndall, New South Wales. Oh, sorry, the Northern Territory. On the 16th of June uh, this last year, the court published its reasons. Defence legally currently Defence Legal currently has 126 open non-litigated claims and three litigated claims that are not class actions. On the 15th of April uh, last year, a PFAS class, class action was filed in the federal court by Shine Lawyers in relation to property owners in delineated areas around defence bases in Pearce, uh, in Richmond. Order, Senator Hume. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. When will the government begin offering compensation, remediation and like-for-like -like relocation of affected residents? Senator Hume. Thank you, Senator Roddick. What I can say is because the issue is currently being litigated, it's inappropriate to comment right now. As I said, on the 2nd of February 2021, this new PFAS class action was filed in the federal court by Shine Lawyers in relation to persons and entities with an interest in land situated in that delineated area around Jarvis Bay and Rec Bay, New South Wales. The first case management hearing has not yet been scheduled. As this is a matter for a court, we can really comment no further. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne, who I note, who I note is in particularly good form today. Could the Minister inform the Senate on the outcomes of the Pacific Islands Forum leaders' retreat? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I uh, particularly thank Senator Scar for this question because uh, it was a great pleasure yesterday to join with Prime Minister Morrison uh, the Pacific leaders for the special Pacific Island Forum leaders' retreat. And I 
particularly want to thank Tuvalu's Prime Minister, Natano, for his strong leadership as Forum Chair during a very, very difficult period with COVID-19. It was actually the first meeting of Pacific Island Forum leaders since the pandemic began and the first ever to be held virtually. Leaders considered two issues of vital importance to our Pacific family, our COVID-19 pandemic response and the appointment of a new Forum Secretary General. Firstly, let me acknowledge and warmly welcome my friend Henry Puna, the former Prime Minister of the Cook Islands, as the new PIF Secretary General. Australia looks forward to continuing our very warm and productive relationship with Mr Puna in his new role. And I also thank and acknowledge the great service of outgoing Secretary General Dame Meg Taylor of Papua New Guinea, who has led the forum with drive and with purpose over the last six years. Let me also acknowledge the other candidates, also friends of Australia, who put themselves forward and thank them for their willingness to contribute in this role. Together, Pacific leaders, Mr President, have acted decisively to escape the worst health effects of COVID-19. The economic and the fiscal effects of the pandemic on the Pacific, however, have been significant. This week, leaders committed to working together towards sustainable economic recovery in our region, including restoring vital air and sea connectivity. Underpinning that, they emphasised the need for global cooperation on the critical issue of equitable and affordable access to vaccines. Leaders made clear their objective for full vaccine coverage for all Pacific countries and committed to working together to ensure timely and equitable distribution of vaccines across our region. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Could the minister advise the Senate on how Australia will work in partnership with the Pacific Islands Forum and members to progress those outcomes? Senator Payne. Mr President, Pacific Islands Forum members will continue to work closely together to safely support the vital Pacific humanitarian pathway on COVID-19, which is ensuring the movement of essential supplies and personnel, and then to enable people to move safely as economic recovery grows. That's tourists, it's more Pacific workers, it's students, it's family members. It's essential for our shared economic recovery. We're working in a partnership with our Pacific friends to support continued operation of the aviation sector in the vast blue Pacific continent. It's an essential underpinning for economic recovery and to support safe travel. And importantly, I'm pleased to inform the Senate that leaders also endorsed Australia's proposal for a formal annual meeting of Pacific women leaders as part of the PIF program, adding to meetings of foreign ministers, trade ministers, economic ministers and so on. It's added to the formal forum meeting agenda. It will drive Senator even stronger political Time focus on gender expired. equality. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Will the minister advise the Senate on forum leaders' consideration of Pacific Island countries' access to a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, of course, leaders uh, were focused on emphasising the critical importance of productive partnerships for timely and equitable distribution of vaccines. And the government's regional vaccine access and health security initiative will contribute very positively in this objective. We announced formally that Australia will support Pacific Island countries to achieve full population co uh, coverage with safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines. That will contribute strongly to our important regional partnership on vaccines and was very warmly welcomed by leaders. Senator Seselja and I have been discussing Australia's commitments individually with respective leaders across the Pacific over the last month. It will also build on Australia's contribution to the Global COVAX Facility Fund for developing countries, facilitating delivery of more than a million doses to Pacific Island countries by the middle of this year. Our package is end-to-end. -end. It includes helping secure doses, technical support for safe and effective vaccine rollout, including supply chain distribution, assessments of vaccine safety, efficacy and Order. quality, Senator and capacity Payne. building for Time. health workforces. The answer has expired. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Prime Minister. The Independent Climate Targets Panel recently found that so much of our carbon budget has been spent. Australia would need to double our 2030 targets to at least a 50 per cent reduction by 2030 to do our fair share of limiting global warming to well below 2 degrees. Is the Government still committed 
to limiting global warming to well below 2 degrees? And if so, will you accept the Climate Targets Panel findings and increase Australia's 2030 targets before President Biden's climate summit on April the 22nd? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Waters uh, for her question. Uh, the, the government is indeed committed to the objectives of the Paris Agreement, to which we are a signatory, which include uh, targets in relation to limits on global warming. Uh, we, of course, look forward to working cooperatively with other nations in relation to the work towards uh, those targets, to doing as Australia has done time and time again, and that is to meet and exceed the commitments that we have made. And in relation to the Paris Agreement, we have made 2030 commitments commensurate with that agreement. Uh, and all indications and analysis show that we are on track uh, to once again meet and exceed uh, those targets. Uh, as senators may be aware, Prime Minister Morrison and President Biden uh, spoke earlier today in a warm conversation, uh, canvassing a number of different issues, including cooperation in relation uh, to matters uh, of climate change. Uh, and indeed, the government looks forward to receiving further details about the Biden administration summit. Uh, and to formulating our participation in that summit uh, once we have received uh, those further details. So, Mr President, our position uh, is uh, certainly one of continuing to invest, as we have, in the technologies and pathways to achieve reductions. It's investment by Australian businesses, Australian households, Australian industry and Australian governments uh, that have put Australia in a position uh, that sees uh, the uptake of renewable energy in this country uh, leading much of the rest of the world that has delivered reductions in emissions ahead of the OECD averages over a period of time. And it's through continued investment uh, that we will achieve the technological breakthroughs that enable us to move beyond the types of successes being seen in relation to energy generation into the other spheres of emissions uh, that need to be tackled to be able to achieve more ambitious targets into the future. That's why we've made a $1.9 billion investment package into future low emissions technologies and why we look forward to working with partners like the United States Order. in delivering Senator on that Birmingham. package. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Given the views expressed on social media by Mr Craig Kelly, Senator Rennick and other Liberal backbenchers, does the Prime Minister have confidence in the Bureau of Meteorology? Senator Birmingham. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, the government uh, indeed has confidence in the Bureau of Meteorology, in the CSIRO, uh, in our agencies, in our agencies who, uh, who provide uh, advice and information uh, to government, uh, in the agencies whose analysis has demonstrated uh, that Australia has not only met and exceeded the commitments we made under the first Kyoto period or under the second Kyoto commitment period, but that we're on track to meet and exceed the commitments we've made under the Paris Agreement. And I realise that these are facts that are inconvenient truths for the Australian Greens, if I can use that phrase. But the evidence is very clear that Australia has achieved Order. what many other nations have not to date, and that is to be able to, within our country, through domestic action, be able to meet and exceed the commitments that we have made. And the investments that our Order. government is making is about ensuring that we maintain that track record of success in delivery into the future. Order. There's, there's a little bit too much background noise. I was struggling to hear the minister. Senator, Order. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. Does the Prime Minister accept the evidence given by the Bureau of Meteorology to a recent Senate Estimates Committee that under current targets, Australia is currently on track for up to 4.4 degrees of warming by the end of this century? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, I've learned uh, I've learned a lot of things in my time in uh, in this place, and uh, and one is to make sure that when questions like that are framed, that it's always best to go and check the full context in which such uh, uh, such analysis might have been uh, given, and such questions order. may have Senator been answered. Waters, I have sent Senator Birmingham. I have Senator Waters on a point of order. Point of order, uh, President. I can read the quote out from the bureau that's, if the minister that, requires. That's not a point of order, Senator Waters. I'll call the minister to continue. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Clearly, uh, depends upon the type of assumptions that are being talked about, uh, and obviously, in relation to climate science, as I said before, we follow the evidence. In relation to 
the work on, of the Bureau and other agencies looking at projections of, uh, of what outcomes may occur. A huge driving part of that relates not just to what Australia does, but to what the rest of the world does in terms of their emissions profile as well. That's the driving reason behind our investment in technologies, because how you shift the whole world's emissions profile is how you actually tackle this issue. And you do it by achieving technological breakthroughs that ensure every country embraces Order. lower Senator emissions Birmingham, technologies, not just those who might be able to afford Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. How will cutting the wages of thousands of Australian workers help the economic recovery when wages growth is already at record lows? The Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And I think uh, Senator Birmingham and, uh, and I in the, in the broad have responded to this question today. The government has had in place a very strong system uh, of uh, support for uh, Australian businesses, for Australian employers over the period of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's, business, it's, reform, sorry, it's support, Mr President, that was absolutely essential uh, during the worst periods of the pandemic. But importantly, Mr President, there needs to be a path beyond the worst periods of the pandemic in 2020 and through 2021. And so the government, in planning and in reviewing its position, will work very carefully with employers, with industry, with uh, employer organisations, as it has done, in fact, right through the pandemic period, as we make those decisions. Most importantly, though, Mr President, we'll make them responsibly and thoughtfully and in a considered fashion, not, though, as we might have seen from those opposite. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that Schedule 3, Part 5, Clause 19 of the Morrison government's own industrial relations legislation allows for a wage cut? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Ayres for turning my attention to Schedule 3, Part 5, Clause 19 uh, of the legislation. And I don't have that uh, particular part of the uh, legislation with me, Mr. President. Uh, but what I can confirm is that the campaign that those opposite are running, a campaign against a bill that is about, that is about adapting our successful JobKeeper flexibilities, that is about reforms in the bill that ask employ allow employers and employees in sectors to work together, uh, that, uh, that enable employers to uh, have more flexible arrangements. Those decisions, Mr President, are ones which the government has made in broad consultation, many of those consultations held by the Minister for Industrial Relations last year, but those opposite are completely opposed to any engagement on those, uh, on those grounds. And, Mr President, we reject, we reject that premise. And the government's plan Order. is clear Senator, and the government's Payne, plan is founded in a strong Senator confidence Payne, in Australia's Senator future. A, I, I'll give you an opportunity to conclude. I have Senator is on a point of order. Point of order's relevance. The question was very straightforward. I understand the minister doesn't have her own industrial relations legislation in front of her, but the question was, does the provision allow for a wage cut? Um, not having it in front of me myself either, Senator Ayres, um, the minister, from my hearing of her answer, was talking about that issue. Um, I can't and, 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 rel and issues that I would consider directly relevant to it. Um, I'll call her. I think she had five seconds left to continue. Um, I've allowed you to restate the specific nature of your question. Oh, the minister has nothing else to add. Senator Ayres, a supplement, final supplementary question. A supplementary question. Sorry. Yep. When the Morrison government removes the test that requires enterprise bargaining agreements to be better off overall, doesn't that mean that workers? Don't have to be better off overall. Senator Payne. Mr. President, it's very clear to us, very clear to, us, to uh, Australians who uh, hear the uh, 
mantra of those opposite that there are a number of false claims being made about the proposed changes to the better off overall test the boot under the enterprise bargaining framework. For example, the claim that we're removing the boot. That's not correct. No. The Industrial Relations Reform Bill does not remove the better off overall text. That's it continues to apply to each individual current and prospective employee to ensure that they are left better off overall under an enterprise agreement compared to the relevant modern award. Are we allowing each employer to now ignore the better off overall test? No, we are not, Mr President. One of the proposed changes builds upon the interesting public existing public interest exemption in the Fair Work Act, which was of course introduced by Labor. Those, these changes are a temporary measure that allows the Fair Work Commission to approve some agreements that don't pass the boot in limited circumstances to support workplaces that have been negatively impacted by COVID-19 and where their employees and representatives Order. Senator Payne, agree time to do for the so. Answer has expired. Senator Order. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister update the Senate on the important contribution of the resources sector to our economy, particularly in rural and regional Australia, and what risks threaten the sector's continued economic contribution to our country? Order. The Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Canavan for his question and his very, very strong interest and advocacy on behalf of our very important resources sector. Um, because, like uh, the rest of the Morrison McCormack government, we understand what a huge role that the resources sector plays in creating jobs, especially in rural and regional Australia. It's an absolute pillar of our economic prosperity, and it is crucial because it employs more than 264,000 Australians, hard-working Australians. And our coal exports contribute $43.8 billion to the Australian economy last year alone. And these export earnings they help to pay for the infrastructure that we need, the hospitals, the schools, and all of the things that Australians are so, so obviously rely on. Um, and this sector is absolutely critical for our economic prosperity, and it has been absolutely steadfast in its contribution to our economic recovery uh, as we recover from the COVID pandemic. But yes, Senator Canavan, there are some very significant risks to our, uh, our, um, the, this sector. Uh, and in front of us right now, um, there are risks by those that sit opposite and their state colleagues in the Queensland government. And the recent High Court decision uh, in relation to the Ackland Mine uh, in the Darling Downs region of Queensland has exposed exactly that and the Queensland government's failures to support the resource sector in that state. I mean, New Hope have been battling for five years to try and resolve the planning approvals for the extension on expansion of, of that mine. And I'll quote New Hope's chief executive when he said, "What we need from the government, the Queensland government, is a roadmap for how we get this project up and running. Because more delays equates to more job losses. It is absolutely essential that this world-class operator, the kind of operator that we want operating in Australia, is able to get on with the job." of making investments and creating jobs for Australians. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I'm glad the, uh, the minister uh, referred to the Ackland mine because there are 500 jobs there at risk uh, thanks to the twiddling of their thumbs of the Queensland government. And can the minister outline how project delays threaten jobs in regional Queensland? Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much. And indeed, uh, Senator Canavan, uh, it is the kind of lack of support that we've seen from the Queensland government um, around the support of this, uh, this mine that has seen New Hope uh, in the position it does because of the lack of support for our resources sector. Um, New Hope originally lodged their application to expand this mine site in 2007, and it is still waiting for that approval. So you don't need to be Einstein to understand that the Queensland government does not support these sorts of projects in Queensland. And as you said, Senator Canavan, 500 direct jobs will be created by the extension of this particular mine. Um, and New, New Hope, unfortunately, was forced to make 150 workers redundant on the back of the fact that they were not able to get the approvals to extend this mine. Uh, and you know, Minister Pitt yesterday said, you know, workers trying to plan their, uh, their lives around the mine's future are now back to square one. How on earth can that be helping the COVID recovery and the people of Queensland who deserve Order. our help Senator in getting jobs? Rustin, Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Can the minister also advise why it is so important to ensure that coal jobs remain in regional Queensland? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, clearly, a secure and stable coal industry um, is going to be something that is going to support regional Queensland. It supports regional Australia, and it's absolutely critical in job creation and economic prosperity. But particularly, Senator Canavan, in rural and regional Australia. Uh, unfortunately, in the case of this particular mine site, the new Ackland mine, highlights that you know, Labor is particularly erratic when it comes to any commentary it makes about the resources sector. Those opposite need to stand up for the resource sector, and I thank those of them that do. But you, you talk the talk, but you do not walk the talk. Um, what we need is we need a united and demonstrated fight for the people who live in our rural and regional areas who need the jobs that are created by projects such as this. You need to stop walking both sides of the street. You can't have a policy for inner city suburbs and a different policy when you actually get out there in the regions where these jobs really matter, the livelihoods of individuals really matter. And yes, I've been there, Senator Watt. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Reynolds. In response to the West Australian government's decision to protect its citizens against a deadly COVID-19 strain by instituting a five-day lockdown, Minister for Home Affairs Mr Dutton attacked Premier McGowan, saying the decision was, and I quote, not a realistic approach, that it was politically motivated and that it would send businesses broke. Is this the position of the Morrison government? Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I really have no additional uh, input. I think Minister Dutton's words speak for themselves. Order, order. Senator Stirl, a supplementary question. She hasn't got a written answer. Oh, I'm nearly speechless. Okay. All oh, right. Okay, yeah, Mr. Mr. President, I do have a supplementary. Order. Order. Can I start again? <laughs> Senator, I didn't Stirl, see your lips continue. move then, Mr. President. I'll, I'll use my discretion from the chair. Please continue. Premier McGowan has pointed out that the federal government has uh, abdicated their responsibility for federal quarantine, saying, and I quote, it has fallen to the states to perform the role that Mr. Dutton should be performing under the Constitution. Minister, isn't Premier McGowan right? Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much. And look, I thank uh, Senator Stirl for that question. I think there's some misunderstandings uh, on both sides of the rabbit-proof fence here on this issue. Uh, the ABF has legislative responsibilities for the Customs and Migration Acts to clear people travelling from overseas. From that point, the responsibility for passengers uh, passes to state and territories for quarantine and onwards domestic travel as relevant. National Cabinet, including Premier McGowan, uh, agreed to create hotel quarantine programs from the 27th of March this year. All First Ministers, including uh, Premier McGowan, agreed to this. So this should come as no surprise, given this arrangement has been agreed by the WA state government since the 27th of March this year. Senator Stirl, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Western Australia has taken in more than their fair share of stranded Australians returning home. Why are Mr. Morrison's ministers from the eastern states attacking the hard work of Western Australians in stepping up when his government has stepped away? Senator Reynolds. Senator Reynolds. Have a look around you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Stirl for that question. I'm surprised he could even—he couldn't even keep a straight face when he was asking that question. He's still laughing uh, at the hypocrisy of that question. In, in March the 27th, all first ministers agreed to these quarantine hotel arrangements. Um, hotels. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody bullies you, Senator Stirl. Uh, but, in all seriousness, the state government agreed in March to these arrangements. The government has looked very seriously at this issue, and hotels remain the best possible place for quarantine because people have individual rooms, they have their own facilities, and that is where, and that is where the health 
uh, and uh, all of the other wraparound support is located. Order. So it is Senator very clearly Keneally. the right place to be. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Polly. Mr President, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Birmingham and Payne to the questions asked by myself and Senators Sheldon and Green. And can I say from the outset, from the response from Minister Payne to my question relating to funding and support for the tourism sector in regional Australia, we obviously touched some real nerves there. It's so disappointing when I look at my own home state of Tasmania, with 42,000 Tasmanians either directly or indirectly being employed and supported by the tourism sector in my home state. And there is no answers from this government in terms of the support and what's going to happen to these businesses when they turn off JobKeeper in March. It's 52 days away, and they still cannot provide any answers as to their plan and their support for these many, many businesses that are under threat. This sector is in crisis, and it's not just us who are making this point. I want to uh, turn to Tom Manwaring, chair of the Australian Federation of Travel Agents, says the tourism sector is in crisis and will be decimated if there is no further support from the federal government. It's not just those on this side of the chamber that is seeking support and answers from this government. Under the regional tourism recovery package, Tasmania was supposed to receive $13.5 million to go to that sector, and we couldn't get an answer today four months after the announcement, four months after the photo opportunity, and yet again there's been no follow-up, no response today as to how much that money has been rolled out. I have been talking on a regular basis to not only the tourism sector but the hospitality sector in my home state. They are in crisis. People's mental health, as well as their businesses, are facing this crisis for what seems to be without real support from this government. And in fact, the only time the minister really got excited when she was trying to answer some of these questions that we put to her today was when we hit a nerve about the priority of this government, and that is they will pay for the ex-minister to fly around Europe with his own private doctor. They'll spend money on advertising but they're not prepared to give security to a very important sector in regional areas around this country, not just in my home state, but I do want to talk about the effect on my home state. I'd like to know what we're going to tell the tourism sector in these regional towns of St Helens, Coles Bay, Strawn, Stanley, our iconic sites like Cradle Mountain, like the Freycinet National Park. About, what about Port, Port Arthur's historic site, the Overland and Mona? These regional areas rely on tourism. They're the hook that gets people to travel to those destinations and to spend money to boost the local economy. It is about time that we saw some real leadership from the Prime Minister, and it was so disappointing today for a minister who is representing someone from that other place. You would think she would have at least some answers in relation to the regional tourism recovery package. Surely they would expect that after four months that as Tasmanian Senator that we would be interested and want to know because we're being contacted and we're reaching out to the tourism sector to see what support that is still needed. Even the larger businesses, like the, Fe like the federal group who support hospitality, the game industries, provide convention facilities, these businesses have got 
empty convention centres. They are still having to maintain those businesses and their premises without any plan for what will happen into the future with further lockdowns. Even the Premier of Tasmania today advised that over the next 12 months there will be further lockdowns. So where is the support and why isn't the Premier of Tasmania calling on this weak government to Thank do you, more Senator for Polly, Tasmania? Your time has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. And, and I thank Senator Polly for raising such a vitally important issue, particularly to regional areas. Tourism and travel is vital to our regions and vital to our economy. It has been for a long time and it continues to be so, um, particularly during these troubling times of COVID. And look, I, I want to highlight I truly do understand the impact COVID has had on this sector. Just on New Year's Eve, I saw in my hometown every single caravan park. It was full to the brim until 5 p.m. on New Year's Eve, when the Victorian government, with no prior notice, announced that they would be shutting the borders. Every single caravan park in my hometown emptied within four hours. In fact, there were reports of traffic jams and near misses with cars struggling to meet the border by the deadline. That is the impact that knee-jerk and sudden reactions and sudden, ill-thought, unplanned announcements can have on our industries. And I have written to all state premiers and I have written to the Prime Minister imploring a consistent approach to COVID lockdowns, to state border closures, define what a hotspot is, deal with hotspots, manage and contain the crisis so that the rest of Australia can get on with their business. And tourism is one of those vital businesses. And I commend our government for today launching a week-long tourism advertising blitz that is encouraging people to holiday here this year. It makes sense. Australia has some of the best holiday locations in the world, as seen in a normal year by the vast amount of international tourists who come here to see what we've got to offer. Well, this year I call on every Australian to pack up their car and go for a holiday in the regions. Our government is spending $5 million marketing this push, and it is going to inspire Australians to holiday. But we've already done a lot to support the tourism and travel sector in this country, as well as supporting our aviation sectors. Uh, we have recently uh, announced the Consumer Travel Support Program with $128 million available in grants to tourist and travel agents. We've also got the $50 million Recovery for Regional Tourism Program and a further $100 million earmarked for tourism-related infrastructure through the Building Better Regions Fund that is directly benefiting the tourism industry in the regions. And this is what Senator Polly claims that we have turned our back on. Well, we have not. Yes, tourism has been impacted negatively by COVID, but there are green shoots, and already we are seeing improvement in domestic tourism with Queensland up 10 per cent, even Western Australia prior to the latest lockdown was up 5 per cent. Tasmania, Senator Polly's own state, was recording a 47 per cent increase. This is all good news for domestic tourism, and it is my genuine hope that domestic tourism continues to be embraced post-COVID and once the international borders open again. Because, as I said before, we have so much to offer people, and our regional areas welcome people with open arms. Our regional areas have actually fared better than some of the capital cities through COVID, and the tourism businesses in those areas have welcomed that. Not only are the regions less reliant on interstate travel, but we have benefited from those capital city population centres where people are looking to escape and take a break in their home states. It has been great. And of the 128 million targeted grant program I have previously mentioned, we have already 
got $54 million out the door to travel agents. We stand united with our domestic tourist industry. We are still working with our travel agents to find more ways that we can support them so that they can continue to do what they do best, and that's get people out the door and on holiday, and particularly through this crisis, doing so in our regions, in our glorious country. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Green. Thank you. On Tuesday, the minister spruced um, a number of programs that this government supposedly is using to support tourism and regional tourism. And my question today uh, to the minister was to simply ask how much of that money has been spent, has been received by affected businesses. Because what we know, what we know is that this government is known for making announcements and not delivering, for sending out press releases but not being there to support people in times of need. The only thing that this government has done to save jobs that are about to be lost when JobKeeper ends is send out press releases about things that they're going to do in the future. The minister even talked about earmarking future spending. Well, those words will be hollow to people who are in cans right now and are losing their jobs. We know that 3,600 businesses in Cairns are relying on JobKeeper. Those are thousands of jobs that will be lost in 52 days when JobKeeper ends. And 52 days might seem like a long time to this government, but it is not a long time for a business or a a worker who is looking at the prospect of losing their job. And in fact, we know that there are many businesses in Cairns and around the country that are making decisions right now about making workers redundant because they need to make that decision now. They, they will not be making that decision in 52 days' time. And sadly, today, a major operator in Cairns announced that 90 jobs will be lost today. And they are considering a further 200 jobs being cut when JobKeeper ends. That's almost 300 jobs in a two-month period that will be lost because this government is withdrawing support. Now, I've said this before in the Senate, and I make this case again, that Cairns is a unique region and re uniquely reliant on international tourism. 70% of tourism spend is from international tourists in Cairns. And when you speak to tourism operators, as I have done on many occasions over the last few months, they insist that the domestic market will not make up this shortfall in no way, shape or form. They are relying on international tourists. This idea that they can pivot is nonsense. They will not recover until international tourism recovers. And so they're asking for some help. They were asking the government for help. And it should be noted, it should be noted that members of the government have alluded to possible support or even extending JobKeeper. And the member for Leichhardt, Warren Ench, said that extending JobKeeper was a no-brainer. That's what he told people in Cairns, but that is not what this government is prepared to do. The member for Dawson, George Christensen called for an extension and also for additional support for the Whit Sundays, another area incredibly reliant on international tourism. And the member for Wide Bay, Lou O'Brien, has also called for an extension and for further support for tourism. And I say this because what we know is that not only is this government not listening to workers and businesses, in Cairns and to other places of Queensland, they're not even listening to their own local members. So if you are a Queenslander and you come into this place and you say that you represent Queenslanders and you don't stand up for these workers and you don't call for more support for extending JobKeeper in a targeted way that supports these businesses, then you are on the wrong side. You are on the wrong side. You are not on the side of these workers. These workers are in an incredibly 
desperate situation. We know that many of these jobs will be lost in the next couple of weeks. It's a sad time to be in Cairns. And we know that the Minister for Tourism is planning on coming to Cairns next week on Monday, making a speech and talking about all the consultation that they've been doing. Well, my message to this government, the senators opposite and the Minister for Tourism, is do not come to Cairns empty-handed, because these are jobs that rely on international tourism and they are relying on you. So do not come with excuses. Thank Do you, not Senator come Green. Empty Your handed. time has expired. Um, Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. And it's great to be back here this year in 2021 with my first take note. And what a time to be alive. The distinction between this side of the chamber and that side of the chamber has never been more stark, more stark, because this side of the chamber believes in progress. This side of the chamber wants to take Australia forward. What does that side of the chamber want? All they want is to continue on JobKeeper and JobSeeker. There are plenty of ways to keep people in work, and that's by building infrastructure, which is something that state governments need to be doing. Now, the RBA on Tuesday came out and they've issued another $100 billion in bonds. Let's build infrastructure. Stop tearing dams down in Queensland. If you want to get jobs out there in the regions, let, let's get them into mining. Let's get them into coal mining. Let's get them into farming. Let's get them into logging. Let's get them into fishing. Into fishing. Now, it's interesting Senator Sheldon raised the first question uh, talking about the, the chairman of Virgin Australia. I actually remember what she said last week in the, committee as well, uh, in, the, in the Senate inquiry as well. She wanted a coordinated framework between the states to guess what? Keep the borders open. Keep the borders open. See, this is the thing about the state governments. There's been a real contrast between the Liberal government of New South Wales, of uh, the Premier of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian. She has kept the borders open the whole time, with the one exception with Victoria when it did blow up out of control. But the state Labor premiers, they keep locking down. They keep locking down over, wait for it, wait for it, one, one case. Now, what kind of a confidence do these people have in their own health systems? when they panic over one case, one case. What is their contact testing, uh, tracing and testing systems like? And more to the point, what are their quarantine systems like when they have to panic? I mean, the uh, Queensland CMO, she couldn't understand how it could possibly spread, how the virus could possibly spread in a hotel with ducted air conditioning, with ducted air conditioning. Well, seriously, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to work it out. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to work it out. And did they do daily testing? Did the state premiers Senator do daily Rennick, testing? Senator Rennick, of, yeah, if you sorry, could just sorry. resume your seat. I sure. have listened really carefully. So the take note question today were questions from Senators Polly and Green to Ministers Birmingham and Payne. And whilst they did go to JobKeeper and JobSeeker, they were largely focused on tourism. And you've mentioned JobSeeker and JobKeeper once, but you're really getting way off the topic now. Thank you. Madam Deputy Speaker, I apologise. I will be more specific. Just last week, when the borders reopened, tourism jumped by 100 per cent in Queenslanders. The Southerners wanted to come back to Queensland, which I must say I was quite surprised about because I talked to a cabbie down here on my way down um, on, on, during the week, and he was very angry with Queensland because he said, given that what the Premier had done in locking them out previously, he wasn't going to come back up uh, back to Queensland for holidays. So the whole reason why I'm talking about keeping borders open, Madam Acting Deputy President, is so that we can get tourism, the tourists who would normally go overseas and have a holiday somewhere in the Caribbean, they can come to our beautiful city of Cairns and North Queensland and outback Queensland and the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast and, of course, my homeland, the Darling Downs. And we want to see the Southerners come up to Queensland because we love tourism. We love tourism. When I grew up, tourism was the fastest-growing industry in Queensland. The late, great Sir, uh, Premier Sir Joe Bjorki Peterson turned uh, Queensland into the tourist capital of the world. We had Expo 88. We had George Harrison from the Beatles even buying an island up there. 
and everyone was flocking to the islands. Unfortunately, under Labor, they have destroyed tourism in the regions. They have destroyed maternity wards in the regions. And that would be another way to create jobs in the regions. You, know, you don't always have to go back to the industry you have been in. Maybe you could think about re restoring some health services and reopen those 30 maternity wards that Labor have closed for the last 30 years. But can I just point out that the federal government, the federal government has spent $28 billion in direct economic support to homes and businesses in Queensland. More than three times the $8 billion spent by Anna, uh, the Premier for Queensland, Anna Palaszczuk. Now, you cannot continue to do lockdowns on short notice. I was just uh, got my hair cut, as you can tell, on the weekend. I was talking to my barber. He lost $1,500 the weekend we did that three-day lockdown. $1,500. Now, industries cannot survive if we don't have a clear, coordinated framework. Okay, between the states. Okay, the states are the ones that perform health. That is in the constitution, or should I say, it's not in the constitution. And this is the thing that uh, Labor keep uh, forgetting to mention. They like to say that we have to do quarantine, but guess what? We don't have to do health. But we give sixty billion dollars every year in block payments to state governments. So if state governments want to give back to sixty billion dollars, we'll take quarantine and health because they Thank go you, hand Senator in hand. Senator Rennick, your time has expired. Senator oh, Sheldon. Thank you, Renick. Well, what an interesting uh, comments on taking note. <laughs> yeah, if we look at uh, the response from the Minister Birmingham representing the Prime Minister from Senator Birmingham, and you know, clearly we've got a situation in Australia where there is no aviation plan. Not at any stage has the Deputy Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, or in question time, have they answered with a plan to turn around and make sure that we keep people connected with jobs in the aviation industry, a critical industry for our economic future and a critical industry right now. now we've heard comments from, from uh, many sides of uh, this parliament, the Senate, about the necessity to make sure that we keep the tourism industry well serviced. Well, I include the universities. I include business generally. I include the mining industry. And the servicing the bloodline, the veins of those industries, is the aviation industry. You've got to make sure that you have a plan to keep people connected with those critical jobs that require experience and capacity. The government says, well, you know, it's OK, just trust us. We've done such a good job so far. Well, go to the million work casual workers who are excluded from JobKeeper. Go to the 30,000 university professionals that have been lost, the brains of our future, the capacity to build strength, to train engineers in aviation, to skill people in the very important industries that make this country tick. We've clearly got a government that has so much about making an announcement but so little about substance. They haven't thought about who's going to staff the planes, who's going to clean the planes, who's going to pack the planes, who's going to maintain the planes, who's going to direct those planes, who's going to book the planes. Quite clearly, from comments passed from industry, from unions, commentators, that this industry is in a dire strait, and yet this government puts its head in the sand. The Australian Aviation, Australian Airports Association, James Goodwin, at an aviation hearing last week, went to say it's clear that the government needs to formulate a plan for Australia's aviation industry over the next six to twelve months and beyond, both domestically and internationally. Our sector has doubled down at every turn and executed everything asked of them. But this is coming at a significant and unsustainable cost. I would use, he said, I would use this opportunity to make it as that there is an important time for the government to reconsider extending its support for the aviation sector. This is a whole of government situation. Airports and aviation affect the entire community and the entire economy. There are so many flow on benefits from having a viable aviation network. But I would certainly call for JobKeeper to be extended 
certainly for another six months for people within the aviation sector, industry, the people that know. Common sense tells you when you have an industry that doesn't keep connected, experienced and knowledgeable workers, there is a consequence. There's a consequence for all Australians and, of course, a consequence for those many thousands of workers that are in the aviation industry. Now, this aviation industry, the hundreds of hours that have already been lost in the years, comes at a great cost of experience and knowledge. And it's come at a cost because of direct decisions by this government's failure to turn around and act. But let's, don't, let's not say they haven't acted in, in, uh, everywhere, but they've certainly picked their favourites. You know, they've turned around and made decisions for companies like Rex. They've certainly given special treatment to that company to receive $54 million untied grants to a foreign airline. And if you were actually to make the same contributions untied to Virgin, or Qantas, but Virgin in this case, it would be over a billion dollars. But did they? No. Those companies, that is, this industry, is critical to the survival of our economy and, its, and the prosperity of our country. It's important that we turn around and have the right answers. And I'm sorry to say, but be all becoming fishermen and farmers for all those aviation workers is just not sensible. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Um, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Polly to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Madam President, uh, Deputy President. Um, I rise to take note of the answer from Senator Colbeck, uh, Colbeck um, in response to my answers about the. Uh, mRNA vaccines. Well, here we have the government acknowledging that mRNA vaccines are, are, are so important that they've gone out and bought another 10 million doses, which is given that you need two doses uh, to make it effective, that's five, another five million people. But they can't tell me beyond, yes, they're having a few discussions with some people around whether they will invest in manufacturing mRNA vaccine here in this country, they can't tell me. Now, we're, we're still in the pandemic. We, saw what's we know what's happening in Western Australia. We know we've just seen uh, another case come up in Victoria. So we know we have a long way to go before this pandemic is over and its impacts are uh, no longer felt in this country. That's going to be a long time. But mRNA vaccines, not only are they proving to be highly effective and more, certainly more effective than the AstraZeneca vaccine, they're also going to be really important and revolutionise drug, drug manufacturing, so we're being told. So it's in Australia's interests to manufacture those vaccines and develop the capacity here. Because we are going to need those vaccines into the future. We are also have a responsibility to make sure that our neighbours are getting the best vaccines they can get. So a manufacturing capacity here would also assist our Pacific neighbours, to which the government says they are committed to assisting. We need to be establishing this facility as soon as possible so that we do have that capacity. And it needs to be publicly owned. We need, as a community, to be assured that, the public, that this facility is publicly owned. So the government then has the capacity to ensure that vaccines, these vaccines will be manufactured here in Australia and available to Australians and as part of our global contribution. I asked the minister about the Pfizer vaccine particularly and who will be able to get that because all the government will say is that it's going to be available to, phase, to the first phase of the rollout strategy, which is phase 1A. They, which is around 680,000 people or 1.4 million doses. Now, they will get the Pfizer vaccine, which is of course essential because they are the most vulnerable community members. But the government won't say 
Who then gets the Pfizer vaccine, the most efficient and effective vaccine, the first vaccine that's going to hit, that's going to be available in this country when it eventually becomes available, if, if they manage to meet their timelines and deal with export controls in Europe? Why won't the government say who else gets the Pfizer vaccine? We have then 1B, then we have phase 2, A, etc. out of the five phases. Who gets this vaccine? Now, they're also saying the AstraZeneca vaccine is the one that will go out to remote communities. Since when it has, has it been beyond the wit of Australia to be able to get important supplies and important things out to Aboriginal communities. It should not be, on our wit, be beyond our wit to get the Pfizer vaccine out to remote, and remote Aboriginal communities. We know our First Nations communities are some of the most vulnerable communities. They're high, very high up on the list in, phase, in, the, in the phased approach to the way we're rolling out our vaccines. We should be rolling out and committing to rolling out Pfizer vaccines to vulnerable First Nations communities, because we can do it. Australia prides, it, prides, prides itself on our ingenuity. Why are we rolling, not rolling out the most effective vaccine to First Nations communities? I want to know where those, and so does Australian, want to know where are those, the remaining doses of the first 10 million doses are going and then where the new allocation is going. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So we are now at uh, tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Fiavanti Wells. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I present delegated legislation monitor number two of 2021 of the Standing Committee for the scrutiny of delegated legislation, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. I rise to speak on the tabling uh, of the scrutiny of delegated legislations committee delegation legislation monitor two of 2021. In particular, I would like to draw the Chamber's attention to the Committee's comments regarding five legislative instruments made by the Australian Securities and Investment Commission. These instruments address a range of subject matters within ASIC's portfolio by providing for exemptions from and modifications to certain provisions of the Corporations Act 2001 and other Acts of Parliament. While they alter the operation of primary legislation made by this parliament, these instruments appear to be intended to remain in force for substantial periods of time ranging from five to ten years. This contravenes the committee's long-standing expectation that instruments which modify or exempt persons or entities from the operation of primary legislation should cease to operate operate no more than three years after they commence. The committee considers that a shorter sunsetting period is essential to ensure that there is a minimum degree of regular parliamentary oversight of such instruments. Since October last year, the committee has been corresponding with both the Treasurer and the Assistant Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and Financial Technology to resolve its scrutiny concerns regarding each of these instruments. The committee has also lodged notices of motion to disallow each of the instruments in order to provide it with additional time to resolve its scrutiny concerns. The committee considers that these instruments raise broader systemic concerns about the application of ASIC's exemption and modification powers. Accordingly, in December, the committee drew these systemic concerns to the attention of the Treasurer. Since then, the Treasurer has continued to engage constructively with the committee in recognition of the importance of parliamentary oversight of such a measure. Most recently, the Treasurer formulated a list of principles which he considers should be taken into account by ASIC when determining the duration of instruments which provide for exemptions or modifications to primary legislation. 
On behalf of the committee, can I thank the Treasurer for his ongoing and considered engagement with the committee in relation to this systemic issue. However, the, this chamber has tasked the committee to ensure that all disallowable legis uh, delegated legislation is subject to rigorous and consistent scrutiny against the principles set out in Standing Order 23. These are the parameters that have long underpinned the work of our committee. The, to scrutinise ASIC instruments in the manner proposed by the Treasurer would represent a significant departure from the committee's long-standing practice in interpreting these scrutiny principles. This has resulted in a consistent and clear approach. Indeed, it would open up the prospect of other proposals from other ministers in other departments for their own set of principles. It would also mean that the committee holds instruments made by ASIC to a different standard to all other disallowable delegated legislation. The committee will not do this. The committee has therefore requested that each of the five ASIC instruments be amended to limit their duration. This is to ensure that the parliament is given a regular opportunity to review and scrutinise modifications or exemptions to primary legislation that it has enacted. The committee has resolved not to withdraw the notices of motion to disallow the instruments to highlight the significance of its scrutiny concerns. The Treasurer's response to the committee's request will inform the committee's consideration of whether to withdraw its notices of motion to disallow these instruments. These scrutiny concerns go beyond these five instruments, and the committee takes this opportunity to ask all ministers and all lawmakers to keep these systemic concerns in mind in the future. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation monitor two of 2021 to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Fiavanti Wells. Um, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Fiavanti Wells be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I present the report of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee on the issues facing diaspora communities in Australia, together with the Hansard record of proceedings and documents presented to the committee. And I move that the Senate take note of the report and seek leave to continue. Oh. Thank Sorry. you, Senator Kitching. So, thank you, Deputy President. I rise as chair of the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee to speak on the report for the committee's inquiry into issues facing diaspora communities in Australia. This has been a wide-ranging inquiry. Our terms of reference covered support for diaspora community organisations, safety concerns for diaspora communities, barriers to the full participation of diaspora communities in Australia's democratic and social institutions and opportunities to strengthen communication and partnerships between government and diaspora communities. We wanted to hear the voices of those in our diaspora communities and to give a voice to those who don't always have one. We received rich evidence on all of these aspects and more. We heard of challenges, but also the varied and substantial contributions made by diaspora communities, as well as the importance of recognising and celebrating these contributions. The committee received 90 written submissions. It held six public hearings via teleconference from 29 September to 6 November 2020. We heard from a variety of stakeholders with perspectives ranging from the community to the national level. The committee is incredibly grateful to the groups and individuals who took the time to provide written submissions and appear before the committee. The strong response from community organisations in particular is a testament to their deep dedication to advocating for the needs of their communities. In total, the committee has made 18 recommendations for the government's consideration. The committee recognised that the diversity of Australia's diaspora communities is one of its key strengths. Almost half of Australia's population was either born overseas or has at least one parent who was born overseas. Diaspora communities make valuable contributions to Australian society and are also able to positively impact Australia's relationship with their home countries. The committee agreed that an inclusive and celebratory approach to multicultural affairs was appropriate. This celebration could take a variety of forms and deserves further consideration at all levels of government. The importance of diaspora community organisations was evident to the committee. 
These groups provide crucial support to individuals, families and communities and often act as a bridge to government. The committee heard many of these organisations rely on financial support from the Commonwealth to deliver their services. Many groups perceive a, perceived a shift from a more community-based funding model to the funding of a small number of large organisations as interme intermediaries, which presents certain challenges. This includes a lack of flexibility to enable smaller organisations to use funding for their community's specific needs. The, the committee understands that there can be efficiencies in using large organisations organisations, but is concerned by evidence that this may inadvertently disadvantage grassroots community organisations. The committee therefore recommended that the relevant departments take steps to ensure that they do not inadvertently disadvantage or exclude smaller and newer and emerging community organisations. Related to this, the committee thought it notable that many witnesses described a need for capacity building for community organisations wishing to access government funding and some appeared to be unaware of the support already available. The committee welcomed the support available as a component of the Settlement, Engagement and Transition Support Program. It recommended that Home Affairs ensure that this support is appropriately targeted and pu publicised. Turning to safety concerns, the committee was disturbed by evidence concerning reports of foreign interference targeting diaspora communities, individuals and some media organisations. Despite not forming an explicit part of the terms of reference, foreign interference and its impact upon diaspora communities in Australia proved to be a key issue for the inquiry. Unfortunately, there were some witnesses who did not feel safe enough to give evidence in public. We heard in-camera evidence from some because either they are frightened from past experiences with the regimes in their country of origin, or they fear for their families, whether those families be here or in the country of origin. I don't think we can avoid naming the country where witnesses felt threatened and had to give evidence in camera. The regime there is the Chinese Communist Party. In the last few days, the last day, we have seen further documentation and authentication of sickening treatment and torture of the Uyghur people in the forced labour camps in Xinjiang. The committee recognises that many diaspora groups come to Australia to seek safety from risks and threats in their home countries. It is vital to protect the free and open society Australians enjoy. Reports of surveillance, monitoring, harassment and intimidation, including threats against family members overseas, are extremely troubling. We cannot tolerate these activities. They threaten the peace of our country. Home Affairs and ASIO are actively countering these attempts. The committee welcomes the establishment of the Office of the National Counter Foreign Interference Coordinator and of the Counter Foreign Interference Task Force in 2018 and 2019, respectively. I would like to thank those who work our, in our law enforcement and security agencies for the work that they do to keep us all safe. The committee notes the challenge of ensuring government agencies have the language and cultural understanding capabilities necessary to counter foreign interference and the roles diaspora communities may play in enhancing those essential attributes. The National Security Hotline is an essential tool for community members wishing to report potential acts of foreign interference. The committee recommended that the government consider running a multilingual information campaign on the hotline and its role in the battle against foreign interference, as well as promoting awareness through peak groups. Several witnesses expressed so strong support for the adoption by Australia of Magnitsky-style legislation, including as a deterrent to foreign interference. The committee supports the Human Rights Subcommittee of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade report on this subject and its recommendation that the government enact targeted sanctions legislation to address human rights violations and corruption. Despite the success of multicultural in, multiculturalism in Australia, the scourges of racism and discrimination persist. Sadly, the committee heard a testimony to this effect. In line with the global movement to tackle racism, not only between human beings but also at a systemic level, the committee heard calls for a national anti-racism strategy and a suggestion that an anti-racism strategy and framework be developed. Let us not use unclear language. Racism and xenophobia are evil. We must reject and combat these evils wherever they may lurk. For history teaches us where racism ends. It ends in pogroms. 
It ends in the gas chambers. It ends in the ethnic cleansing of Tibet and the ongoing obscenity of the treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. It ends in the massacres of Rwanda, in armed attacks on mosques and synagogues, live streamed on social media as entertainment. In Australia, Indigenous young people, in abject despair, hang themselves by the neck, alone in jail cells. Our silence about these things, the views of some that trade is more important than decency, is something young people are confronting and denouncing with ever louder voice. I say this in a literal sense. We should thank God they are. I pray they get louder and louder and louder. We must have zero tolerance for racism everywhere. We are so lucky in this country, and so we must hold ourselves to the highest standard, to be the best people. We have no excuse. Australia's existing anti-racism strategy was developed in 2012. It appears to have lost some momentum since that time. Noting that the development of a comprehensive new national anti-racism framework will take time, and recommending this includes a comprehensive consultation process with a focus on diaspora communities, the committee further recommended consideration be given to reinvigorate the existing national anti-racism strategy and campaign, particularly in light of the apparent increase in incidents of racism during the present pandemic. The committee also looked at a lack of div cultural diversity in a variety of sectors, including politics, business and the public service. The committee also looked at, the, at ways of strengthening partnerships uh, and looked at those partnerships that exist between government and Australia's diaspora communities. Except for First Nations people, Australia's story is one of immigration. This is why I undertook to establish this inquiry and hear from these voices. I am very proud to be a strong advocate and defender for Australian values, for democracy and its pillars, the rule of law, a free press and free and fair elections. That is what makes Australia such an attractive destination for those seeking a new life. But this doesn't mean that we cannot do better. I hope the inquiry's report helps the government to develop better strategies to engage with migrant and diaspora communities. The matters which we consider to go to the very issue of our security and sovereignty as a nation. This was an important aspect of the inquiry. I believe all members of the committee, despite, a th I think, a variety of views, take this seriously and solemnly. I know I do. In closing, I would like to thank the Deputy Chair, Senator Abetz, as well as other members of the committee for their cooperative efforts with the inquiry. I commend the report to the Senate. Thank you. Are you speaking on the matter, um, Senator Abetz? Please go uh, ahead. Th thank you, Deputy President. We need to continue to celebrate and acknowledge the wonderful contribution that our various ethnic diasporas have made in the creation of the modern nation Australia. What she is today, economically strong, democratic, freedom-loving, engaged in world affairs on the side of liberty and opposed to totalitarianism. The diaspora have enriched our culture. It stands to reason that as the various ethnic groups have come to Australia, there have been misunderstandings as to language and cultural norms and expectations. There has been ugliness. But that is where English language skills are so vitally important to give our various new arrivals a full entry into our society and protect them from exploitation. Overall, I believe Australia has done exceptionally well, and the benchmark has to be the other countries in the world. The report, which has been considered by the Senate, has been an excellent exercise, and I appreciate the Chair's and the Secretariat's substantial contribution to its preparation, along with my colleagues and the providers of evidence to the committee. Can I also take the opportunity of associating myself with the remarks of the Chair? It is a matter of regret that some submitters found it necessary to submit in confidence because of fear of retaliation from some within their own diaspora grouping doing the bidding of a foreign country and because of reprisals in their country of origin toward their extended family. During the hearing, some 
inappropriate allegations were made, suggesting that witnesses appearing as experts and thought leaders and think tank, uh, think tank contributors on China and its impact on the Chinese diaspora shouldn't be asked if they condemn the CCP dictatorship, which is brutalising its citizens. Let's be very clear. One million of their own people in concentration camps, forced sterilisations, rape, forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience, imprisonment of home Christians, imprisonment of Falun Gong practitioners, imprisonment of pro-democracy activists, not to mention the Tibetans, Mongolians and that country's illegal land acquisitions. To not condemn such a heinous regime is in itself heinous. We now have the BBC doing a full expose of the plight of the Uyghurs at the hands of this barbaric regime. We have had the China Tribunal, headed by Sir Geoffrey Nice QC, finding beyond reasonable doubt that forced organ harvesting occurs. We have had the findings of the US Congress, of the Canadian Parliament, and the list goes on. Professor Clive Hamilton, in his books The Silent Invasion and Hidden Hand, has outlined the barbarism of this regime. ASPE, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, has done a report, Uyghurs for Sale, outlining the slavery to which these people are submitted. And despite this overwhelming list of substantiated reports, books and inquiries by exceptionally eminent persons, the apologists seek disingenuously to dismiss these sort of damning findings. There's a professor from the University of Adelaide that asserts, incredibly asserts, there is no evidence. Really? Professor Hamilton's got it wrong, Aspie's got it wrong, the BBC's got it wrong, Sir Geoffrey Nice has got it wrong, or is this particular professor simply an apologist for an evil regime? And then, somewhat coincidentally, one of the submitters to our committee, a Mr Osman Chu, who ignorantly dismissed Professor Clive Hamilton's seminal work, which contained over 50 pages of evidentiary footnotes, dismissed it as unsubstantiated. What more evidence could be gathered than was contained in that seminal document and book by Professor Clive Hamilton? who might I add was a former Greens candidate at an election. So hardly somebody from my side of politics, but somebody who has the integrity and willingness to call out an evil regime for what it is, namely evil. The apologists cannot bring themselves to condemn the evil Chinese dictatorship. Now, I've unhesitatingly sought to stand in solidarity with those that have been oppressed by the Chinese dictatorship. Within my own party, I recall being the only one in the party room to stand against a proposal put forward by the Prime Minister and Foreign Minister for an extradition treaty with China. I know there were some others, like Senator Fiera Vandy Wells, who would have liked to have joined me, but she was on the front bench at the time. I had been previously assassinated by that group, so uh, I was free to speak. I say politically assassinated, uh, to correct the record. But I have had a long-standing interest in this area and have stood firmly and strongly with the oppressed. And I'm happy the extradition treaty never came into being and is now completely off the agenda. Indeed, we have now suspended our extradition treaty with Hong Kong because of this dictatorship's behaviour. And so you ask thought leaders and self-described experts to condemn the brutal dictatorship and as Professor Clive Hamilton predicted in his book, what do apologists do? They immediately 
condemn you as racist, and then offer sufficient criticism of the regime to retain credibility, but will never condemn it. And that might be one of the reasons why I invited some people to actually condemn the regime, and they failed to do so. I know what the Uyghurs would have wanted them to do. I know what the Falun Gong practitioners would have wanted them to do. I know what the House Christians would have wanted them to do. The women that are being forcibly sterilised and raped as we speak would be wanting us in Australia to stand in solidarity with them. But no, we have our national broadcaster only a couple of days ago again seeking to condemn me for my questioning but not being able to bring themselves to do what at least the BBC has been able to do, and that is expose this evil regime, this barbarism, the Uyghurs that are being raped, sterilised, put into concentration camps, and the Chinese diaspora in Australia fear for their relatives and fear for themselves as to the consequences if they speak out. Can I say, Madam uh, Deputy President, that despite the sort of attacks that came from certain quarters, I have been heartened by the overwhelming support, be it by a local Australian Chinese newspaper that has a circulation of tens of thousands in this country, had a front page heading, Chinese Australians support Tassie Senator's push to distinguish Chinese regime from Chinese people fully in support. You had, we had letters and emails flooding into the office, a YouTube channel with 100,000 followers uh, offering support, a former Chinese diplomat, a defector from China, who knew exactly what was going on, tweeted, don't let patriotic Senator Abetz feel ashamed for his courage against the CCP influence. The Australian Values Alliance, which is a Chinese organisation in Australia, stood up to support him. And China Uncensored, a uh, YouTube uh, program from the United States, overwhelmingly supporting me with hundreds of thousands of viewers. Madam Deputy President, our diaspora need protection from the malignant forces in Australia and from overseas that seek to intimidate and silence their fellow diaspora into non-criticism of the evilness of their regimes. Thank you, Senator Betts. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I also wish to speak to this important report on the experience of diaspora communities in Australia. And I was very pleased to be able to be part of the committee and attend the hearings and hear from witnesses about their experiences as members of the diaspora community. Um, the report basically outlines that there were, and the evidence that was given to us outlines of three key areas um, which we commented on, uh, which, which need attention. One is um, the various communities' ability to access services, access grants programs, access um, the services that they need, and the barriers that are in the way of them being able to do that, the fact that there are very complex systems, that they're not clear where to go to access support and help, um, the fact that they often small, under-resourced community organisations don't have the resources to be able to, um, to just you know, fill out very complicated complicated grants, grant applications, for example. And so there was a lot of importance placed in um, you know, significance in trying to actually reform those systems, streamline those systems, and so that the various diaspora communities are able to access services and access opportunities that the rest of Australia is, is, about to, is able to. The other two areas, um, I think it's very important that we actually look at them in an interlinked way. One was the experiences of racism of many of our, our diaspora communities, and the second, of course, is from people that are in Australia who are diaspora communities, refugees or asylum seekers or people fleeing authoritarian, totalitarian regimes. And clearly, you know, one of the, the strong threads of this um, inquiry and in the report was outlining the experiences of people that 
continue to be intimidated here in Australia by those authoritarian regimes. And of course, as previous senators have already um, outlined, with China being the prime one amongst them, and the actions of the Chinese government in pursuing people of Chinese origin, people um, here in Australia. It is worth noting that China isn't the only country in the world, and wasn't the only and we received evidence from people from a range of different countries who had um, their home countries not wanting them to speak out about conditions in their home countries and applying pressure on them, and applying pressure on their families and friends and colleagues back in their home countries to try and, make, to try and silence them. So it is an important thread of this report as to say, you know, to be supporting people, um, to be removing that level of, of foreign interference so that people who are here in Australia can speak out freely, do have the freedom of speech, are able to speak out about appalling human rights violations that are going on in their home countries. And as a Green, who my approach to you know, foreign relations and foreign affairs comes from a human rights framework and putting human rights absolutely first, it is important that we do everything we can to be supporting people around the world, whether it's in China, whether it's in Cambodia, whether it's in some African countries, to be able to have people in those countries having, having human rights and not being abused for their, uh, having their human rights abused, and also to be able to have people speak out here in Australia and to be able to be supporting um, you know, freedom of speech, democracy, people's overall rights in their home countries. But when it comes to speaking out about, let's say, and let's go to the, go to the point which has been in this debate now for in, in the chamber while we've been discussing this report. When it comes to the actions of the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese totalitarian government, um, it is incredibly important to recognise that speaking out about the actions of the Chinese government does have an impact on people of Chinese background here in Australia. It does have an impact on, on, Asian, on Australians of Asian heritage. And we've got to be incredibly careful that in criticising and very rightly criticising the actions of the Chinese Communist Party, that there aren't then flow-on impacts on people of Asian heritage here in Australia. And that too often, some of the, the discussion, some of the, those criticisms get conflated into xenophobia. They get conflated into an overall attack on anyone of Chinese heritage and inflame China, racism against people of Chinese background here in Australia. And we heard plenty of evidence in our inquiry about what impact that has had, about the rise of racism against people of Asian background that's occurring in Australia. And that the fact that you know, China is there in our headlines and the China-Australia relationship is very contentious at the moment. And there are a lot of genuine and quite um, appropriate criticism of China, flow, uh, of the Chinese government, but that flows over into people being victimised and having their human rights here in Australia being impacted. And they are being impacted. They are being attacked in the street. They are being called names. They don't feel that, it's, that, that they are being valued as, uh, as, as citizens just because of their heritage. And what is important, I think, also is that when, if it is not appropriate and to follow on from Senator Abetz's um, uh, contribution to us now, it is not appropriate to be asking every Australian of Chinese background where they stand on you know, whether they condemn the actions of the Chinese Communist Party. Many will want to speak out, but many others feel they can't, and it is not appropriate. It is also not appropriate to single out people of Chinese background and ask them how they feel about the actions of the Chinese Communist Party and not ask everybody else. The questions that Senator Abetz asked in that committee hearing, he wasn't asking of people who weren't of Chinese background. He specifically 
just ask the people of Chinese background. And when they weren't willing to condemn the actions of the Chinese totalitarian state, he then went to town on them and, and made a perfect point of what they, what in fact those witnesses were pointing out, is that it makes it very difficult for people of Chinese origin to stick their heads up above the parapet and to contribute and to be involved in political life and community life here in Australia because of those sorts of pressures. And these are the factors that we really need to be very careful and be very sensitive about and be very clear that when and if quite justifiably we are pointing out human rights abuses, actions of you know, whether it's China or whether it's Cambodia or whether it is other states, that that criticism is not then coming to, to bear and, and having an impact on people of, those, uh, of, of, of that background here in Australia. To that end, I think we need to be, have a lot more of a focus of what we need to do here in Australia in order to be able to address the rising racism in this country, which of course then goes to another um, suite of the recommendations of this report of the need to have a comprehensive, well-resourced, effective anti-racism strategy. And for, there are too many people in this country who are happy to say, I'm not racist and we're a, a thriving multicultural country, we're not a racist country, who are basically living in ignorance and, to, and, not, and not aware of the rising levels of racism and the need for us to be taking serious action about it. And so if, there are, if any of the recommendations in this report are going to, going to be taken have notice taken of them, I really hope that it is that one of the need to really thoroughly and comprehensively be addressing the rise in racism and that we need a comprehensive anti-racism strategy so that we can make sure that people of all backgrounds in Australia feel that they can have their human rights upheld here in Australia. Um, just like the hum having human rights upheld all around the world. And so, look, the report, I think, has, is a very important contribution to the debate here in Australia, and I look forward to seeing some of the recommendations implemented. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Feveranti Wells. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. And as somebody who's lived uh, my life across the diversity that is today contemporary Australia, and been very actively engaged in our cultural diversity. Uh, I was very pleased to participate uh, in uh, this uh, inquiry, and having also been a former minister in this space, uh, uh, I thought this was a very timely inquiry and a timely uh, report. Uh, can I too associate myself with the comments of um, the chair? Your Chair, Senator Kitching, the Deputy Chair, Senator Abetz, and, and the comments, uh, some of the comments that Senator Rice her, herself uh, uh, made uh, as well. Look, I'd like to focus on a number of the recommendations. Uh, of course, uh, the first recommendation being um, the need to further recognise the contributions of our diaspora communities uh, in Australia. I mean, let's uh, uh, one uh, half of us were either born overseas or have at least one parent who was born uh, overseas. Uh, but I think that one of the important recommendations is that of number five, and that is recommending that the government consider increasing the awareness of the national security hotline as a means of reporting foreign interference uh, by way of multilingual um, media or information campaign. And of course, the evidence that uh, came uh, before us very much pointed to where this foreign interference uh, is. And as somebody, and uh, as uh, other senators have said, uh, whilst uh, there were uh, a number of totalitarian regimes that were identified in, in the inquiry. Nevertheless, uh, clearly um, the country that uh, attracted the most attention was definitely China. And as somebody who has been very outspoken against the communist regime, and indeed uh, when I was minister I made um, some comments uh, which resulted in an international debate uh, about China's activities, most especially in the Pacific. And uh, I too felt that as I was speaking out on that issue that there weren't many people who were interested in listening uh, to the warnings that I was making in relation uh, to the regime. I'm 
my comments, prescient as they were, I believe have been fully vindicated. But as more and more has become obvious about what the communist regime is doing, not just internationally but most especially here in Australia, uh, we saw in this inquiry the face, the, the face of what that foreign interference really is. Those ordinary Australians, particularly of Chinese heritage, and there's 1.2 million of them, who are the human face of this uh, interference. And so, um, therefore, I think that uh, that uh, is really the most important uh, takeout. Uh, one of the other recommendations was also about Magnitsky and the, um, encouraging the government to enact Magnitsky legislation. And so, therefore, if we are going to enact Magnitsky legislation, we have to make sure that the uh, agencies that are going to have the powers to enforce that legislation are adequately resourced. And I have to say that over the Christmas vacation period, I was very disappointed uh, with Austrac and what happened uh, with Austrac and the issue in relation to the transfer of Vatican funds. And if that's the sort of basic error that an organisation like Austrac is undertaking, then I think that we have to take a very, very serious look to ensure sure that our agencies are up to speed to be able to uh, undertake the necessary work to enforce the Magnitsky uh, laws here in Australia. Can I go uh, specifically to uh, some of the evidence uh, in the inquiries? And we know um, that it is clear, particularly in relation to the communist regime, we saw firsthand the work that the United Front Work Department of the, uh, of the CCP Central uh, Committee is doing here in Australia. And yes, we had seen the work that uh, Professor Clive Hamilton and the work that he did and, and the books that he's written, and also the work of Dr Alex Josky. And can I commend both of them for the contribution that they have made uh, to um, the body politic, but most especially in relation uh, to this issue. And we saw uh, firsthand the insidious uh, uh, practices in Australia of Beijing loyalists. And these um, these insidious practices here in Australia uh, by people loyal to Beijing have caused alarm to our Chinese Australian community. Many who have escaped persecution and want to live freely um, in a democratic uh, Australia, and they do feel um, in in intimidated. They have made an important contribution to the fabric of our community, um, and they have been a strong advocate. They have been strong advocates for democracy and for our multicultural society, um, and therefore, uh, can I underline the comment that was made earlier? The criticisms that I have made, and I know that others have made, have been against the communist regime. They have not been against the Chinese people, and certainly not against um, the 1.2 million uh, Australians of Chinese heritage um, who have been, who have warmly embraced our way of life, but whose way of life now feels very threatened um, as a consequence of Beijing's bellicose um, activities. And we know, uh, we know that uh, the communist regime has a track history in relation to illegal and bellicose activities. We see it daily in the South China Sea. And so therefore, uh, from uh, that perspective, Australia, if we honestly say that we want a values-based foreign policy, then we have to stand by that and we have to stand up when countries like China and other totalitarian regimes do not act as good international citizens. And that means calling them out when they do not act in, appropriate, in accordance with international norms. And so therefore, if we say that our foreign policy is a projection of our values and beliefs, therefore, it is important that, of course, we support the international rules-based order, but we need to stand up for those values. And we need to stand up for those values even when there are commercial consequences. And when we see the egregious abuses of human rights by some of these totalitarian regimes, and we are seeing it, as Senator Abetz said, you know, at the moment, there it is on the BBC, we're seeing uh, what is happening to the Uyghurs. 
But it's also important that countries like Australia join with other nations. And can I also say it would be really good to see Muslim countries also standing up for their Muslim brothers and sisters who are now facing the persecution in China. And so therefore, uh, it's not only incumbent on democratic countries like Australia to call out that, but also I think it's important for us to encourage uh, other countries, and particularly other countries uh, in the Muslim world, to also uh, speak out uh, in this way. We have to understand that um, China is not a democracy. It is a totalitarian regime, and therefore we need uh, to treat it as such, rather than thinking rather than thinking that we can continue as business as usual. We cannot continue business as usual with the communist regime. It's not going to work anymore. And quite frankly, the Australian public is not going to stand for business as usual with the communist regime uh, anymore. So can I, um, in particular, before I conclude, I want to touch on the uh, effect also of the Hong Kong security law. This is a very bad law, and I know that so many people in Australia um, fear its application, not just if they go back to uh, Hong Kong, also because so many people in the diasporas have connections uh, in these countries, in China, in Vietnam, in other countries uh, where they do fear uh, for repercussions uh, for their, uh, for their uh, citizens. Can I uh, conclude on a couple of uh, recommendations? One is the uh, recommendation uh, 12, 14 and 15, uh, 17 and 18, which effectively go to communication with diaspora communities. When I became Minister for International Development and the Pacific, the first thing, one of the things I asked for was, uh, did we have an ethnic media listing in the Department of Foreign Affairs? I was so disappointed. There was not an up-to-date list of ethnic media. And let's not forget that the ethnic media in this country is five, six hundred strong and growing every day because uh, our diasporas get their news from around the world in different ways. So therefore, it is vitally important that we utilise the diaspora communities and utilise that media to more effectively communicate with government. Thank you, Senator Feveranti Wells. The question is that the, Sa the Senate takes note of the reports. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. We'll now move on to the consideration of documents. And Senator Brockman. Yes, I seek to uh, take note of items 8, 10, 12 and 13 on page 11 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I wasn't quick enough to uh, note Senator Brockman's recommendations then, but I also have some on page 11. There may be a little overlap. So could I uh, seek, um, take note of a document number th numbers 3, 4, 5, 8, 11, 12 and 15 on page 11 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Senator Seawood. Hi. Could I add to that list and add document 13? on page 11 and uh, take note and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Seward. I will now... Oh, Senator Brockman. Sorry. I do have a couple more. So, uh, sorry, item 21 on page 12 and item 39 on page 13 I take note of and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Brockman. I, Senator O'Neill. Thank you. Um, on, if we're doing pages 12 and 13, and yes, it seems we are. Yes, I, I think we, we've moved on to page 12 and 13. Thank um, you. I would like to take note of items 18, 21, 24, 25, 26, 28, 29, 39 and 40 on pages 12 and 13 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Any document uh, to which... Oh, Senator Seward. Acting Deputy Pres. Um, I think... I think Senator O'Neill just covered 29. Is that correct? Yes. Can I add 31 to that list, please? 
and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Seward. Uh, no other takers? Thank you. Any document to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Uh, the Senate will now proceed to consideration of committee reports, government responses and Auditor General's res uh, reports, which are listed on pages 14 to 17 of the notice paper. Are there no takers? No. Any report or response? Sorry, Senator Seward. Sorry, could I take note of items 8 on page 14 and items 9 on page 14 and seek leave to continue my remarks? Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator O'Neill. Can I just seek a clarification? Um, did you indicate that we're doing Auditor General reports? Yes, we've, got, we've moved on I'll to that. committee reports and government responses, pages 14 to 17. So may I take note of item one at Auditor General reports on page 16 and seek leave to continue my remarks? Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Uh, any report or response uh, to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Are there any ministerial statements? Uh, thank you. I table a response to a question taken on notice during question time on Wednesday, the 3rd of February 2021, asked by Senator Griff relating to the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission Legislative Review and seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard. Uh, thank you, Minister. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Uh, the Senate... Thank you. Okay. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Amendment, Technical Amendments Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. Thank you. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Clark. Sorry, a little technical error. For an act to amend the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Act 2018 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Thank you. Uh, I put the question that the debate be now adjourned. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against, the ayes have it. Uh, the President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of Ms Hammond to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. Clark. Uh, general Business Notice of Motion number 972, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, relating to the Australian economy. Senator Ayres, I think you're the next speaker. Thanks, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to have an opportunity uh, to speak in relation to this matter. Uh, we are in a position. Uh, Senator Ayres, uh, can I just ask you uh, to actually move the motion? I move the motion, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm very grateful for any procedural guidance. Uh, Thank you, Senator Ayres. Or any other kind of guidance that you want to provide, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, we, we are in a position today where the Australian economy uh, is in a very fragile state indeed. Uh, the Australian economy is in a very fragile state uh, in part uh, because of the coronavirus pandemic and because of the public health response uh, and the response of uh, economies around the world has plunged the Australian economy into the deepest recession uh, for uh, nearly 100 years. Uh, but it's also in a fragile state because the underlying fundamentals of the Australian economy were very weak indeed in 2019. Uh, and they were very weak for the years leading up to 2019. The Australian economy was characterised by low wages, low productivity growth 
uh, and a government that had walked away from its responsibilities to the economy, pursuing uh, a pretty shallow, pretty weak, visionless approach uh, to economic management, abrogating its responsibilities as a government. And that is in no small part due to the fact that what underlines the Liberal Party's obsessions uh, with the economy uh, is a deep, uh, a deep uh, antipathy towards cooperation, a deep antipathy towards Australians working together to make the country stronger, and a commitment to the low road. Low wages, low growth, uh, low productivity, um, not much in the area of achievement. And because they've set their objectives so low, uh, the outcome has been so poor, and that is going to make it impossible for this government to summon up what's required in this year of uh, what should be a year of reconstruction, a year of growth, uh, a year where we rebuild the Australian economy. Uh, it is impossible uh, for this government to effectively conceive of a plan beyond a marketing plan to rebuild the economy. I note that there's been a bit of a difference this week. Uh, and obviously the focus group people have been hard at work. Uh, many of them are enriched by the rivers of gold that flow from the Prime Minister's office, the rivers of gold that flow uh, from ministers' offices around the place to uh, consultants who are mates of theirs, who provide research and provide advertising uh, for the government and will, like every other time, turn up at election time, uh, funded with very deep pockets, enriched by the largesse uh, from Mr Morrison's department, enriched by the largesse from the finance minister's department. Uh, ready to provide advertising material uh, for the Liberal Party. Uh, I've noticed that their work must have said something, uh, because in the, two, the last two weeks of the year, what I saw when I walked into the supermarket in, uh, in Holder in the ACT was an enormous billboard that said, Our Comeback, and it had all this you know, green and gold sort of stuff. And, uh, a, a series of slogans encouraging Australians who are going about their shopping that Sunday night to think that the government was uh, doing something for them. And all we heard, question time after question time after question time, was weak replies from ministers to questions on the other side, supplemented by the, by the refrain over and over again, our comeback. And it went on over and over again. It started being boring, it became sickening, and it was sickening because we knew on this side that it was supported by Liberal Party research, Liberal Party focus groups. Well, this week it's all disappeared. It's all gone. We're not hearing any more about our comeback. We've seen some other focus group tested phrases entering. Well, I suppose a marketer has to market because they don't know how to do anything else. A market has got a market, got no capacity to lead, got no capacity for vision, got no capacity for policy depth, but can market. Uh, and we've seen that, we've seen that develop over the course of the last few weeks. And I know, with depressing monotony, that this government will be press release, announcement, marketing campaign, focus group tested phrases, they will do everything but their job. They will do everything but look after the interests of ordinary Australians. Well, at the end of 2019, uh, at, at, at the end of last year, I should say, 912,000 Australians unemployed, having peaked at over a million in July. 197,900 are long-term unemployed. They've been unemployed for 12 months or more, and we have not seen a cohort of, un of long-term unemployed Australians that large uh, since the early 1990s. A 20 per cent rise from July 2016, that is 33,000 more Australians long-term unemployed. 
301,200 young Australians are unemployed, and they are entering the labour market at a perilous moment, where the only jobs that are available for them, and we hear uh, ministers opposite and the Prime Minister talking about jobs growth, well, the jobs that are emerging in the economy are low-wage jobs. The jobs that are emerging in the economy are casual jobs. The jobs that are emerging in the economy, many of them, are at the low rent end of labour market employment, uh, of labour hire employment, where labour hire employers rip off uh, Australians, rip off companies, and indeed get rivers of gold from this government through labour hire contracts in the Australian public sector. And the other jobs that are available for them are gig jobs. The only jobs that are available for young Australians when they can get them are poor quality jobs. And no amount of focus group tested job maker nonsense will change the experience of Australian families who they know when their kids leave school, when their kids leave university, when their kids leave what's left of the vocational training system in this country. They have got very little out there uh, that they can look forward to in terms of a decent job. 1,474,300 Australians receive either JobKeeper or the Youth Allowance, and they are about to return to $40 a day. Now, I know it's impossible for those opposite to conceive of what living on $40 a day is like. If you live in Sydney's eastern suburbs, you don't meet too many people would never have conceived of meeting somebody on $40 a day. If you live in the inner city, I'm about to, I'm about to come to Naranda or Deniliquin or wherever it is that uh, Senator Davey comes from. Uh, she's, she's from Deniliquin. Yeah, well, you spent a lot of time in the eastern suburbs, uh, Senator Bragg, and, and you, you find it difficult to leave, I know, and you find it very difficult to conceive of the experience of somebody who can't pay their rent who can't pay for the basics, who struggles day to day. You couldn't struggle your way out of a wet paper bag, Senator Bragg, but what you need to do is to get some real life experience and get out there and talk to ordinary people. It is possible, it is possible that Senator Davey may well have met people in Deniliquin who've had to live on $40 a day. But actually thinking deeply about the experience of their lives and understanding that what your government is about to do is about to plunge them back into poverty, back into desperate poverty. Now there are 1.3 million people who are, in that who are out there either unemployed or looking for more work because the jobs that they've ended up with are not sufficient to pay their rent to pay their mortgage, to put shoes on their kids' feet uh, and to pay for their utility bills, they are out there looking for more work—1.3 million people. There are just 129,000 jobs out there. For every single job, there are 10 job seekers. But what this government wants to do is to plunge those people looking for work into abject poverty. What will happen when JobKeeper ends? Wage growth is at historic lows, well below 2 per cent, year after year after year. No lift in the living standards of ordinary Australians. Bills keep going up, costs keep going up, Rents keep going up, house prices keep rising, but what ordinary Australians are expected to cop from this government is no wages policy that's going to lift wages. And the only new jobs, casual, gig, labour hire. In, indeed, instead of a plan to lift wages, a wages policy to work with business and to work with unions and a work with firms to lift wages in the economy, the government's introduced an industrial relations bill which will make it easier for employers to cut wages. 
It's the only recipe they've got for the modern economy in this sort of shallow, sterile vision. No wonder the wages share of the economy is at record lows. No wonder it is. Year after year, Australian workers lifting productivity, increasing their work rate, work harder than many of their uh, colleagues in countries around the world, yet their share of income has continued to decline. It has not been this low since the war ended in the Pacific. It has not been this low since our greatest national emergency. Yet the profit share of income is at a record high. You have these jokers over here who have only got one recipe. The wage share is low, the profit share is high, we're going to cut your wages and we're going to cut your super too. We're going to cut your super. The wage cut, super cut, so a cut to people's income now and a cut to people's retirement income later. It's poor old Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, thinks that forcing companies to pay back JobKeeper that they didn't need is class war. There's no vision, no understanding, no empathy, no plan, no capacity to conceive of what the life is like for ordinary Australians. And what does this amount to for ordinary Australian families? It's Australians who fought the coronavirus. The Prime Minister doesn't hold a hose in this area. There's been a complete absence of national leadership. It's been Australians, not Scott Morrison, fighting the coronavirus. It's a credit to them. The public health work—we know the Prime Minister doesn't hold a hose here—but the states have led the pandemic response in every state. Nothing from Scott Morrison, a national cabinet that scarcely meets and is really about announcements for the Prime Minister. A wage subsidy proposed by Labor, not Scott Morrison, not the Liberal Party, not the National Party, but proposed by Labor, that is the only thing that has prevented a full collapse in the economy and an increase in unemployment benefits proposed by Labor, supported by the Labor Party through there and through here. Uh, and that is what this government proposes to cut. There's an entire absence of a plan, entire absence of a capacity to develop a plan, because if you're going to develop a plan to solve the problems facing the Australian economy, you need heart and you need guts. And this show is entirely incapable uh, of summoning the heart and the guts that are required. The end of JobKeeper and the return of JobSeeker to $40 a day should fill all Australians with dread. There's no plan for any industry sector. We heard today in question time glib responses from the minister responsible. Tourism industry about to collapse. No plan from the Australian government for tourism. No plan for any industry sector. A government that's abrogated its responsibilities uh, and has become too content with just sitting on the Treasury benches and not doing its job. Thank you, Senator Ayres. And before I call you, Senator Bragg, I know there were a few interjections across the chamber there, but I will remind uh, honourable senators to direct their comments to the chair. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, that last contribution from Senator Ayres was very telling. Uh, I mean, to run through that 10 minute or 15 minute uh, summary without a single policy, I think, is the most telling component of that 15-minute address. Um, I mean, we won't be taking any lectures from the Labor Party on economic management. The last time Labor was on the Treasury benches, uh, it was a disaster. I mean, the, the only way to generate more jobs is to have more private investment. Now, Labor, Labor's policies were to increase taxes uh, failed to do things like trade deals because their bosses at the union said so they weren't allowed to do them, uh, and they left office with unemployment at about 6 per cent. Coming into the pandemic, unemployment was closer to 5 per cent. So we came into this pandemic in a much stronger position uh, than the country would have. 
if Labor was in office. Uh, and so just before the significant economic shock, we, this country, uh, had landed our first balanced budget for almost 10 years. Uh, and so we were able to come into this pandemic with the cupboard full of bullets and artillery. And that is exactly what has been fired over the course of this last 12 months, where the government has been prepared to do whatever has been necessary to keep the economy together. Now, recognising that uh, we live in a society, not an, eco not an economy, uh, that was very important that the wage subsidy maintained the fabric of large and small businesses uh, because, of course, the foundation of a fair society is that economy uh, because that pays the bills. Uh, and so the wage subsidy uh, at more than $100 billion, the most expensive economic policy in Australian history, uh, has been instrumental in ensuring that we could track through this pandemic and track through the pandemic in the strongest possible manner. I mean, relative to almost every other OECD country, we have performed very, very strongly. And so our policy during the coronavirus simply was to deploy a wage subsidy, but it was also to deploy special packages where they could be justified in relation to tourism, for example, in relation to hospitality. Now, uh, we have opened the nation's checkbook and we have managed to get Australia through this pandemic. Now, it's not over until pe people are vaccinated, but you'd have to say it's been a very strong performance thus far. But I guess the real question is, what are we going to walk away with from this pandemic? Yes, there's been a lot of money expended, and for good reason, but what are the reforms, what are the changes that we can put forward now which are going to guarantee that we can again grow as a, as a country? Because, of course, before this recession, uh, we had achieved a record-breaking run of economic growth of almost 30 consecutive years. And so that, that is really the, the, the question. I mean, you know, you can, we can have a debate about who hasn't got policies and who has, but I mean, that's going to be the question for the next 12 months as we get deeper into this parliamentary term. Now, um, our policies uh, already, some of them are on the table, uh, I think are, are quite significant, quite structural, where we have decided that we will try and improve Australia's labour laws. Now, when you look at the, the question of whether or not a private business is going to invest money in our country, uh, two of the biggest factors that come up repeatedly are the labour laws of Australia and the tax policies. I mean, those are big determinants of whether or not an organisation, a person, a person with capital or an organisation with capital is going to invest capital in this country. So we've already decided that we would uh, try and make some improvements to our labour laws. We've already decided that we would try and improve bankruptcy laws. We've already decided that we would try and improve the flow of credit by reforming the lending laws. And we've already flagged in the budget that we would be prepared to try and improve uh, the disastrous superannuation scheme, uh, which has $3 trillion sitting in it, which does virtually nothing uh, for the Australian economy. So we've already set these things out on the table at this, at this juncture. And I think these are going to be very important changes. Uh, and, and the question is, uh, I mean, what, what is the opposition going to put forward as its policy? Um, the former opposition leader uh, has been saying in the last few weeks that Labor has a tiny policy agenda. And I think that, that is true. I guess at the last election they had an agenda to try and impose almost $400 billion in new taxes which uh, the, the president of the Labor Party, Mr Swan, has described as a, as a record to be proud of and not resolved from. Uh, and then, of course, you've got you know, Mr Keating, who's very defensive about his, his dinosaur of a superannuation scheme. And, and, and he said uh, one, of the one of the worst public policies, one of the worst. And, of course, he said after the last election, I think if you're talking about the Labor Party and why it lost the last election, it's because it failed to understand the middle class economy. So that, that's what Paul Keating said about you lot. Now, uh, you're sticking to all these policies that the unions have written for you. You're sticking to all these policies 
uh, that your friends at the super funds have, have written for you. Now, all these policies—I mean, you are a policy-free zone. All the policies that the Labor Party have are written by the vested interests down here, the lobbyists and the rent seekers and the bloodsuckers. And that is the truth. I mean, all your, all your policies are designed to funnel more money to the unions and to the super funds, uh, and, and that is your plan for recovery. Thank goodness you're not in office. So at the end of the day, uh, we came into this pandemic in a very strong position, relative, relative to the position we would have been in if Labor was in office. Unemployment was lower and the budget was back in, back in balance. Uh, and so we have been prepared to be flexible and nimble during this crisis. We, we were prepared to spend $100 billion on a, on a wage subsidy, which is a very significant policy, the most significant economic policy in Australian history, which has ensured that businesses have been able to stay together, people have stayed in jobs, and we can now look at the opportunities to actually to, to pursue reform. And so we have put we've already put forward significant significant reforms on labour laws, bankruptcy, credit laws, and superannuation, because we think that these these schemes, these economic policies, should drive a better deal for Australian workers and for the Australian people. Because we're not here to actually create create schemes for rent seekers and bloodsuckers. And so that is that is our agenda. So that, that is our agenda so far. And the the question is what else can we do? And I think that, that, is an, that, that is a good debate to have. I mean, I look, forward, I look forward to the Labor Party coming up with some economic policies. I think that would be good. Now, Mr Shorten said you've got a tiny agenda. Maybe you could have a policy. Maybe you could have one policy through the chair which, 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 which could actually be designed to promote private investment. Imagine that, one policy to drive private investment, recognising that it's not the government that creates jobs. It is actually the private economy which creates jobs. So we look forward to the Labor Party coming out with some policies over the next 12 months or so. As I say, the unemployment rate uh, really now at around six and a half per cent. Of course, our plan will be to try and get that, get that down. And the best way to get the unemployment rate down is to find ways to promote private investment. So we will pursue policies which cut taxes, which cut regulation which ensure that Australia is an attractive place to do business. That will be our agenda. And I have to say that coming out of this pandemic better than almost any other jurisdiction on earth, we are in a very, very good position to capitalise upon our strong performance of the pandemic. And we should be, and we should be looking afar. We should be looking beyond the navel because at the end of the day, with, with the geopolitical events in places like Hong Kong, which is basically going to be destroyed as a, as a finance and technology centre, we should be doing all we can to try and attract the jobs and the investment from jurisdictions like Hong Kong, uh, where, you know, frankly, why would you want to, to live there if you had to live in, the, in danger of the national security law? So we, we are in a good position. I think we can be optimistic about the future. Uh, I look forward to Labor coming out with one policy before the next election, just one, which will promote private investment. As I say, it's a tiny agenda at the moment. Maybe it will grow over the next little while. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I, I just can't let Senator Bragg's contribution go without just responding to it um, briefly, and particularly his claim that um, we're in a strong position coming into the pandemic. Well, um, Senator Bragg, the planet is actually cooking. The climate that sustains all life on this planet, including human life, is breaking down around us. We're living through the sixth mass extinction event in the history of our planet. Your policies and those of uh, your neoliberal colleagues in the Labor Party have priced an entire generation of young Australians out of the Australian dream of home ownership. What the pandemic has done is exposed the fault lines that already existed in our economy and in our society. And we also hear about this, uh, this figure that we uh, have had sustained economic growth for 30 years, as if somehow uh, we can keep on growing infinitely even though we live in a finite ecosystem. And then we get the jobs, jobs, jobs mantra. Well, we're used to that from the Liberals, and we're going to hear a lot more of that clearly from the Australian Labor Party, given uh, what we've heard from them this week. 
Um, well, if you're going to set yourself a test of um, providing full employment for the people of Australia, you've both failed it abjectly over the, vast, over the last few decades since uh, Bob Hawke and Paul Keating turbocharged neoliberalism in this country. Because no matter what stripe of government have been in place, you haven't been able to get the unemployment rate below 5 per cent for any significant length of time, which means, of course, one in 20 Australians who is looking and wants work can't find any. And if we actually calculated the unemployment rate properly and fairly, the real unemployment rate would be in double figures in this country, well over 10 per cent of people. Because, of course, at the moment, if you work one hour a week, you are not classified as unemployed. And what all this is leading to, environmental uh, and ecosystem collapse, um, neoliberalism and trickle-down economics, much beloved of both major parties in this place, what that's led to is mass economic inequality in this country, intergenerational inequality, where young people are watching their wages flatline while property prices go through the roof. We are at record highs in the property market in this country, and that is one of the things that is leading to crushing inequality in Australia. And of course, the policies of this government, the Liberal National Party government, are designed specifically to make the crushing effects of economic inequality even worse. This government is doing everything it thinks it can get away with to increase economic inequality, inflate the housing market and to put downward pressure on wage growth. Massive tax cuts which flow overwhelmingly to the top end of town with more to come, supported, I might add, by the Australian Labor Party. Negative gearing for property investors, capital gains tax discounts for property investors, home builder, which hands out public money for kitchen renos, the RBA printing, uh, printing money hand over fist as fast as it can and pumping it into the banks so they can write yet bigger mortgages, deliberate suppression of public sector wages, regressive IR policies that constrain working people from organising to take effective action to support wage rises and, of course, keeping income support, job seeker, so far below the poverty line that people are basically starving in this country, having to choose between paying the rent and putting food on the table. Because the Liberals decided long, long ago that economic inequality was something that they wanted to continue to see grow in this country. And as far as property prices are going, the Liberals decided the line must go up, no matter what. Now that might be okay if you own your own home. And if you're very wealthy, some of the super rich, the elites of this country, so much the better, because the government will slash your taxes. But if you are in the one third of people in this country who don't own a home, who don't own property, the Liberals have cut you loose. They've basically said you're on your own. Because not only will this government do all it can to drive your rents up, it's doing nothing to increase your wages. In fact, they want to give your bosses more power to cut your wages. The Liberals are doing nothing to help people who are out of work or who don't have work, enough work hours to pay the bills. I mean, Australia is at the bottom of the pile in the OECD in terms of income support, and we are below countries that are much less wealthy than we are in terms of GDP. And this is a policy choice. It's a policy choice by the Liberals to condemn 
Australians who can't find work or can't find enough work, not because of anything that they did, but simply because there are not enough jobs to go around. It is the government's choice to condemn these people to poverty and starvation and homelessness. And at this time, when people are feeling understandably precarious about the future, what is the government trying to do? Unleash the very worst practices from the banking sector, the kind of dodgy lending that helped cause the global financial crisis and was revealed during the Hain Royal Commission is something that this government wants us to go back to. Because, of course, despite the primary recommendation of the Hain Royal Commission being uh, not to uh, change our responsible lending laws in Australia, that is exactly what this government is trying to do. Now, why would the government be looking after a banking sector that was exposed by a royal commission as being criminal, but having a toxic culture driven by greed? Why would the Liberals want to let uh, the predatory banks back off the leash? Well, I'll tell you because the major banks pour hundreds of thousands of dollars into the Liberal Party's pockets every year. And of course, in the very definition of hedging, they also do the same to the Australian Labor Party. These donations are nothing more than legalised bribery. Nothing more than legalised bribery. But I'll tell you what, the banks are getting a damn fine return on investment. A couple of hundred thousand bucks a year into the pockets of the Liberal Party, and the government moves to abolish responsible lending laws in Australia. Now, the way that this place came together, this parliament, in response to the pandemic by supporting increases in things like JobSeeker, by uh, putting in place programs like JobKeeper, showed how possible it is to alleviate poverty in Australia. It's actually really easy. It's not rocket science. You just give people enough money to have a dignified life. That's all you have to do. And don't tell us you can't afford to do it. It's very simple. It's very simple to raise enough money to give people in poverty what they need to, leave, to lead a dignified life. The way you do it is to tax the super wealthy and to tax the big corporations. A third of the top 100 owning, earning corporations in Australia pay zero tax. Zero tax. We don't even have a wealth tax in this country. I mean, we should be taxing billionaires out of existence. There is no excuse for having billionaires while other Australians are homeless or can't afford to put enough food on the table to sustain themselves. We've got to tax the big corporates, particularly the big polluting corporates. We've got to tax the super wealthy. We've got to make them pay their fair share of tax so we can fund the public services that Australian people expect and so we can give people a dignified life in this country, no matter whether they've got a job or not, no matter what their level of ability. We know we've got enough money to do those things, but tragically, for Australians who are doing it tough, alleviating poverty doesn't appease the Liberals' big donors. But I'll tell you what does appease the Liberal big donors, handing over cash to the big corporates and the super wealthy. And that's exactly what we are seeing happen in Australia. And it is those who are living below the poverty line, those who have no work or not enough work or whose work is too low paid, it is those who don't own their own property who are paying the price while the billionaires and the big corporates 
are making off like bandits. We are a better country than this, and we can do better. It's all about the choices that we make. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I too would like to uh, make a contribution in this de debate. And it's always interesting to follow Senator Bragg because he usually gives you enough uh, ammunition or material for a couple of contributions. But I don't want to get sidetracked into his uh, his uh, ramble about rent seekers and bloodsuckers because they're mainly on his side. But that those sort of people exist. But look, you know, we are 12 months into this pandemic and you know, I think all Australians need to take a bow and say, look, we've done as best we possibly could as Australian citizens. We've been led by a government that, uh, despite having flaws, has made some very, very impressive moves, uh, JobKeeper amongst them. But when I look at JobKeeper and you do the analysis over 12, 12 months, and, and I go back to you know, the airline industry having people unload and load its plane since around 1959. And in 1976, I was one of those people. And here we are in 2021, where a company like Qantas got JobKeeper, and it sustained employment. And then it got done in the federal court for, uh, for not quite uh, following the rules, so to speak. And they went to, the, uh, to appeal, and it's now in the high court. But there's an old adage, business and Liberal governments will never waste the crisis. So what has Qantas done? Qantas has abolished those jobs. They no longer exist as direct hire of the airline. And I work for TAA, Australian Airlines and Qantas. But that job now no longer exists. So there was a crisis. They saw an opportunity to spend their ground handling functions, and it will come back at vastly lower inferior rates. Vastly lower inferior rates. That's how it'll work. And we now look even today, Senator Sheldon's question about uh, you know, Virgin. They're getting JobKeeper, but they're already planning to do, to, to, you know, get rid of 2,000 jobs. Now, they're planning to get rid of those jobs is because they know they're jobs that are hard to crack. They know that they're full of unionists, who have agreements, who have willpower and strength and organisation ability, and will resist attacks upon them. And when we see the, uh, you know, the IR bill that's coming our way after 12 months of, uh, of the pandemic, we can see very clearly into the future what's going to happen. And there's another tranche of change which is in superannuation. And that tranche of change in superannuation is going to impact most significantly, and I think this is a point that needs to be stressed every day in this chamber, it will impact most significantly on working women. They work less hours, they get less money, they live longer in retirement and their superannuation balances are lower. And any diminution in their ability to get decent superannuation prior to retirement condemns them to eking out an existence in retirement uh, on the pension and struggling. And the impact is not felt by highly organised union members. They're just going belted out of the employer. There are plenty of transport employers now who are paying more than 12 per cent because it's been negotiated in agreements. And as always, these changes they impact on those who are least able to defend themselves, those who are least able to be organised those who are, least, uh, uh, who are more infrequent, frequently out of the workforce and more than often than not get lower outcomes in respect to wages. These are the people that these changes will impact on. And when Senator Bragg rails against that monster of superannuation, he's actually railing against 50 per cent of the Australian community who are going to struggle to even get close to a respectable retirement income. And as the women work in Australia, and I'd like to have a look at, and I might even ask in estimates if there's any, uh, any um, you know, assessment of how many women took money out of their superannuation counts, how many women availed themselves of the $20,000 and potentially put themselves you know, well down the path to poverty in retirement. Because that's what this government facilitated. 
You know, it all sounded very good. You know, take 20 grand out and you know look after yourself. But you really took your future away, and it will always impact on those least able to defend themselves: migrant workers, unorganised workers, women workers. And if we go into the IR sort of uh, changes, and Senator Brack says we've got to get taxes down and make it easier for people to employ uh, in Australia. Well, it's easy to employ in Australia. There's thousands and millions of hard-working Australians who will give you 120 per cent a day. All they ask is the legal uh, outcome in respect to an award or a, an enterprise agreement. But it's been falling away for decades now. I mean, I, I spoke to a young woman the other day, you know, university, had three months off, got a job, um, was getting quite a respectable pay. Uh, her complaint was twofold. One is that she never got paid on the same day of the week at any time. If Monday was payday, it came Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday. The other was uh, her superannuation appeared on her pay slip but didn't appear in her account. This is going on every day of the week. No one is policing this stuff. We had a company fold in Adelaide the other day despite the enormous injection of uh, capital works into Adelaide, enormous injection of capital works into steel fabrication, concrete road building and the like. A company fell over $200 million worth of debt, leaving a parade of small businesses in its wake, leaving hundreds of workers unpaid. And one of the telling things that I noticed was one of the workers said, I knew the company was in trouble when my super stopped going into my account 12 months ago. came on his pay slip, but it wasn't going into his account. So you know, there is enormous uh, avoidance of you know, legal responsibilities right now. But Senator Bragg's um, position is we need to make it easier. So oh, it's all too complex. You know? Superannuation, what's that? 12 per cent, what's that? It's simple. It's a part of the employment agreement. It's a legislative component of the laws of Australia. And it's not tough, it's not hard to understand, and neither is wages. You know, people who've got 42,000 items in their uh, grocery stores who can, within a, with an algorithm and with an eye blank, check out their profitability claim that IR and wages are too expensive or it's too hard to understand. It's not too hard to understand. It's simple to understand. There are laws in Australia which need to be maintained, safeguarded and policed, and they're not at the moment. The solution is not to dumb them down. The solution is not to give people uh, a bigger and uh, wider avenue to rort and take money off workers, because at the end of the day that's going to make the economy smaller. And we need to make the economy bigger. And I mean, position, power and privilege, which you know, the Liberals are well adversed in, uh, in dealing with, they don't need a hand. The Commonwealth Bank doesn't need a hand. They're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're working out how big a dividend they want to pay. They don't need a hand on commercial lending or weakening of standards. One in two Australians are with the Commonwealth Bank. Why would you give them a hand? They should be in there getting competition enforced upon them. They should be in there, you know, the regulations should be saying, uh, make sure you're doing the right thing here. That's what the Royal Commission found. And, you know, Senator Bragg has a jihad against the, uh, the superannuation industry, but there's no evidence that the $3 trillion superannuation industry hasn't contributed to Australia's continued economic growth. We have one of the largest saving pools of any country in the world. And it's, you know, they, it's pointed, like I heard Senator Hume the other day say, oh, $30 billion worth of fees more than the electricity spend in the country. Well, if you're three trillion, three trillion and 30 billion, you know, is that 1%? I mean, my maths is not real good, but it's probably around about 1%, which, you know, in, in terms of investment fee outcomes is not, uh, not uh, all, that, uh, all that high. I'm, I accept that always can be efficiencies. And uh, as a superannuation participant in industry super. I look at those fees uh, myself uh, quite often, but I don't find any reason to, uh, to be calling uh, people rent seekers and blood suckers like uh, Senator Bragg does. But look, you know, here we are 12 months into the pandemic and now the, really the crunch time is coming. 
Uh, I do not. I think parts of the economy are going really well. The housing industry is overheating. I mean, I, I just look at some of the prices paid in suburbs around me and wonder, you know, when I bought a house for, uh, you know, probably 20 per cent of what they're selling for now, uh, 15 years ago. Um, you know, the, the housing economy is overheating. I've just built a house, just completed a house. Um, you know, there was a bit of delay because people were very busy. Um, but we went very quickly from an era where builders were now broke to now builders haven't, can't get the work done on time. So, you know, there's a bubble going on there and it's going to come off the boil. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't collapse in a heap in the next six to 12 months in certain segments of the economy. And I think importantly, we need to provide ongoing, secure, well-paid, permanent jobs. We can't exist on this, uh, um, you know, plethora of, uh, okay, I've got a job as a security guard. I'm now going to go and work for Ola or Ulba, uh, Menu Log, and and uh, someone else uh, to try and cobble together 45 hours a week. We we can't exist on that basis forever. I accept that there will always be people who will do two jobs and even three jobs. And that's fine. They're hard-working people and they're entitled to do that. But if we can get back to a bit more permanent employment, a bit more ongoing employment, a bit more certainty, it will steady and underpin a recovery in the economy. It will steady and underpin a recovery in the economy. Uh, but you know, if I want to finish on some of the, some of the um, ideology, you can bring this industrial legislation into the parliament, you can pass it. But having spent most of my working life in the industrial relations environment, you will target Mr John Sector or you will target Mr Transport Worker or Mr Building Worker or Mr Meat Worker or whatever. But the actual effect of what will happen is you will punish the most vulnerable in the community. You will punish the least organised, the least educated and the lowest paid. And if that's your plan to have an Australia where you push down people who need a hand up, you're not going to be successful. You're not going to be successful. Because the history of the 12 years of the Howard government, and I was a, uh, a union secretary in all of those 12 years, is I got smarter every day, I got sharper every day, our finances got better every day. We survived those 12 years, came out much stronger. We didn't lose wages and conditions. We went and bargained hard with employers and got deals. So you can change the laws, but the effect of those laws changes. They won't change where you think you're going to change. They will change and decimate people least able to defend themselves, who've done nothing to you. Women in the workforce, cleaners in the workforce, you know, low-paid uh, migrant workers in the workforce. If the employer has got the ability to say, I'm going to do this agreement and you lot are all going to vote for it, and they go, OK, yes, boss, that's what will happen. It won't happen in an organised workplace. It won't happen in, a, in many transport yards. It'll happen in some. And the effect of your changes here, uh, and you know, I think the old adage, never waste the crisis, you're going to be at a point of a mountain of debt, and you're going to be at a point to say, if we don't do this, you're going to get that. Well, I've got to tell you, organised labour will defend itself. Uh, organised labour always has defended itself. Uh, the effect will be felt primarily in the women in the workforce, particularly in respect to superannuation, and I think that's empirically um, that's an empirical fact. Lower wages, lower hours, less time in the workforce, reduction in super entitlement, longer in retirement, lower return. That is, and they live longer. So. It's really you know, one-way traffic there. And if we look at the uh, industrial relations effect, it will be predominantly amongst unorganised uh, migrant workers who are least able to understand the system, who are not organised and are going to suffer exponentially. So you know, I'm sure that uh, there are those in the Liberal Party that uh, have a, a pension for, uh, for attacking on the industrial relations front. And I'm sure there are plenty of other people who, uh, on that side, have got a bit more compassion and uh, understanding of how the system works. And let's hope that uh, you know Australia doesn't go into this period of, 
of creating a mass underclass of underprivileged, underpaid, poorly researched and underfunded in retirement workers. And I really do hope they take some notice, particularly in respect to the women uh, and the outcomes for women in super and attacking IR. Thank you, Senator. Senator MacDonald. Madam Act Acting Deputy President, as I rise today, I'm reminded of a verse in the Bible which translates, there are none so blind as those who refuse to see. Mm -hmm. This is a criticism of those who won't allow themselves to accept the uncomfortable reality placed right in front of them. The Bible also says you shouldn't point out the splinter in your friend's eye when you have a plank in your own. Now, both these parables can be applied to the Australian Labor Party, a party that loves to criticise the coalition's economic credentials despite its own woeful record of tax and spend disasters. The Labor Party likes to paint itself as the arbiter of what constitutes good economic management, but their economic record reads like a bad steward's report of a horse race. Stumbled at the start, failed to respond, rider told to use more vigour, unable to clear running and pulled up lame, overuse an inquiry into performance, <laughs> overuse of the whip. But in contrast, the coalition government has proven itself to be the winks of world economic management. And just on Wednesday this week, The Australian reported that the Reserve Bank forecasts the economy will return to its pre-pandemic size by the middle of this year, six months earlier than expected. Yeah, yeah. And We're RBA Governor recession. Philip Lowe was quoted saying the economic recovery was well underway and had been stronger than was earlier expected. The central bank also found unemployment would fall to 5.5 per cent by the end of 2022, better than the expected 6 per cent it forecast in December. And if we look back, the only reason the Morrison government could respond so effectively to COVID was because of the coalition's commendable economic management leading up to it. In 2019, the unemployment rate was 5.1 per cent, down from 5.7 per cent when Labor left office. Workforce participation was at a record high, and welfare dependency was at its lowest level in 30 years. But back to today, Australia's economic outlook is more favourable than almost all of the world's major advanced economies, and we are forecast to grow faster than those advanced economies, while our AAA credit rating has been affirmed by all three major major eight agencies. The job vacancy rate in regional Australia means that businesses, small businesses uh, that provide over 60 per cent of jobs are desperate to fill jobs. Senator Ayres suggested that there are not well-paid jobs available, particularly to the young. This is just wrong. There are th over 300 apprenticeship jobs available in Mount Isa today. Great city. There are jobs available all over regional Queensland, and yet we continue here to hear this bizarre uh, story uh, that there is no jobs available to young people. The Labor Party saying something untrue over and over again will not make it correct. And so I seek to introduce a bit of reality to Labor. I'm not sure how many people opposite have ever run a business, have ever actually employed somebody, have ever worried about what the economy is doing and how they maintain their commitment to their staff, which I can assure you every employer I know worries about that more than them themselves. How many people opposite have not just sat at the teat of someone else's hard-working tax dollar? The states, and in particular I talk about Queensland, have shut down airline jobs. They have shut down tourism jobs. They do it, uh, have done it over and over again, and I can tell you that the small businesses who are employing those people are not sleeping at night. They're wondering how to pay their mortgages and they're wondering about why Palaszczuk doesn't give a damn about them, their families or Senator, their futures. Senator, I, I would ask you to um, uh, use the appropriate um, title for the Premier of Queensland. Oh, thank you for that correction. So I wonder why they wonder why the Premier of Queensland doesn't give a damn about their future, their families, their mortgages or their employees. Doesn't build dams either. 
I, uh, I also need to correct Senator Gallagher, who is also well out of uh, touch. He believes that nobody is monitoring uh, business payments. Well, I can tell him that single-touch payroll was introduced some time ago and uh, can give him uh, a tutorial in other business practices that he's obviously not aware of what's happening in this modern Very world. Um, though Senator Gallagher is, uh, is often a great advocate of regional South Australia, Senior I'm afraid he has no idea of what's happening with the businesses there. Tell you about but business confidence is now above pre-pandemic levels, according to two bank-run surveys. All I can say is that the Australian people and businesses must be hugely relieved. The coalition has held the country's financial reins during this shock. In fact, Australians would be thanking their lucky stars that Labor hasn't had its chance to get its hands on the Treasury for some time. Studies show that without the groundbreaking JobKeeper subsidy, unemployment would have skyrocketed to 12 per cent and stayed there and until at right, least 2022. Minister. The Labor Party loves to paint the coalition as holding back wage growth, but if we look at the facts, Labor's record on wages was, to cut, uh, was a cut to the real minimum wage in three out of six years, where it has grown every year under the coalition. Average earnings adjusted for hours as There's measured in the national on. accounts was increasing 3.3 per cent through the year to the December quarter, above the 10-year average of around 2.3 per cent and compares to just 1.3 per cent in the June quarter of 2013. And even though we are facing a once-in-a-century pandemic, the coalition's strong economic management resulted in solid household income growth of 3.4 per cent in September a quarter and 8.1 per cent compared to a year ago. The key to lifting wages is lifting productivity growth, and that's why we are focused on lowering taxes, investing in infrastructure, equipping our workers with better skills and improving our industrial relations framework. Yeah, yeah. And in my home region of Northern Australia, the Morrison government has ejected more billions of dollars in assistance, infrastructure and support whereas the state government has been one of the lowest spending across the land. In the most recent budget, the North received the following, just to name a few, $655 million in additional road infrastructure across the North, $3 million to the North Queensland Water Infrastructure Authority to accelerate water infrastructure planning and agricultural opportunities, $17 million for a regional tourism recovery package to help the industry bounce back from COVID more than $3 billion in defence funding for facilities in Northern Australia and $1 billion allocated to flow through lo local councils. So I have to thank the Labor Party. I have to thank them for once again giving us an opportunity to highlight the positive outlook Australians have been given thanks to a coalition government. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to note that it's certainly true that the Australian economy was not as strong as it should have been in December of 2019, just before COVID hit, or rather the government's restrictions on COVID hit. GDP in the December quarter recorded a very poor 0.4 per cent. Inventory growth was negative 0.1 per cent, reflecting low confidence in the manufacturing and retail sectors. Median wages were not growing in real terms. Unemployment had stalled at 5.1 per cent, and the only thing holding the Australian economy up was surging mineral exports. It's here that One Nation parts company with Labor. One Nation believed that the weak economy was as a result of policies that Labor introduced or supported. At the heart of an, an economy is electricity. Labor and the Greens cheerlead unreliable energy. If only steel smelters could run on rainbows, Australia would be an economic powerhouse. According to economist Dr Alan Moran, Australia's excessively high electricity prices are undermining our economic resilience, competitiveness and cutting our standard of living. Since 2002, successive Liberal, National, Labor and Greens governments, in a misguided quest to reduce carbon dioxide, have introduced climate policies at the expense of cheap coal and gas power. As we try vainly and stupidly to cut carbon dioxide, nature's trace atmospheric gas, essential for all life on our planet, 
Our electricity prices, once the lowest in the world, have become one of the most expensive. At just 0.04 per cent, four one hundredths of one per cent of our air, this is futility and stupidity. The data shows we cannot even affect the level of carbon dioxide in air. Dr Moran goes on to state that the financial impact of climate policies and the renewable subsidies are as follows. Higher electricity costs through the supply chain are forcing up retail prices and costing households at least $13 billion annually, extra, or around $1,300 per household per annum. Climate change policies account for 39 per cent of household electricity bills, not the 6.5 per cent the government typically quotes. And it causes a net loss of jobs in the economy. For every green job subsidised, 2.2 jobs are lost in the real economy. State and federal governments' own data reveal that the cost of these climate policies to household electricity bills is an extra $536 per annum, significantly more than the government's touted $90 per household per annum. In effect, the government imposed climate policies and renewable subsidies account for 39 per cent of householders' electricity costs. Now, Labor cannot blame the government for an economy that policies Labor themselves advocate have decimated. To get the economy going again and to create breadwinner jobs, then baseload coal power needs, is needed desperately. Now, on Tuesday, I moved that the Senate support a new Heli coal-fired power station in the Hunter and Labor voted against this. Last year, One Nation supported the government's call for a new heli coal plant in Collinsville, and Labor voted against that. In previous sittings, One Nation, ha One Nation has proposed a hydro power station be constructed behind Townsville in northern Queensland. The Bradfield scheme's first stage alone would create 2,000 megawatts of clean, green, baseload power and thousands of high-quality jobs. Labor voted against it. Labor just doesn't understand energy and its vital core importance. Nor does Labor, Labor give a moment's thought to the energy workers who will be thrown out of work as a result of Labor's policy of closing coal-fired power stations. Beleaguered member, Labor member for the Hunter, Joel Fitzgibbon, is stranded in a party that does not give a damn about coal or the three in every five households that coal provides in the Hunter. Mr Fitzgibbon admits that L-A-B-O-U-R, the real Labor, is no longer part of Labor. And the Labor Party and Labor Party are no longer the party of L-A-B-O-U-R. One Nation is the party of Labor. I need to mention the National Party, who this week walked away from their support for coal despite only just releasing their glossy manufacturing 2035 policy a few weeks ago. After One Nation moved a motion calling on the Nationals to vote in favour of their own policy, a, policy, a motion that took the words of Senator Canavan and, and applied them directly, the Nationals backflipped and chucked out a policy they had only just released. Our motion, as I said two days ago, copied and pasted the public shoutings of Senator Canavan, the National Deputy Leader in the Senate, and, and, the, and that same day they slapped him down. What a joke! The Nationals have a credibility problem, hypocrisy problem, a duplicity problem. To be fair to this motion, the Morrison government voted as a whole to oppose Heli Coal. That's the, that's the Morrison government. And what a sign, what a sight there was over there on the opposition benches with the Liberals, Nationals, Labor, Greens and the crossbench all crowded together united in their desire to take jobs and a future away from the hunter. Not so much the Brady Bunch, F Troop. As course, of course, the troubles in the Australian economy are more than just power. The last 40 years have seen the largest transfer of wealth in the history of this country, from working Australians into the pockets of the elites. Behind this transfer of wealth is globalism. Australia has exported more than one million time, manufacturing Senator jobs Roberts, over the last time, 30 years, mostly to China. Time for the debate has expired. Um, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I've been advised that at question time today, in answering a question to Senator Seward, I indicated that we had 40, 40 million doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. 
Mr. President, that number is not correct. It is incumbent on me to correct the record. The actual number of uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines that we have available to us uh, at this point in time is 20 million doses. I thank the Senate for the opportunity to correct the record, okay. and I thank Senator Wong for bringing um, uh, that matter to my attention. Okay. <coughs> it being after 5:30 p.m., I propose the Senate do now adjourn, and I call Senator Wong. Well, another day and another humiliation for this incompetent, bumbling minister. An incompetent, bumbling minister who has a history of not being able to get his numbers right. The whole country saw his inability to answer questions about the number of Australians who had died in aged care facilities when he appeared before Senator Gallagher's committee, and now he can't get his numbers right in the Senate. And then he comes in here and he says, I thank Senator Wong for bringing it to my attention. What well, don't you check that what you tell the parliament and through them the Australian people is correct? That is ministerial accountability. I'm a, you are accountable through, to, to the Australian people through the parliament. It is your job to check. It is not, it shouldn't, you shouldn't require the Leader of the Opposition and the Senate or shadow ministers representing here to let you know you got your number wrong. If you're serious about your ministerial responsibility, you would have made sure you took the, you took the time to check the record and to come down and check before we write a letter to you asking you to come down. And can I say to the Leader of the Government and the Minister in the Senate, it's pretty pathetic to come down and make sure he speaks in adjournment so we can't take note uh, of the ministerial statement and have a proper debate. Pretty pathetic, frankly, by the government to do that, to try and protect an incompetent, bumbling minister who's already been censured by this Senate, who's already been previously by censured by this Senate. But really, what this underlines, what this underlines is, is not only this minister's incompetence, but it underlines the government's failures on the vaccine. The government's failings on the vaccinations. I mean, this is the most important task facing this government if they're serious about keeping Australians safe. It is the most important thing this government has to get right. But instead of a clear, honest, open plan that this, even this minister could complain, they're caught up and entangled in their own spin. Perhaps you should focus on keeping Australians safe and actually rolling out the vaccinations that are required, rather than holding press conferences before question time so Mr Morrison can wriggle out of the fact that, to this date, we have not seen a vaccination delivered in Australia. Now, one of the things, one of the pieces of hype and spin uh, that this Prime Minister has sought to wriggle away from was his promise that four million doses would be delivered by the end of March. Yeah, he wants people to forget that he said that. You know, we, we've seen him in his press conference doing the soft shoe, shoe shuffle, trying to get away from it. Now it's April, then it's going to be the end of April, then it's going to be May. It's a bit of a trend here, but he said it. He told Australians, as the leader of the country, that this government his government would deliver four million doses by the end of March. So, you know, we wait and see, because so far all we've seen is announcements and him trying to slide away from that commitment in subsequent press conferences. But, of course, as Senator Keneally reminds me, he also told people we'd be at the front of the queue. Australians will be at the front of the queue, he said. You know, it's a good line. You can see them workshopping that in PMO. Oh, Australians will be at the front of the queue. Don't you worry, I've got your back. Well, there are about 108 million shots given across 76 countries to date. 108 million doses across 76 countries to date. Well, how many have there been delivered in Australia? Zero. Zero. A big fat. Zero. Can someone please explain to me now? Perhaps I'll give leave to the government to stand up and explain to me now how 108 million shots across 76 countries versus zero equals front of the queue. As Senator Gallagher said, you know which queue? I think the evidence to her was well, you know, we're in front of the queue in front of New Zealand, so we're at the front of a queue of two. That's a pretty good result, isn't it? 
That's not what the Prime Minister said. It's not what the Prime Minister told us. And around the world, over 4 million doses, 4.25 million doses, are being administered every day. How many doses are administered every day at the moment in Australia? Zero. Zero. The minister, this minister, yet again, has not been able to get this number right. But the real number that matters to Australians is how many doses have actually been delivered. And again, that number is zero. So where did the promise is 40 million or 20 million? The number you've actually delivered is zero. So uh, what I'd say uh, to this government and to this minister is maybe one of the reasons you can't get your numbers right is because you're so focused on the hype and the spin. You don't even know what you're doing. You don't even know what you're doing. And let's come back to what really has to happen. This is the most important task facing this government to keep Australians safe. And it's about time you got it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Senator Scar. Oh, sorry. I've got an adjournment list. I can come add you to it, Senator Keneally. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I'm delighted to rise in the chamber this afternoon and speak about the list of activities I undertook on Australia Day and what a great Australia Day it was that we had on the 26th of January. I started my day at the Fiji Senior Citizens Association of Queensland Inc. hub at Annalee in Brisbane for a citizenship ceremony. And can I say, Mr President, that this place is more than a hub. It's more than a hub. It's a symbol. It's a symbol of how good Australia can be when people from different backgrounds come together to celebrate our newest Australians. So it was my honour to actually be presiding ceremony, to be presiding officer and greet 25 new citizens to our Australian family. I'd like to pay tribute to Mr Surendra Prasad, OAM, who is the driving force behind Fiji Senior Citizens Association of Queensland, Inc. I'd like to thank Auntie Peggy Tiderman, who gave a very moving acknowledgement of uh, welcome to country and acknowledgement of the traditional owners. I would also like to pay tribute to Mrs Ang Ang Agnes Witten AM, President of the Federation of Diverse Cultural Communities of Queensland. And Mrs Witten, I could not have imagined a better person to be accompanying me as we raised the Australian flag on that morning. From that citizenship ceremony, I went to an Australia Day pool party, which was put on by my good friend, Councillor Sarah Hutton, at the Jindalee swimming pool. Now, I hadn't been at the Jindalee swimming pool since primary school, so it was good to attend uh, this event and see the activities, all those people having great fun, eating lemingtons, engaging in barbecues, doing everything that Australians do on Australia Day. And it was especially, it was especially an honour to sponsor the thong throwing competition. And it was even better, even better to see our local police participate in the competition. And it made me reflect on the fact, isn't it great we live in a country where our police can act actively participate in those sorts of activities on Australia Day? where police are respected and seen as protectors of the community rather than people who pose a threat. From there, I went to the citizenship ceremony, which was put on by the Lions Club of Brisbane, McGregor. And can I give a call out to all the great Lions associated with McGregor Lions? And I particularly acknowledge Mr Michael Cosgrove, Mr Ross Gibbons, the district governor, Lion Narelle Parkins. Now, McGregor Lions have been putting on this citizenship ceremony for many, many years, and on this day, 99 new citizens were welcomed to the Australian family. I'd also like to thank Auntie Norma and Auntie Cynthia for their moving welcome to country at that event. And I should say, I should say at the first citizenship ceremony I attended at the Fiji Senior Citizens Association of Queensland, Inc., the uh, entertainment, the pre-ceremony entertainment was provided by Mr Michael Poe Saw, who is the uh, president of the Australian Myanmar Friendship Association of Queensland. And Michael, I just acknowledge that this has been a very difficult week 
for the people of Myanmar and for the Myanmar diaspora in Australia. But you performed admirably, as you always do. And finally, I concluded the day with a joint celebration, representing the Prime Minister at the Australia Day and Indian Republic Day celebration, a dinner on the evening of the 26th of January. And again, this was a fantastic event and a time to reflect on the ever increasing relationship, the closeness of that relationship between Australia and India, and in particular our common values, our common democratic values, which bring us together. I'd like to pay tribute to Mr Shiam Das, the President of the Federation of Indian Communities of Queensland. I'd also like to pay tribute to all of the performers on the day. The uh, Nada Nanjali School of Dance, the Tapori Squad, also the Yatra Music Group and the Sagam Group, the Tail Dance Group, and also to Ms Talitha Wright Morgan, who who is an absolutely outstanding young Australian. She's an outstanding uh, young contemporary dancer, and she's also commencing university uh, this year. I wish her all the best, and it was an honour to uh, well, be in the company of your performance. Senator Keneally was on her feet first. Senator Keneally, I'll come to you then, Senator Seward. Thank you very much, Mr President. I'm going to tell you a story of two Australian citizens, and I'll confess right up front I'm related to both of them. One of them is my mother, one of them is my mother-in-law. My mother, an Australian citizen, has her COVID vaccine. She's had it. My mother-in-law, an Australian citizen, has not had her COVID vaccine, and she doesn't know when she's going to get it. You know why my mother, who is an Australian citizen, has had her COVID vaccine? Because she lives in the United States of America. And the United States of America has managed to roll out 26 million of their citizens have got the vaccine. 26 million, Senator um, Lines. 26 million, Senator Urquhart. That is more than the population of Australia. The United States, since the election of Joe Biden, has managed to roll out more vaccines to vaccinate more of their citizens than the entire population of Australia. How many doses? Australia, how many have they had? Zero. Zero. Wow. So my mother-in-law, the Australian citizen who lives here in Australia, she doesn't know when she's going to get the vaccine. There's no plan. We have no idea what's the online booking system. We have no idea. The GPs don't have any idea how they're supposed to administer it. The pharmacists are waiting for the information about how they're supposed to administer it. We have had a prime minister stand in front of the country and do what he loves doing best, which is making an announcement. And what was the big announcement he made? He said, our vaccine plan will put Australians at the front of the queue. The front of the queue. Well, I don't know how the prime minister defines queues, but right now there are 100 million people around the globe who have received a COVID vaccine. More than 100 million people. Are there any Australians in Australia who are part of that group? No. We are way up the back of the queue. And we have been at the back of the queue since countries and companies started negotiating vaccine deals. The Australian government did not even approach some of these pharmaceutical companies. We heard in the COVID committee, chaired by Senator Gallagher, we heard that, in fact, it was the pharmaceutical companies that were approaching the Morrison government. In June, in June, when other countries had already struck deals, by the time Scott Morrison got around to striking a vaccine deal in September, mm -hmm. there were already 34 countries that had deals and already a billion, do a billion doses accounted for. We are at the end of a very long queue. We are, at the end, we are a billion doses behind. We were 34 countries behind, and now, we are 100 million people behind. The Morrison government is not on the side of the Australian people. If they were on the side of the Australian people, they would have stronger vaccine deals. They would have had earlier vaccine deals. 
And I've heard some people say, oh, you know, you don't want to run down the vaccine. I'm not running down the vaccine. I'm talking up the vaccine. I want the bloody vaccine. Let's get the vaccine. Where is it? I don't know if bloody is parliamentary, but where the bloody hell is the vaccine, Scott Morrison? Honestly. Senator McGraw over there looks a little disappointed in my unparliamentary language, and I will withdraw it for him. But I, what I won't withdraw is my criticism of this Morrison government that lacks a plan. Now, I kind of, almost, maybe, can find a little bit of sympathy in my heart for Richard Colbeck, Ooh. Minister Colbeck, because while we know the minister doesn't have a great facility with numbers, and that was demonstrated in the COVID committee, Senator Gallagher's very simple question of how many people had died that he didn't know the answer to. He doesn't know the answer to how many people died in residential aged care. And he was the minister for residential aged care. He was the minister for aged care. He is only the minister representing the health minister. An interesting appointment and decision by the Morrison government to give him that responsibility. But you can almost feel sorry for him not knowing the number of Pfizer vaccines that the government secured because the government doesn't have a clear plan. It's clear they haven't discussed it in cabinet. It's clear they haven't actually briefed their ministers. It hasn't all the Australian people want is some certainty. Yep. That's all they want. And one more thing they want, they want the vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. After the challenges of 2020, with the pandemic and the disasters across our country, you would have thought that governments would have woken up to the massive threat that climate change poses to our future, to the future of the planet and its inhabitants. Federal and state governments continue to support and invest in and encourage the fossil fuel industry. They want a gas-led recovery, keeping approving fossil fuel developments and are not even enforcing the weak environmental conditions on projects. The immediate risks that climate change poses to our health and well-being is getting worse every year. As global temperatures rise, extreme weather events like bushfires, droughts, cyclones and floods are becoming more frequent and severe. As Professor Will Steffen said, no developed country has more to lose from climate change fueled extreme weather or more to gain as the world transforms to a zero carbon economy than Australia does. My home state of Western Australia, particularly the South West, was always predicted to be severely affected by climate change. And unfortunately, so it turns out to be. And tragically, right now, we are seeing bushfires in the Perth metropolitan area and the hills posing risks to lives and the loss of homes. And my heart goes out to all of those affected by these fires and to the emergency service providers that are battling these fires. A report by a new group called the Climate Target Panel, a group of some of the most senior climate scientists in the country, and in, and in fact John Houston, Houston, found the Morrison government should be setting a 2030 emissions reduction target of between 50 and 74 per cent if Australia was to comply with goals of limiting global heating to 2 degrees or 1.5 uh, degrees respectively. But we can do better than just going for two degrees. We must aim for 1.5 degrees, which means a 75 per cent reduction in emissions by 2030. The biggest contributor to emissions here in Australia are fossil fuels and the companies that produce them. This week, we have heard about those companies' political donations. Nationally, over the last three years, the Liberals have accepted $2,365 $2, and $250. Labor have accepted $1,108,528, and the Nationals have accepted $221,787 from fossil fuel companies. That's almost $3.7 million of dirty money that influences politicians' judgments when debating critical issues like the climate crisis and clean energy. The greatest tragedy of the climate crisis is that 7.5 billion people must pay the price. And the price is a degraded planet where their future is in jeopardy. So that a couple of dozen Polluting interests can continue to make record profits. 
and to continue to pump dirty fossil fuel emissions and carbon emissions into the atmosphere. It is a great moral failing of our political system that this is continuing to be allowed to happen. In my home state of Western Australia, a state that in fact had a budget surplus in 2020, the big polluters also jumped on the, uh, on the bandwagon for the opportunity to buy political influence. Labor, Liberals and the Nationals took in $283,340 from Woodside, who is currently seeking approval from the WA Labor government for a gas project in, the w in WA's northwest that will be the nation's biggest polluter. Oil and gas giant Chevron, who operates two of the biggest polluting facilities facilities in WA donated $124,685 to the Labor, Libs and the Nationals. Our system enables individuals and corporations with greater wealth to have an undue influence on elections. These companies have their and their products are substantially responsible for the climate emergency we face and have collectively delayed national and global action for decades. We need caps on emissions. Uh, caps on emissions, we need caps on ele election expenditure and donations, we need real-time disclosure laws, and uh, we need that now. The Australian public deserves to know who is putting money into political parties. It will bring transparency and integrity back into decision-making and, and policies, especially when it comes to this climate emergency. Order. Senator Seawood. Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr President. Uh, 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 it's, uh, an important time in Australian history as we emerge out of the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And, 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 it, and it's tough sometimes uh, in modern times to, to unify the country, I know, but there's been a, a level of unity in the nation in response to the pandemic. And I think there's also a level of unity around uh, what we need to do in the future as well. And one of the most common refrains I have heard uh, over the past year is the need to restore Australia's manufacturing strength, uh, that we need to get back to making things uh, in this country uh, so that we can uh, uh, respond to crises like we've seen over the past year better uh, and also respond to, to new crises that may emerge, particularly as the security challenges in our region increase. Uh, uh, we also must face the fact that uh, over the past generation uh, our, our manufacturing strength has fallen considerably and it has only accelerated in the past decade. Indeed, late last year, uh, a new record low was set for the number of Australians who work in manufacturing. Uh, uh, just 840,000 Australians now are employed in manufacturing. It's down from almost 1.2 million 30 years ago. So 300,000 jobs, 300, jobs gone in the space of a generation. And, and more worryingly, uh, the last decade has been the first decade on record uh, where manufacturing output has fallen uh, over that decade. So we produce less now, or in 2020, we produced less manufactured goods, manufactured goods than we did in 2010. Uh, to reverse that trend, it's, it's, it's going to be tough. It's going to be challenging. Uh, uh, I think the, the causes of our manufacturing decline aren't that controversial. Uh, uh, we've seen a, a massive increase in energy prices over the past 10 to 15 years. Uh, electricity prices for manufacturing uh, businesses in Australia have gone up 91 per cent over the past decade. That doesn't help matters. It's harder to make things when our energy costs are higher. Uh, and over this, this last, especially 20 years, we've seen a, an explosion of measures to protect uh, industries in other countries, especially given the emergence or the establishment of uh, China joining the WTO. And, and China has massively subsidised its industries that have taken jobs uh, from other uh, countries, especially industrial economies around the world. Uh, uh, just one stat. Uh, uh, an estimate uh, that was produced by the American Steel Institute a few years ago uh, that uh, uh, Chinese steel firms uh, have 80 per cent of their profits subsidised by uh, the central government. Uh, so to reverse this trend, to reverse this trend, I and my Nationals colleagues over the past year uh, have been working on policies and ideas uh, uh, to bring back manufacturing jobs to Australia. We have a proud history of the Nationals Party of supporting uh, manufacturing, and we think we must return as a nation. Uh, to support that great sector again. Uh, we should deal with these two issues uh, that have emerged to reduce our manufacturing strength. Uh, uh, I firmly believe we've got to reinvest back in cheaper energy. Uh, we have walked away from our uh, using from our, our natural resources that we have, especially in coal and, 
and, and, and we used to have in gas. Uh, uh, we should not just simply be exporting these products to the rest of the world so we can buy back the manufactured goods made with them from Coles and Big W and Kmart. We should, we should instead be using our coal. There's no reason why we shouldn't be building some coal-fired power station in this country. We learned today that in 2020 China built uh, brought on 30 gigawatts of new coal-fired capacity. That's more than all of the coal-fired power stations in this country. Why aren't we building some ourselves? We should be trying to get cheaper gas, but the way to do that is to find oil. We need to find oil if we want cheap gas, and our oil self-sufficiency has crashed from almost self-sufficiency uh, uh, 20 years ago to less than 50 per cent today. We should also protect our jobs. We shouldn't allow our jobs to be stolen by other countries for unfair competition. And we recommend investing back in the Anti-Dumping Commission so we have the evidence under international trade rules uh, to take countervailing action and protect Australian jobs in manufacturing. I don't have time this evening to go through many of the other uh, policy ideas that the Nationals have put together, but our policy is available on, on my website, links available through social media. Uh, we, we want to see investments in skills. We think tax incentives and low-cost finance should be provided, especially in regional areas, uh, to uh, attract investment uh, in, in manufacturing. And we think we should strengthen procurement rules as well, so that uh, uh, government-funded contracts use more Australian content. Uh, we believe the Australian people are united in wanting to see a strong manufacturing industry, but we have to take action to protect that great industry and make sure jobs come back to Australia. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. As I said before in ending the previous speech, behind this transfer of wealth that's going on in this country from workers to the elites, Australia has exported more than one million manufacturing jobs over the last 30 years, mostly to China. Why? Because electricity prices have skyrocketed. And that's due to Liberal, Labor, Nationals, Greens policies, F Troop. At the same time, we have imported 10 million new Australians to compete for jobs that no longer exist. Both the Morrison government and the Labor Party champion excessive and increasing immigration. But there are other reasons. Only today, Labor advanced an amendment to the Customs Amendment Product Specific Rule Modernisation Bill 2019, which sought to defend the free trade agreements that lie at the heart of the economic gutting of our country. The government recently signed a free trade agreement with Indonesia that Labor supported. This agreement actually includes a clause that says we have to send vocational skills trainers to Indonesia to train Indonesians to our standard so that these workers can come to Australia and compete with Australian workers to see who will work the cheapest. Free trade agreements turn our labour market into a version of the Hunger Games, with the cheapest worker getting the job. So now we have F-Troop meeting the Hunger Games. Reducing Australian wages to the level of our cheapest trading partner is a design feature of, wage, of free trade agreements. Labor are supporting a direct, quantifiable attack on the wages and entitlements of Australian workers. So we don't be blaming just the Morrison government. You're all doing it. F Troop. The effect of this race to the bottom can be easily seen in Australia's median wage, which is the point at which, at which half the people of Australia earn less than and half work more, uh, earn more than. In Australia over the last 30 years, our median wage has remained constant after adjustment for inflation. Everyday Australian workers have not had a wage increase in 30 years. That's after inflation. No increase in 30 years. This does not even take into account that in this period, real estate, education and healthcare have increased by, more, by as much as 300 per cent. If everyday Australians feel like they are working harder and have less money, it is because that is exactly what is happening. And that too is on the tired old parties, not just the Morrison government, Labor, Liberal, Nationals, F Troop. I've worked overseas. I've worked as a miner underground in this country, several states. Australian workers are among the world's best. Australian workers are innovative and use their initiative. I've been in many countries overseas and I know that we've got the best workers in the world. We just need honest government to help them get along. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Monday the 15th of February at 10 a.m.